2023, but our first intercontinental race, uh, which is part of the GD World Challenge. Expect expectations are high, but we're looking very much forward to, to try to get, a, to get a good result. Well, the switch to BMW is not the only new thing at WIT. New driver as well, Valentino Rossi. How cool to have you here at Bathurst. How have you found that change from two wheels to four so far? Is a... Uh... It's very different uh, under a lot of point of view, but uh, mm, it's also similar. To go, to go fast uh, is, uh, is very similar, the way to go fast with the car than with the bike, you know? But after when, uh, when you race uh, in, in this type of races, especially in the long races in the endurance, you need to, to work a lot under uh, other expect, uh, like the strategy, also the pit box, uh, the box, the, the uh, driver chains and everything. So it's something that with MotoGP you never have. Yeah, right. How do you go from 45 minute MotoGP race, 12 hour Bathurst race, mentally, physically? What, how do you train for that and get ready for that? Yes, it's, uh, it's different and uh, I already make uh, two 24 hours race in Spa and Dubai and already the second one is a lot more easy than the first one. You need to get, to get used because uh, especially the last 10 hours uh, you enter like uh, in another uh, dimension because you are tired. Uh, but uh, when you jump on the car you have uh, the adrenaline. That, that, that is good for uh, keep you awake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first impressions of Bathurst, what do you think? Incredible, and uh, I always play with the simulator in, uh, in this track, uh, but come here uh, in the reality is, uh, is very different. It's like a dream, you know, because I always think maybe one day I will go. So uh, now we are here and uh, I'm very happy to be in this team and to race with the BMW because uh, the car is very, very strong and also all the people push a lot. And uh, I feel good, I feel good with the car, but you know, we will see during the weekend my level. Can you believe they used to race motorbikes here? No, uh, <laughs> no, because you don't have enough space. It's not good for motorcycle, better with the car. Hmm. Well, it's very cool to have you here. Best of luck this weekend. Can't wait to see how you go here at Bathurst. Enjoy. Grazie, ciao, ciao. <laughs> That's the Shannon's time machine looking back to a remarkable race in 2018. It was all going on that year and uh, BMW team WRT as they are now uh, were an Audi squad at the time and they were out of fuel. They were out of the race. They were never ever going to win it but the red flag uh, fell at exactly the right time. Let's head down to the lane. The Pirelli pit bunker uh, has been busy and Chad Nalon is right there. Yeah, I've got a co-driver for this one. I've actually stolen him out of the commentary box, boys. I'll return him in one piece. Uh, Garth Tander, welcome down to the Pirelli Pit Bunker. We just heard Valentino Rossi talking about what a magic location this is. So, no good me talking about the track. Let's get the bloke who won Bathurst last year, the 1000, to have a bit of a chat about it. We actually did this last year, and for those who missed it, it's a really cool way to learn the differences between GT3 and a supercar around here. But let's just start by looking at this famous bit of road, Garth. Oh, it's the best bit of tarmac that we have here in Australia, 6.214 kilometres of undulation, commitment, desperation, everything that you want. <laughs> if you were going to design a racetrack, there's no chance if you design this racetrack now to get past oh. the safety standards. So yeah. that was makes it so cool, is that the commitment required, particularly once you get out of the cutting here at Turn 4, from Turn 6 to Turn 18, so from the tree to Forest Elbow, the commitment doesn't matter what you're driving. You could be driving a supercar, a GT3 car, a Formula Ford, a rental car when we're out here with you, Chad. <laughs> the commitment required to get around here yeah. is immense. And the speed across the top of the mountain, particularly in a GT3 car, is significant. We'll get to that in a moment. I just want to highlight the lap records here. So 204.7, that was uh, Chaz Most a few years ago. 201.5 in race trim, Shane Van Gisbergen. That was pretty rapid. So it's quite curious. When you look at that, you go, well, there's a, a pretty big difference there in, in race speed. So where are they making that time up, mate? I'll bring up the, uh, the corner numbers. You might be able to pick out a few spots for us. Yeah, well, the first thing is the supercar is much, much faster in a straight line. So um, up Mountain Straight and down Conrod, the supercar makes its lap time by top speed and acceleration off the corner. The punch off turn one and the punch off Forest Elbow is immense in a supercar, and that's where it makes a lot of its lap time. Whereas the GT3 car, the run across the top of the mountain is seriously quick. Okay. Like, that's much, much faster. So we talk about top speeds yeah, at the end of Conrod straight. There we go. Can you push your buttons <laughs> on for us, Chad? So supercar near on 300 kilometres an hour. It's 297 kilometres an hour. Whereas the GT3 car is only 280k right, an hour. Hopefully. And there's a big difference in the braking area at the chase too. In the supercar, it's around the 170 metre mark from 300k an hour. Whereas the GT3 car... 
at 290k an hour, you're breaking at about the 110 metre mark. Right. So that's the advantage of being car being a little bit lighter, a bit more downforce and having ABS. So the run up mountain straight as well, the, the supercar runs up there much, much faster as well with a pull up the mountain. So across the top, you mentioned through the shelf, this is where they're going to make up their time. Let's go McPhillamy. And uh, this thing really doesn't like me today. There we go. That's a pretty big difference. Yeah, big, big difference. I mean, you're a gear up in a GT3 car to start with. Yep. So fifth gear from basically Reed Park through McPhillamy to Skyline, whereas in the supercar, it's only fourth gear, 25k an hour difference. Wow. Where the really big difference, where you really notice it as a driver, and it took me a long time, every time I came here in the GT3 car to get back up to speed, was Reed Park, the drop down into the grade. That in a supercar is fourth gear and a bit of a dab on the brake pedal. In the GT3 car, it's keep it flat, pull fifth gear, and just roll out of it a little bit, and then get back into the throttle again. So the commitment required in the GT3 car across the top of the mountain is massive and that's where as a supercar driver it takes you a little bit of time to readjust your brain. Yeah right, 220k through McPhillamy. Um, I would never make light of it but the incident that you had there a few years ago that highlights exactly why that was uh, so serious. All right let's take the corner numbers down for a second here and uh, I want to talk about maybe some passing opportunities because we've seen plenty of passing here today. Uh, these look like the regular spots. Yeah it, uh, that's the same basically same as what we were to see here in the Bathurst 1000 weekend the same passing opportunities up the inside at turn two it's easy to defend that one. It's a risky move trying to get up the inside of the cutting at turn four. The same down at Forest Elbow. It's probably a tougher move in a GT3 car to get past yep. down at Forest Elbow. That's where we saw the famous Matt Campbell move. Yeah, though. that was a yep. big move, and I think that's one of the best passing moves we've ever seen at Forest Elbow. Where the GT3 cars are better is slipstreaming. You get a better toe in a GT3 car, so we're seeing a lot of passing down into the chase already. And then if you defend at the chase, you can get set up and passed into the final corner. So there are plenty of passing opportunities, and to your point, Chad, we have seen plenty of passing already. And when we get into it at the last couple of hours of this race, it'll be on. It'll be on right down here at turn at the, at the chase and at turn two. It's going to be on there. What grabs me there from turns four to turns 18, that's almost no passing opportunities across the top. All right, hot spots. Where are we going to see drama? Where are we going to see potential safety cars coming up later in the day? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, the whole bit that you said at single lane raceway, that's where the, hot, the drama is. There is some drama, you know, obviously, out breaking yourself down here at the chase and getting caught in a gravel trap or having some dramas down there. But we've already seen it. We saw it with Stephen Grove having his moment across mm -hmm. the top of the mountain and contact with the wall. And we have seen it year on year in this race where there's always some drama across the top of the mountain. But in reality, Chad, you could just get your pencil out. Yep, there you go. And you could start... Hang on, hang on. I'll get, where get is your it? nice yellow colour. There you, you go. You can start here. <laughs> and that could be the hot spot for safety cars around here, especially when it comes down to the last hour, when it's all on the line to hang it out and try and get track position so you can try and succeed at the end of 12 hours around this race. No place is safe at Mount Panorama. Yeah. We're also going to put a few little, just some kangaroos around the place <laughs> as well, guys. There you go. You never know where they're going to come out. Maybe, maybe an echidna up here somewhere during the cutting. <laughs> we <Perfect>. have seen, <laughs> we've seen everything here. It would not surprise me. You never know, boys. Yeah, thanks, Chad. Thank you, Garth. And yeah, just circle the whole racetrack protection for drama area. As we watch our race leader, Jules on the double winner of this race. One of only a few handful of drivers to have won back to back, not just Bathurst 12 hours, but endurance races at Mount Panorama. It doesn't happen that often. And even less so doing it three times in a row. Let's go back and have a look down here at uh, AMG Corner, Murray's. And this is the 65 Audi with Chas Mostert behind the wheel just slicing down the inside of Trace Vantor. So for the second time today, See the BMW on the brakes a lot earlier than Chaz, who's driving this car very hard, not that long out of pit lane. Uh, he has uh, once again trying to race himself back onto the lead lap. Meanwhile, Gunon has had just use that curb on the inside there on the run down through the S's. Watch and listen. Just a lift and wag along the steering wheel, and he drives out of it. So. The Merck's actually been very good over the top for much of the weekend, very stable platform. Just a quick note, our leader now is 18 seconds to the good. Jules Gounon behind the wheel of the 75. Oh, big slide for the Valentino Rossi driven number 46 WRT BMW. Well, that's just getting it on the rear wheel and the smoke pouring off, isn't it? Just a bit of turn the handlebars. We've seen that before. It's nothing different. So, Carl Turn 46. Hunt, actually, the steering wheels now aren't wheels. Are they? Are they well, no, exactly more? right. Close to the handlebars. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely right. What uh, by three seconds between second and third, Giamini and Marcello. Uh, we had that stop a few moments ago for the Triple H car. Brock Feedy came in, took on some 
racing fuel and left without a new set of Pirelli tyres. Double stinting. That's uh, another hour's worth of racing he's going to put on that as we head towards the halfway point, Krelzy. It's been a good stint for Valentino. Best lap 204.5. In the same stint, his teammate has uh, punched out a 3.8. Valentino has averaged a 5.5, not that far off the pace. He's been going along very well. That's why car 46 running nicely on the lead lap and in sixth position. And has a decent margin to Brock Feeney back in seventh position. And we just saw that car in pit lane, so it was a fuel only stop for Triple Eight Brim. The AMG GT3, and they're good for another 35 or 36 plus laps before they stop again. So they've gone out of sequence. And we have just confirmed as the, the fans that have lined the track that Sea of Yellow has. I've been in town since Monday, JH, and there was yellow in town then. I saw VR fans walking down the street in the middle of town, and they have just built and built and built. And it's like being at Phillip Island for the MotoGP. Uh, they have come out in their thousands to see this guy tackle the mountain for the first time. Do you know what impresses me uh, as much as anything else we've talked about? We've talked about him sponging everything from his teammates, from learning, from taking it at the pace he needs to do. Never mind the skill involved in driving the GT3 car quickly. How relaxed he is behind the wheel of a fast-moving, big G, particularly on the corners, racing car, He's used to moving around, sure, but he instigates that normally in his previous job. What he's doing now is getting rattled around. He's getting G's through the corners, the opposite direction from what he wants. A motor car is the only fast-moving object that leans away from the apex of a turn. Think about it. Boats, planes, motorcycles, they all lean into the corner. A motor car leans out. Very different sensation, I would have thought there. He's got his head round that, and look how the paucity of movement, how relaxed he is behind the wheel of this car, and that is speed. I remember Guy Smith was exactly the same. You would have thought he was nipping down to Woolies to pick up uh, some milk and some bacon for his breakfast. We had Guy Smith here in a Bentley at some point from research, did we not? Yeah, that, we had that yeah. great camera above yeah, his yeah, head. Yes, we did. It was nice to see Guy getting an opportunity to tackle Mount Panorama. He's doing a great job. Last time around, Drew Vantel, his teammate, who's about 11 seconds up the road, did a, a 202, 205.6, uh, Rossi a 5.3. So he's actually quicker than his DTM title-winning teammate at this juncture. But I'll preface that by saying that neither BMW is particularly quick relative to the other cars they're fighting with today because the leaders are still punching out in the threes. And behind them, Brock Feeney last time ran in the low fives and troubling the fours. So there's some lap time to find just in this stint of the race. The BMWs who have now been out there 28 laps each. Remember, they pitted at the same time. So they're approaching it. They're between five to 10 laps away from their next set of scheduled pit stops. How's, uh, how's Jamin there? Is, is he doing a double? Because he's he's not catching Gunon. He's he's dropped another second or so in the last couple of laps. That's something that we need to keep a, an eye on because it's coming up to 20 seconds now. The gap between Gunon and Chamonix. That's the AMG versus the Grello Porsche, the 912 with the triple nine. The pole sitter in third. Just a short drive from Bathurst are the Blue Mountains, Sydney's backyard, the fresh air, the World Heritage listed wilderness area. Three sisters there just outside of the great town of Katoomba. It's one of the most popular day trips out of Sydney, but you need a whole weekend or longer to fully appreciate its wonders. And while you're up there, head to Katoomba and Catalina Park, a classic old racetrack. You can still go there and wander around it. It's a great place to stop. Katoomba's got some great restaurants and cafes to check out while you do see so Catalina Park. Mark it down in your diaries. Let's have a look at the spares box highlights. We get very close to rolling into the second half of the Liquid Molly Bathurst 12 hour. It's been brutal at the start. Oh, big hit at the top of the mountain for the Grove Porsche's taking that car out. That was the first real 
safety car. One or two people playing fast and loose with the walls, including the Grove Lamborghini, and that started off at one or two, the wall Lamborghini, excuse me, started off a bit of a nightmare for them. A coming together through Brock Skyline, so two cars in the wall, and the number 44 Mercedes not coming back from that one. Well, the Audi did, though, in fairness, and got back to the pits. Scary moments at the top are all part of Mount Panorama and the leading Invitational Class Mark Cars machine just finding the outer limit. Shields Gunon leads the motor race by a full 20 seconds now. We've got 159 laps completed. And if we're going to do 2,000 Ks, at this hour we needed 161. Here's the Bozell class leaderboard. Chris Meese is the best of the Pro-Ams. Daniel Gaunt behind the wheel of the number 10 Milan team IMS silver class leader and Grant Donaldson in that invitational class triple one Mark Carr's Mazda shape machine 18th position overall and Krailsey's got the look at the overall 159 laps in we're almost at a thousand k's of this race and Jules Gunon leads Matthew Gemini and Raffaele Marciello so 20 seconds the margin and then five seconds covering the next three cars. But everyone's a little bit out of sync in when they're going to take their final or their next round of pit stops building up to that final couple of hours of this particular race. The BMW is fifth and sixth. We've just been talking about them. Brock Feeney on a completely different strategy now to the leading group of cars. So Triple Eight might be running seventh, but that's not indicative of where they really are in the race sort of keeps building to this point where those final round of pit stops are going to be absolutely critical in terms of pit stop time and how much fuel you're putting in the car, especially if you keep this green flag running that we've been enjoying today. Uh, just outside or just in the top 10 now, car 99 is Richie Stanaway behind the wheel. He's chasing Chaz Mostert. And just in front of them, Chris Meese in eighth position, who's the first car not currently on the 160th lap of this race. Uh, were well, there and thereabouts for that team, King? Uh, and he's certainly on route at the moment for the 315 laps that would be a distance record. These cars are clocking up times that are very impressive indeed. A few years ago, fives and sixes, talking about this earlier, weren't we, Grills and people joining us all the time. Fives and sixes, race time would have been impressive. Uh, and now we're getting a bit of disappointed if people are running down in the, the fours, the high fours, to yeah. be honest. <laughs> yeah, it, it'll need to be a, a rapid second half of the race to get to 2,000 Ks for sure, but it's certainly possible. Well, our team's been busy. We've got the Pirelli pit bunker, and we're also fortunate to have Mark Beretta, who's out and about here at the Liquid Molly Bathurst 12 hour. Oh, apologies for missing from the lane for a minute, but I had to come up here. You cannot come to Mount Panorama on a day like this and not come to the top of the mountain and enjoy this amazing view and the great people up here. El, what brings you up here? The cars, the atmosphere, the beers. <laughs> Where's home? Car. And who have you got here? This is the whole family? Oh, I've got Dad, Mum-in-law, Father-in-law and the wife. It is a family event, isn't it? It is a family event. How's the racing been? It's been great. Cars are number two at the moment, so... Hi, when we stay there. You're going good. I know this is, I mean, this is a little piece of paradise, isn't it? It's beautiful up here. It's a, it's a place to be. God's country. It is. Where else would you rather be on a Sunday, after, Sunday morning? Well, do you know what you, you miss here? If you could only find a cool drink, I think a cool drink would really cap this off, Al. I really, I just think this is great. You've got the view. I you got the sun. We can oh, you. <laughs> yeah, look, yeah, I think Look at you, that. Geez, I don't think I've emptied the bag. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, guys. We'll enjoy this. Hey, keep working hard down there. <laughs> oh, wait, I need to renegotiate my deal. <laughs> this, this is, hang on, it's all the good gigs. We get, I mean, no dis, disrespect to Mara Engel and uh, uh, Derby Remix, lovely people there, I love driving with them, but he gets a cool tinny and we get sweaty racing drivers. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm only kidding, you know that. The Sun Energy 175 car, defending champions. Now, this was a different, uh, different race altogether last year. And ran at a different time of year. There was much more darkness as in comes the number 24, Stevie Reynolds' car, the Makita AMG, coming into the pit lane. Ran at a different time of year, under different regulations. But everything I've spoken to Kenny and Bull about the last couple of weeks we've been together in 
in Daytona for the Raw before, and then the Rolex 24 hours at Daytona. They are absolutely dialed in, Garth Tander, to say, we want to be there or thereabouts this year. Of course we want to win it because we want to prove that last year wasn't a fluke and we didn't quote unquote just win that because it was a pro-am race. No, well, they won it exceptionally well last year in the pro-am structure. If they win it this year, no disrespect to Kenny Habul, but he's not a pro driver, but he's part of the driving roster going up against three pro drivers in the, all the other pro entries. If they win it this year, that's a much bigger win than last year's race. Oh, uh, yeah. And, by, and a, by a margin. The field strength is, with the, again, the fullest of respect to last year's result, three times as strong, if not more. So the, the level of competition is so incredibly high, which we've seen today and how relentless this race has been. They are in a really good spot right now. 17 seconds to the good, and they've played some strategy wildcards. They've been through pit lane eight times. The car in second place, the Manti EMA Porsche, just the four stops so far. The lot to play out. We've just ticked over 161 laps, by the way. It's a milestone at this place, 1,000 kilometres, and it happened in under six hours and ten minutes. So the, the quickest 1,000 on record, six hours and one. That was 2018. Uh, Craig Lands and Stephen Richards. So it's up there in the quickest 1,000 Ks ever covered. 161 laps at this place. So to go 2,000 Ks, they're going to have to do another Bathurst 1,000 in 5 hours and 50 minutes. So they'll going. have to go under the supercar 1,000 K yeah. record. We've had a few safety cars in this one. Started under safety car, so that extra lap will add about another three minutes to the, to the race, well, to take it out of the race time, if you like. So Richard Crail's been on the 2,000 K train for a while here so he's had a fair bit of pull this weekend he's what he's asked he's got so he's got six hours to come good if we stay <laughs> like the same color as the grass it's a lot, which we've been over two hours for that now um i.e not the color of custard then then we will get close to that we will get close to that because even those early ones we were uh, we were on we were on course to be able to get very close to it. The 912 Mante Racing EMA Porsche is in pit lane, so they now take their fifth pit stop. And this has got to be the world's most economical Porsche when it comes to GT3 racing at the moment. The way that they've been driving the car and managing fuel, managing the pit stop cycle, the, the stop time right now while they're filling the car has been exceptional. And Machu Gemini's done 33 laps there. Look at this pit stop, because this is where some teams think that Manti is gaining some advantage and some time. That is rapid fire stuff. Everyone has to be over the line before the car can go. It's not, it's rapid and impressive, but it doesn't, it's not stand out for me. Yeah. And that was four tyres. Yeah. I wondered earlier on if they were only doing two tyres, and that was where we were seeing that eight second. But I don't think that's enough of a of a delta between yeah, nah, the two. For me, it's not in the tyre change phase of the pit stop. It's in the fueling. I think they're saving fuel better than anyone else during the driving stint. And uh, the economy of that car seems to be exceptional. It's a minute 18 total pit stop yeah. time. So fuel four tyres and transiting pit lane, which is 32 seconds. Remember, BMW's last time we tracked that was 28. a minute 28. Yeah. 10 seconds to the better. Well, the last time, the last... Porsche pit stop was a minute 20. Correct. So they've gone two seconds faster than the last pit stop. So it's not and, getting it. The, the story's not getting any better for the opposition. Correct. <laughs> and that, that extra two seconds would be the fuel time that they've been saving, saving in this stint. Yeah. Just extraordinary stuff. The, the, the new car, a lot of people asking about the new Porsche. That is the 992 body shape, debuted at uh, Daytona. Hasn't been through the SRO. BOP process yet. Yeah, that's why it's not here. It's tradition because this race is so early in the calendar that uh, we see the new cars in the in the following year. The guys at Porsche telling me at Daytona that the new car, uh, the only things that are the same are the wheels. That the, literally everything else has been changed, and they will go to the 4.2 liter engine, just under 4.2, actually 4.192, because you couldn't get a piece of paper between the boards of that flat six as it's bored out the moment. So this is the last time we're going to see that car as in comes Dries Vanto in the Shell Helix WRT BMW. 
Matt Campbell made the point yesterday, just to put a full stop on that one. The last time Porsche came here to farewell a current model of a car was 2019. And uh, history recalls that as a very good day for that brand. So once again, BMW M Sport Team WRT pitting both their cars at exactly the same time. Their two cars are on the identical strategy. And it looks like from a driving point of view as well, Rossi staying in car 46. Dries Vantor just in front in car 32. And this is Valentino. So this is his in-lap. Oi! I did notice that the shortcut alarm came up on the timing screen for Valentino. Just oh, lost the rear as it got across the crest. Use that escape road. Well, you always want to optimise your in and out laps. I'm not sure shortcutting <laughs> the track is, uh, is exactly uh, how you want to do it. Valentino staying in the car, so he's double stinting. He'll have done well over two hours in this car by the time he gets out of the Beamer. So the BMWs and the Porsche now on a very, very similar strategy, split by just a lap or two. That gives us an indication of where they're at. We've now got Matt Campbell behind the wheel of car 912. And also on that strategy is Craft Bamboo Racing, who have been flying under the radar today, completely uh, under the radar. Last year, they were well overt in how they were playing the race by stopping at every single opportunity they could take and then making some more opportunities to do so as well. This time, they've been creeping up on it. They were buried in the bottom half of the top 10 for the first three or four hours this morning. But now, Daniel Giancadella comes into pit lane, the Spanish driver from third position. And after a 33-lap stint, same number as the BMWs, comes into the Hong Kong-based team, headed up by Daryl O'Young, based out of Hong Kong. And they're here looking for their first 12-hour victory. So they come in out of third place. Decent peddler himself, Daryl. Yeah. Uh, Daryl O'Young, yeah. yeah. Good touring car uh, racer as well. Did a lot of Bathurst 12-hour races as well over the journey. And the Craft Bamboo is an amalgamation of two racing, two teams, Craft Racing and Bamboo Racing. They merged them together, and since then they've been very successful. Won the Macau GT Festival last year with Mara Engel driving uh, as the Works AMG team. Cool to see Daryl here. He's, he loves this race and, and won it with Audi. He was a, the AM and a Pro-AM combination first year of GT cars and he's had a love affair ever since. As we go on board, so this is for position with the triple nine. Actually, correction, it's not. It's Raffaele Marcello putting a lap on the BMW, yeah. but, but they After just the stopped, stop. remember, yeah. yeah. After the but what, so what my intention there where they left Forest Elbow was the punch off Forest yeah. Elbow for the AMG Mercedes versus the BMW. They're due in very soon, Marcello, 33 laps into this stint cycle itself around because when the BMW stopped they were a minute and a half or so behind yeah. the, the leader of the race in Julian. Further it stays green and through the pit stop cycles with the BMW potentially losing time in each stop that they, they, they're fur falling further and further behind. They've yes. got lap speed yep. just losing too much time through the pit stop cycle. Well, just how hard it is out on track. For Tony Bates is the perfect example of just how hard it is out on track right now. You are drenched, man. I'm driving the Mercedes, it's a car that's normally good for driver comforts, but no drinks bottle, no AC. It is rough out there on the mountain, isn't it? Yeah, well, the driver comforts have gone out the window for some reason. Um, we haven't had a drink all day. Aircon's not working. There's a couple of other issues I won't talk about um, that are going on in the cabin, so it's, uh, it's pretty tough. Um, I was dying for a drink, but... Um, Chris asked me if I could press on for another five laps after um, my stint, and uh, I gave it to him. Times were pretty good, but, um, geez, it was tough out there, that's for sure. Yeah, the times were pretty good. Some of the best you've ever done around the mountain. So the Mercedes is good. It's just difficult. Yeah, the car's left. The, the guys have got the car really set up well. Um, it's just the driver comforts out there. Like, it was damn hot. Um, and not having a drink for over an hour was pretty tough. So um, the first five minutes getting out of the car, I thought I was going to pass out, but um, I had some fluids and electrolytes. So I think I'm back in the car again after this thing. So um, I'll see if anyone's got a uh, ice bath out there that I can jump into. Hero job going for that Pro-Am win. Good luck. Thank you. Ta. Clearly, the furious pace of this race so far is starting to take a bit of a toll on the drivers. And I heard the commentary team speculating as to exactly where we are tracking with this race and how does it stack up 
for previous years. So one of the cool things we can do down here in the Pirelli pit bunker is actually bring up some stats from years gone by to have a bit of an idea where we're tracking. Bentley 2020, we know that the Porsche team are working to that strategy at the moment. 314 laps. Now that works out to be an average of 26.17 laps per hour. And if you sneak over here, you can see exactly where we're looking right now. 26.25 laps an hour with how much green flag running we've had. It's going to give us that predicted total of 315 laps. Now, it is important to talk about, guys, and I know we all have a bit of a laugh about, oh, this is going to bring up the safety cars, because at the end of the day, the teams need to work backwards from that number. So if you're thinking, OK, we're getting 35 laps out of a, a tank of fuel, then you need to work back from lap 315, which you think is going to be the last lap, and then you'll hopefully get a bit of an idea where you need to be making that last pit stop to, to fill it up. Uh, the reason why we've been getting so many laps in is because of these big green flag runs. Now, we all know Richard Crowell's got nothing better to do than watch old races, get his stopwatch out and record how long the green flag runs are. And that's Back. exactly what he's done for us for the last four years, Krause. So 2018, we had an hour and 55 minutes. Now, we've just blazed past that. We're up to two hours, 15 minutes of green flag running since we had that last big crash up at Skyline. We have been in the three-hour mark in 2019 and 2022, but the record still stands at a whopping four hours and 10 minutes from that furious Bentley winning race in 2020. How long will that green flag stay out? Will we get to four hours and 10 minutes? If we do, then it's a pretty good chance, guys, that we'll be getting very close to that number. And with the Porsche strategy tracking very close to what the Bentleys did here, and also BMW on that strategy, might just be the winning strategy to get there come 5.45 p.m. tonight. Chad, the other thing is, though, with your prediction for lap number, it's a moving target. Because yeah. the longer we stay green, could the go further. Yeah. We keep going further and yeah. further, well, that, don't we? So that number it's there, Krause, will yeah, blow out. Yeah. So it's, it's currently 26.25, but it's kind of like the run rate in cricket. The more they're knocking sixes, the higher that run rate's going to go up. And then ultimately, that, that number, the 315, will go up. So they do have to track it. It's not as easy as just going, all right, as long as we pit on about lap number 200 and uh, what would have been 280 or something like that, we'll be able to get home on fuel because it may blow out to be further than that. You're right. I like it. Fun. Valentino a little bit wild coming down through the S's that time through. Just a bit wide. It's a change of direction after Skyline. So double stitch for, for Valentino. Big ask. Tess. Big, big ask. I mean, we can see how still seriously fit he is um, after his MotoGP days. But big front engine, turbo cars, a lot of heat in the front of him. Not used to having that and being in the cockpit for that period of time. It will be an ask for the MotoGP legend. Well, whilst you were down in the bunker with uh, Chad earlier on, I was, I was mentioning the fact that he's moving in entirely the wrong direction that he's used to as well. Water bikes lean into corners, cars lean away lean from out of the corner. So all the G-forces are yeah. reversed for him. That's a good point. And, and yet he sits there and he's, he's so still. You'd think he'd be doing this for, you know, Anytime you're not used to being in a car or even a go-kart, you go to your local arrival down go-kart, you're tensed up, you're hanging onto that steering wheel for grim death, and that's really tiring, and also it makes your movements really jerky. He's sitting there as if, he, if he's on a Sunday afternoon drive down to Orange. Talk about Sunday afternoon, I think someone better wake up. Raffaello Marciello, he's asleep at the pit stop here. <laughs> I think that's called focus. <laughs> don't you, don't yeah. your drivers call that focus? Yeah, that's what we call it. Just fuel only for that pit stop. So a bit of strategy going on for the Gripper M team. So 36 laps in that stint, minute and eight for pit lane time. So that's the difference between that and the Porsche. 10 seconds for tyres when they took four on the Manti EMA Porsche. So Jules Gunnar still the leader. His margin, a minute and a half. but yet to stop. And only a couple of laps away from seeing 75 back in the lane. So 30 laps, Jules has been in that car, pounding away out in front. Um, there was some good commentary on social media. Don't forget to join us, hashtag B12HR. So why was, uh, at the time, Matthew Jaminet not catching Jules Gunon? The answer was Jules Gunon. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. <laughs> and that's an absolutely yes. legit answer, because he's... One of the best, and the ultimate example of that was the end of last year's race where it was Maro Engel in the Kraft Bamboo car chasing him, and the margin was eight seconds, and it stayed at eight yeah. seconds. No matter what Maro could throw at it, it was never going to get any smaller. And both those cars could not go a tenth yeah. of a second faster at that stage of the race. Drivers were at the limit. 
on board with the Porsche here again with Matt Campbell and straight into fuel saving mode again as he crests skyline. So we've been talking about it all day, how fast they are in pit lane, but it's the work they're doing here in the race, in the stints. They are lifting and coasting so early in this car, but maintaining lap time. So clearly a lot of practice, a lot of preparation has gone into this strategy throughout the course of practice in the lead up to today's race. And I feel like Porsche are well in this race when it comes to strategy. And they've got the speed if they need it as well. Just listen here, flat here, and lifts off at the 220 metre mark and probably hitting the brake at about 100 metres. You can brake a little bit later when you lift and coast. That's how you maintain your lap time by using less fuel. You'll lift the coast again here, off at the 150 board, braking at the 60 metre mark. So that's how you're saving fuel and doing it very, very well. And it's actually good for your brake pads yeah. as well because you're actually braking from a lower uh, a, a initial speed when you hit, hit the pedal. And the car balance often changes. A lot of the time you find out you go faster in some sectors of the racetrack when you're fuel saving because you don't pitch the car as aggressively where you go from full throttle to full brake and the car dives in the front. When you're doing the lift and coast style, we'll hear it again here at the end of Mountain Straight, off at 180, wow. braking at 60. And the car transitions its weight from the rear to the front much, much slower. So the car's much more comfortable when you turn it in and then you can roll more speed through the corner. And yet, Garth, his last lap was a 2 3 6 Yeah, so that's yeah. the point I was trying to make. <laughs> They're maintaining lap time by not, not burning any fuel. I did say at the start of the race, you can't go fast for free, but Porsche found <laughs> it's on sale. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's a bit of a discount <laughs> today. They went shopping on Boxing Day and got the really good prices. Big lift there as well. And they'll be again here at Skyline listening. Yeah, massive coast there. This, this, this is very reminiscent of on boards at the Nürburgring Nordschleifer. Very, very reminiscent of that. And these guys know that race very, very well uh, indeed. Managing to maintain their pace, but in some way, just saving fuel for fun, translating to several seconds in the pit lane. And that is the beauty of this five and a half hours to go. We're into the second half of this year's Liquid Molly Bathurst 12 hours. The Spares Box highlights of the Liquid Molly Bathurst 12 hour, 169 laps complete in this race. How far will we go? The answer for Audi was 13 laps for Chris Hazer. Massive disappointment for fans of the Four Rings because they were out of the race very, very early. So too for Grove Racing, a big impact for Stephen Grove. He's okay, the car not so much. And after a really promising performance for the Wall Racing Lamborghini, uh, a challenging couple of moments for Adrian Dietz have ruled them out of the race after 70 laps. And then Aaron Cameron, this was a wild moment on the run down to the spares box dipper. Unfortunately, after running in the top 10, qualifying in the top 10, the Valmont Racing Mercedes AMG found itself out of the race with a lot of damage. Grant Donaldson had some dramas in the Invitational car. They're still circulating for Mark Cars Australia. But the performance, the surprise, perhaps has been canny strategy from Sun Energy One Racing and it has got the defending champions in the lead of this race with five hours and 32 minutes to go. Here's how the classes stand, thanks to Boisel Watchers, who sponsored the Pro-Am class, and Chris Meese leads the way there. He's not the Am in that car, by the way. He's a two-time winner of this race. Now, Shishin will jump back in the second half. Daniel Gaunt leads the way in the silver category for all the Kiwis. And the New Zealand Grand Prix not far away, actually. Bring you some results. He's won that race on two occasions. And that's the outright leaderboard. We're waiting for some more pit stops to play out. But the lead at the moment for Jules Gounon, who's due a pit stop soon, is one minute and 30 seconds. He could conceivably pit again under green flag conditions and resume in the race lead for the second time in a row, which would be amazing. He leads Raffaele Marciello and Matt Campbell, both of whom we've just seen in pit lane. Ross Lucas. Ross and Lucas out of the number 101 Mercedes. It's been a good, quiet race for you guys, just going along, doing your stuff. Is that how it feels from behind the wheel as well? Oh, for me, not so much. It's my first time here, so you can imagine it's quite intense. Uh, my first session was 
you know, a lot to get a handle on, but the second session I felt a lot better and, yeah, going faster and faster. So setting personal best time, so I'm happy with that. Now, you guys have four drivers. Does that make it any easier with rest time? Are you getting more time off? Uh, yes, in the first stint, but now I'm only getting an hour off. Uh, but, look, it's, it is good, but it's also good to have that experience there. I said, being my first time, but having the boys of Valente Rosso, Josh Hunt, Kevin C and Jonathan Hoy, they're just fantastic. So I'm learning a lot from them. Is this your first endurance race? Uh, my first 12 hour. I did the three hour at Bathurst last year with Jordan Love. But, yeah, my first 12 hour, and I'm loving the whole weekend. So we'll see you back here next year then? Definitely. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thanks to Shay Adam down in pit lane, patrolling the lane with Chad Nalon and Mark Beretta. Cool to hear from Ross Polak, because he's a lovely guy and really invested in this sport, building the program with Harold's Racing, working with Josh Hunt and uh, Chris Papadopoulos down there at Valenti Rosso Motorsport, Sydney-based team. There is the 101 car. Just saying g'day. <laughs> so I wonder whether there's a bit of an issue with the AMG cars with that front lip on the bonnet because we saw the the, the seal come out of the Grupa M triple nine car and that's obviously the same area. So whether there's just something with the way the cars move through the air, probably in that dip right in the bottom of Conrod, there's an air pressure change and the AMG car's not liking it because you wouldn't want your, uh, your car flapping like that again there. You can just see on the Herald sign on the 101 AMG. It shouldn't be flapping around like that. So just something to monitor. It's not going to hurt them in any way, but just something to keep an eye on. The 888 car was doing it too. Something in the design of that car when it's at VMAX speed and all the aero on the front. I wonder whether the seal's actually gone from this car and then that's why this one's flapping. So. Yeah, that's, that's our coming out at the back of that, i.e. just over the top of the yeah. sponsor name on the front of that car, there's a there's a, a a lip, a join there, because that front part doesn't lift, and then the bonnet, the hood, is behind yeah. that. Yeah. And that's coming out from underneath that big gaping mouth. Changed the, the design of that a couple of three years ago when they did the Evo of this car, and that's our exiting under pressure from running through the radiators and the other coolers at the front of that. So you've got oil coolers, you've got water coolers. It's not water now, it's coolant, of course, because everyone's a bit cleverer than, than that. And then it's been diverted. Instead of staying into the engine bay and venting out where it's supposed to, it's diverting out between the gap between that front clip and the leading edge of the bonnet as the leader finally pits. So let's follow this. A minute 33 is the margin. So just over 90 seconds between... Jules Gounon and Raffaele Marcello. And we've seen already that you can do a pit stop in under 120 seconds if you're a Porsche team. But don't forget that the time for the pit stop time comes from pit entry mm -hmm. to pit exit. It doesn't include the pit entry road or getting up to speed, Correct. leaving pit lane up Mountain Straight. So a minute 33, that's going to be pretty tight. 35 laps that stint. It's a good green flag stint for an AMG at mm -hmm. this place. So, Jules, one of those drivers like Matt Campbell who can not only maintain a lead but invent fuel from where it doesn't exist. See, I, I feel like racing car drivers can be the solution to the energy crisis because they have the ability to invent fuel. So, I wonder ah, whether they have got a front overheating. Problem. Yeah, overheating yeah. with this car. So, it took some time there. You couldn't work on the car while the fuel was going in. So, they had, she had to take the time to. What? do the work and they've got it to burn so a minute 20 from pit in to pit out and the margin was a minute 34 they're comfortable uh, and and that's good that's good that, that's good team management that you've seen right there we know we're not going to take tires we know how long the field's going to go in roughly speaking uh, we're having a bit of problem with the temp so we really would like to have a look at it yeah take your time have a look yeah. and we've still look. got the lead by the length of mountain straight yeah. so you're right just take a bit of time, make sure it's right. If there is a cooling problem, get the front grille as clear as you can, as often as you can, because it's only going to get worse as the day goes on. Even if you don't have a cooling problem, clear the grille anyway, because you've yes. got time to do it. Uh, well, while well, we follow that story, the margin 19 seconds, by the way. Uh, the last time we saw Mark Beretta, he was uh, enjoying himself at the top of the mountain, let's just say. Let's go back and find out where the great man is now.
Now you might know Bathurst City, but do you know Bathurst Heights? Top of the mountain, how good is this? Have a look at the array of camping and caravans and camper gear that is up the top here. There is, and combis, thank you sir, there's combis as well. And of course, it, it can get cold here overnight, but not a problem when you're BYO firewood. Have a look at that. And if you need to cook, well, it's all here. Everything is set up. These guys are completely self-contained. And when it comes to the crunch, have a look over here. Racetrack, McPhillamy Park is right there. And check this out. I love this. When it gets, you get hungry at night, the pizza place is right there. And we've lost him for the rest of the day. No, he's not coming back. No. <laughs> to be fair, why would you? <laughs> Just over 20 degrees, beautiful day, sun shining. He went to the corporate box, he got a watch. Mm. Now he's gone to the top of the mountain, he found a beer. He's got pizza for lunch. Yep. I reckon he would probably do a story on shade at some point to find the right vantage point I think yeah. for the last 15, 20 minutes of the day. at about 3 o'clock, he'll work his way up to the champagne suite <laughs> at the end of pit lane. I think I could book that in right now. That man knows how to motor race. He does. Mark Beretta, it's inspirational stuff. So 19.3 seconds, the margin, first to second. Juganon over Raffaele Marciello. So uh, Sun Energy One were able to complete that pit stop, clear the debris away from the front of that car and get them back out whilst not losing the race lead. And that's all just come about, making those stops under yellow and uh, playing the track position game early in the race. If, if you looked at just the pit stop, but one of them, I think, was a penalty, wasn't it, that they kept uh, one one drive through? Yeah. But you, you normally look at a, uh, at a motor race and you look at how many times the car's been down pit lane and you would look to the ones that had the fewest pit stops. Uh, well, they've got nine against everyone else around them at five or six. Mm. They're not actually leading the leaderboard of the actual race. They're leading the pit stop count. Yeah, as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 The <laughs> next best, they have nine. The next best is the 55 Audi of Schumacher Motorsport at eight, and they had to come in for about five penalties. Yeah. So it goes to prove how much strategy plays a part here, Garth, and working with the driver in the car at the time, your track position, how far through your stint you are. But, you know, normally it's uh, nine pit stops, he's had a bad day. And you need the drivers to buy into it, so you need the drivers to understand what you're going to achieve at the various stages of the race. So the drivers need to be part of that. They, just, they can't just call it on the run. Here we go. Matt Campbell trying to get past Yasha Shaheen, who's in the car during the AM phase of the race in the second half of the race. Remember, we mentioned it earlier that all the AMs in the Pro-AM class have to do at least an hour in the second half of the race. So Yasha Shaheen aboard the 777 Audi. Matt Campbell getting by and now comes up on Jeffrey Ibrahim. He's aboard the 99 Boost Mobile 888 run. AMG Mercedes, who are fulfilling the same regulation of him doing his 60 minutes past the half hour, or the half race point. The other team who've worked the strategy pretty well is the triple nine car, which are back up the second now with Rafa Marcello. Ooh, coming out of visit New South Wales.com corner, Griffiths Bend. I think that car's gone behind the wall. That was the number 19 GT4 Mercedes Benz been having and issues throughout the course of the last couple of hours and there it is it's found a nice spot in the shade but ultimately would much rather still be driving around mount panorama there is an overlap on the wall yeah. there isn't the yeah, guard yeah. so he's actually pretty can, safe there can back it in there and hopefully we stay green for this portion of the race here we have Chaz mostert continues to get himself back in the game chasing down charles wheats that is a battle for position. This is for position. Chaz trying to get up the inside before the kink. Does Wheat see him coming? Chaz rolled out of it. And just as well, he oh, did oh, roll oh, out oh, of it. Oh, oh, but now sends it up the inside on the brakes into the chase proper. That was a bit hairy, that one. You need plenty of cooperation to go two by two through the kink at the end of Conrod Strait. Sixth position then for Chaz. And a 2 or 2 one, 6 earlier on for that car. He's the fastest lap of the 2023. Little Molly Bathurst, 12 hours. Clean as you like, eventually. I think uh, there was some very quick decision made. Yeah, I think the heart rate went up instantly right at the kink, and then Chaz changed his mind and sent it up the inside. As we got on the brakes, down into the chase proper, and that was for position. Mostert now finds himself in sixth place on board with Yash Shaheen getting past, well, attempting to get past the Boost Mobile AMG Mercedes of Jeffrey Ibrahim. 
They run up Mountain Straight on their way to Griffith's Bend. What happens here? Who blinks first? Start the camp, Dale. There we go. <laughs> Around the outside, takes the racing line, does Yash Shaheen, and continues on his way. That was for position. Ninth for Shaheen, tenth for Jeffrey Ibrahim. We're rolling more guests in and out of our Liquid Molly Bathurst Global Broadcast Centre here as Raphael Marciello comes down to the final corner to complete another lap and goes past us right now. Uh, welcome to Craig Lowndes. Lowndes, how are you doing, man? I'm very well. It's nice up here. It's it is. It's pleasant. <laughs> you look far too fresh. Have you driven yet? I've done uh, uh, two and a bit hours already, so uh, no, it's been really good actually. The car is actually quite nice to drive. We're a little bit slow in a straight line. I think we have got too much downforce, um, but other than that, it's uh, yeah, it's good. Like the it wasn't even the first sentence wasn't even <laughs> half finished, and he was throwing in just straight in. Oh, it's not fast enough in a straight line. We got too much downforce on it. I can't go any faster because the car won't let me. Didn't even get a sentence done, Lowndes. Nope. Um, actually, Scotty Taylor's in the car at the moment, and uh, this is his first stint for the day. It, it, look, the car is nice to drive. All four of us are really happy in the sense of uh, the balance-wise of it. It's not as sharp as, I suppose, if, if you wanted it for an ultimate lap time, but for the pros and the pro-ams, it's uh, a nice car to drive. We talked about that with David Reynolds earlier on, and, and, and their setup with the, the McKeaton car, the number 24 car. You need to have something that the lesser experienced drivers are happy with. When you don't drive every weekend, you don't have those cat-like reflexes, so you want the car to be relatively neutral. Oh, absolutely. The other thing that we've got to remember, too, for both of the car, uh, is the muscle memory. Is you know, We're normally sitting on the other side of the car, so when you're going up through these sections of the track through the cutting here, you've got to make sure you've got to remember that you're sitting on the left-hand side, and then you come up out of here, under the tree here, and you're almost flat. You got to remember, you're not sitting on that right-hand side. You're going to wipe all that off. So it is something that you got to keep consciously just thinking about where you're sitting, where you're placing the car. But I've got to say, like, it's really nice to drive across the top. It's just lifts. It's no braking. It's just a nice little easy lift back on the throttle, and then the run down into Skyline. And knowing you got ABS and everything else at your aid, you can come over Skyline here and really have a good crack at it. You're racing, and that's great. But you're also racing awareness as well for the Prostate Cancer Foundation, raising money for them and raising awareness globally, actually, because you're talking to a global audience now, and I can tell you, the Twitter's been going mad on B12HR. Tell us a little bit about this initiative. This isn't new for you guys. You've done it before. We did it last year, and, and it was something that uh, actually Scotty Taylor, uh, about two weeks out of last year's 12-hour race, rang us up and said, look, yeah, we, I've got this idea. We want to run a uh, charity car and have you involved, so it means four drivers. Uh, and then we ran it last year. It was a bit of a, a I suppose, a, a hurry to get it all together. But we used the Prostate Cancer Foundation here. And, and of course, we raised good funds last year. It was 67,000 last year. And then we had a bit more time this year to plan it. Of course, we're running uh, the Mercedes GD3 of uh, Scotty Taylor's. It's a little bit of an older generation aero kit, but everything, of course, the engine, everything else under it is the same. But, uh, you know, Scotty, again, wanted to run the car with, with uh, the Prostate Cancer Foundation on it, and it's been fantastic. It's, it's had great awareness, and we've had a lot of people come into the garage, sign the car, which is what we wanted to do for a donation, but it was really all about getting that awareness out there, and, uh, and, and especially for my, myself, because my brother and my father have gone through it. So for me, it's now five times more likely at some point in my life that I may contract it. So it's, it's just as easy as a blood test. The, the hashtag is get checked. At the point you've just made there, this is not an invasive procedure anymore. It's no need to get embarrassed about it. It's as simple as, as going down and giving a little bit of blood. Uh, absolutely. And of course, when we get our motor racing license here in Australia, we have to get blood tested and everything else. So on part of that is the PSA. Uh, we put that on and we just monitor that year in, year out. And, uh, and at the moment, I actually rang the doctor a couple of weeks ago after I got my test and, uh, and it's all normal. So, you know, it's, it's just about awareness, getting the message out there and getting checked. We're still raising funds at the moment through the race? Yeah. Absolutely. How do we get involved? Well, you can get on the website. There's uh, barcodes out the back of the garage. Um, but at the moment, uh, I think you've got the total figure because I, as I was walking here, I got told it. And of course, you know, as race drivers, we don't remember it. But it's 53,742 so far. And it, it's something that uh, uh, really, it, it's, as I said, it's just for a great cause. Scotty's loving this. You know, we're in the Pro-Am class. But, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, for us, it's just about having fun, getting Scotty. This is the first time Scotty's actually raced his own race car here. <laughs> 
it's a, it's it, this car has raced here many a times. Year, we? We're in his cup car last yeah. year, but this car we ran here many years, or not many years ago, about three or four years ago, as the Vodafone car with Jamie, Shane, and I. So that was this. This is the car, uh, but this is the first time that Sha uh, sorry Scotty has actually driven his own car. Oh, it's nice of you guys to let Scotty actually turn up and have a skid in his own race car. That's very, very big of you, Craig. Oh, you are, yeah, well, we're going to have to see what he's like after this stint. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be checking the, the uh, stint upright, will you? <laughs> Looking at it forensically. Well, I heard you guys as I walked in that there's been no safety cars, and we're a couple of laps down now, so we're really looking oh, for that lucky bit, dog. You want a wave by, do you? Yeah, we need a couple of wave bys, <laughs> moment. Well, you've had this place on the screen in the past, mate, so you could probably organise that, I would have thought. <laughs> Well, I did. I did hear uh, early on there was a kangaroo on on board. So if we can have some uh, native Australian animals back on, that'd be great. What's the key to this place, that, Greg? As you have had such success here, down through the years. It's all about just staying out of trouble. We saw so many incidents early on. We actually got part. Well, we were part of it because Alex had contact into turn two uh, with. Uh, Britain, Britain Grove in the Porsche. So you just got to stay out of trouble and basically just circulate around and try and be on the lead lap. Uh, it's 177 laps completed. She'll good on leads by 20 and a half seconds. That panorama Bathurst, it's the only place to be this weekend. Busy month of endurance racing, and this is one of the Blue Riband events in the world. Dubai 24 is behind us. We've had the Rolex 24 hours at Daytona, 14 drivers making the trip around from that, and now we concentrate on this ribbon of tarmac, originally built as a scenic drive, remember, not designed as a racetrack, but it has absolutely transformed my knowledge of motor racing and particularly GT racing, it's as if someone had sat down, Lanty, and thought, I'll tell you what we're going to do, we'll have, in a few years' time, we'll have a race round here. My father has actually been part of this circuit back in the late 60s, early 70s, and he's got some eight, eight millimetre uh, pedestrian uh, film, and you look, you wind back the clock back then, there was no concrete barriers. Dick Johnson, I think, turned yeah. right there and went up, ended up into the tree, so it's amazing how this circuit's evolved. I never got this opportunity, I don't think you did, GT, when it used to go straight. Never used to have this chase. It used to go straight down into Murray's Corner. And, uh, and you talk to some of the older generation that, bet, that race on that, and they used to talk about the cars getting light and getting airborne over that second hump. So uh, it is amazing. And it's also great to have, like, a Valentino Rossi that wants to come here and race. I, I mean... The, the, the notes that are coming in on Twitter are, are unbelievable. Clearly, people know about Bathurst. How can you not? But I still think it takes people's breath away. And one that I noticed earlier on, all endurance races should be through trees and fields. Which, which, <laughs> you know, it's actually pretty good. It, 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 when you think about that, it gives such a diff, different perspective from a quote-unquote, Garth, a traditional permanent race. But well, race. Now that you mention it, you think about it, we've got Bathurst, Nordschleife, Le Mans, three pretty reasonable yeah. circuits. They all go through country fields. Wineries, there'd be some wineries around Le Mans, wouldn't there? Uh, just one or two. Yeah, you probably know a few <laughs> of them, I would have thought, John. I can't possibly comment <laughs> on that, but I often uh, I often grade the cars that we take down there by how many dozen bottles I can get, <laughs> get into. By the load capacity. Load <laughs> capacity and uh, how many I can relieve from the French. Let's find out what Mark Barrett has been doing. He's off on his travels, and he's going to make us even more envious. Where is he now? Well, John, I've been up and seen the trees and the hills. They're fantastic, and that was a great experience. But I'm back down in pit lane now with Andreas Ruse from BMW Motorsport. And how good to have BMW back. Andreas, welcome back. A good decision to come back and race this race again. Yeah, thank you for being back here. So we are really happy. I mean, the 12 hours of Bathurst is always a great experience, a great race. So we're happy to be here with two cars and uh, hopefully have a good result at the end. Our team looks fantastic. Your partnership with WRT is working well. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we started uh, basically this year, the partnership with WRT. I mean, WRT has a great history in GT racing, but also endurance racing and uh, prototype racing. And we are super happy to have them as a partner now with us here at the GT program. So it couldn't be better. The car, you're out there, you're fighting hard. It's becoming a little bit tricky in these conditions. 
Yeah, at the moment in the morning in the night or when it was still cold, it, it looked really good for us. We were on the pace, we were fighting at the moment, we were dropping a bit back at the moment that we are on P7, P8, but still a long race. We hope that we can fight back and uh, at the end have a good result and maybe end up on the podium. And Andreas, great driving team. Uh, Valentino Rossi has been a tremendous addition. Yeah, to be honest, our driver lineup here is really is fantastic. When you see the guys, they are doing really a perfect job, no mistake, nothing. And Valentino is perfectly fitting in. He's on the pace of the other, so it's it's really nice to see how everything works together. Andreas, you see the races around the world. Give us an idea of where this race, the Bathurst 12 hour, fits in. I mean, it's a, it's really an incredible event, and the racetrack. I mean, when you go around the racetrack, it, it's really fantastic, especially the mountain section. When you see it, how narrow it is and how the, the track moves, I, I mean, it's fantastic. We also race on the big notch life, but uh, this comes close to it, or it's even quite close. It's, I mean, it's shorter, but uh, it's not less uh, of a nice track. Yeah, it's very exciting. We know yeah. that much. Hey, Andreas, great to see you here. Great to have BMW. Welcome back. See you next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very busy man. Just not, well, not long since taking over the top spot at BMW Motorsport and M as well. His predecessor going into Formula One, of course. Yeah. Mike uh, uh, Crack with the um, Aston, Martin. Aston Martin team. Their front team, that's uh, great. And they've not only introduced this, relatively speaking, a year ago, they introduced the BMW M4 GT4, uh, and now they've debuted their V8 twin turbo engine GTP prototype at Le Mans, uh, at Le Mans, excuse me, at Daytona. We were talking about Le Mans earlier on. Uh, and that means they've been working particularly, it's a good time for sports car racing, guys, isn't it, to be honest? Absolutely. And look at the crowd. I think it was amazing early in the week when we drive the cars from the circuit into town, then you do a signing session in the square. It was amazing to see how many faces and how many people are here that have come out and uh, I'm sure Valentino's part of that, but uh, it's just great to see motor racing back on the calendar and, and able, able now to have international drivers and teams come to Australia, vice versa. You know, the Groves have been racing uh, Abu Dhabi 24 hour. To, so for us to now open up the, the door again to go back overseas and do some more racing. We've talked about this a number of times, but it's true that this race has given the opportunity, Garth, for the uh, for the regional drivers to show their skills to the world because nobody else drives supercars. It's not like yeah. you go and do the European Supercar Championship because the quite simply isn't what, you know, the, 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 the UK Supercar Championship. Oh, hang on a second. <laughs> Knock Hill, uh, <laughs> Alton Park. Oh, dear me. Brent Hatch Short Circuit. Oh, <laughs> yes, please. Go and get but you haven't, you know, until we had these crossover races, there wasn't the opportunity for people to say, hey, these guys actually really can drive. Yeah, for Australian drivers to measure themselves against the international drivers. I think the best case that we've seen so far this weekend was Brock Fiennes' performance in qualifying Super. yesterday. Put the car on the front row, just missed out on the lap record. Actually, did break the lap record, but just by not enough, because Maro Engel was able to do it. Out qualified Gilles Gounon, who was we well renowned as one of the best Mercedes AMG GT3 drivers in the world. So, for Brock to have that opportunity to showcase his skill set in his home, on his home track, in his home environment, in a foreign car, it's a great opportunity for him. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that also, too, that we know this circuit, we don't know the cars. So yeah. there's a, actually a balance there of, of, uh, of knowledge of cars. And you see Maro Ingo in qualifying, he just knew where to extract that speed that he needed just to break into that two-minute bracket, which was quite amazing to think only a few years ago we were nowhere near that, that time. Uh, Craig Lowndes is going to get back to the team. Uh, we thank you for coming to see us and good luck with raising all the money for uh, hashtag get checked. That's what you need to do. Go drive a race car, Lowndes. Just over five hours and seven minutes to go. So we have the revolving door of talent in the uh, Liquid Molly Bathurst Global Broadcast booth. And the man with more fans than anyone else here has just rejoined us, Richard Crail. I just wanted to give you, I hope you appreciate, John Hindoff, that you don't often get to spend a stint commentating at Bathurst with 11 Bathurst 1000 victories between the three of you in the commentary box. Yeah, and none of them were from me, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Plus two 12 hour wins and a 24 hour win as well. Yeah, not absolutely. bad, is it? Not yeah, bad. Yeah, but none of them have been second at a, yeah, a we 24 don't. hour race at court. None <laughs> of those guys have got a banner at the chase. Correct. Again. 
He's got a, hasn't he got a corner one, named after him somewhere? There was only one person. There's only Valentino Rossi's had longer autograph queues than Richard Crail this weekend. Surely you've got a go-kart truck named after you somewhere in Perth. Come on. <laughs> anyway, Jules Gunon continues oh, to lead. Flat batted that <laughs> right, right back. Marcello. That's enough of that. Matt Campbell. And there we are. Do you, do you drive a car through that at any point, that oh, banner? Happy magnificent. Is that what happens? Chips are hazarded straight Run into the commentary the box it. through it in the morning. That's I want, I want to see you drive through it. Fireworks go off and all sorts of things next year, Richard Crail. That would be how we introduce him, of course, yeah, would it? Be. I think it's his contract. Gentlemen. Richard Crail. Did you sign that banner? No comment, that's a yes. I have, I have video oh, I proof of that that's been sent to me by the Sheikh Dallas. We'll get Absolutely. that in the telecast before the end of the year. At the end of the race, that'll be, we'll see that. Seven and a half seconds to lead. Gunon then doing what Gunon does in this number 75 car. It's been a typical endurance race uh, in terms of the guys at the front and getting that balance between strategy and speed and reliability and, and fuel mileage. And the guys at Sun Energy One have simply just done better than everyone else. And when you see that, and you see the teams and drivers, Garth Tander, that are behind them, that is a massive credit to that number 75 team. Oh, one in the wall. Oh, it's right the, in front of the oh, leader. No, it's Leonti's car. It's Scott Taylor in the Triple Two AMG. We, when you see that dust come up from the run from Skyline to the Boards Dipper, flags, you hold your breath. The Triple Two AMG has got away from Scott yeah. Taylor. That's a terrible shame. We're just talking to Craig Lowndes about the wonderful work this team is doing to raise awareness for the Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia. Two hours and 50 minutes, all bar a few seconds of green flag before we will see the fifth intervention of the AMG safety car. Now, the question for mine, and, and obviously first and foremost is we hope Scott is OK because there's no such thing as a small incident at that point of the racetrack. We saw the Valmont car go in there earlier today. So that was a, a significant impact. But this is going to have quite a significant impact on the race and the way it was all playing out as well. So the Mercedes AMG safety car, E63 AMG, rolls onto the circuit for the fifth time today. And the race will be brought in control with Shulgunon leading Raffaele Marciello. 15 seconds of race lead disappears for car 75. Mount Panorama, just when you think things are settling down, always throws another curveball at you. And as a result of the fifth Mercedes AMG safety car, we've got leading cars in pit lane. Juggernon has stayed out. Porsche comes in, and so too does Grupa M's Mercedes AMG. And this is why we're under safety car. A big impact. Scott Taylor behind the wheel. Into the spares box dipper. Very big impact running down the hill. Substantial whack for Scotty. He's been racing in Carrera Cup of late. And that was the dust cloud we saw that Jill Goon on the race leader was driving through. So he was the first one on the scene. But didn't pit. Interesting. He's, uh, what, 12 laps into a stint there. That's a third of a way through the stint, Crailsey. And has decided not to pit. Now, they have taken every opportunity to pit before now in the Sun Energy 1, number 75. So let's uh, see how that shakes out for them. Everyone will pack up behind the safety car. So that action at the Spares Box Dipper and to celebrate their return to the Liquid Molly Bathurst 12 hour, they have got a sale on, the Spares Box Bathurst sale. Uh, just jump onto sparesbox.com.au and find all the parts you need for your car. That's a great sign at the Spares Box Dipper that Scott Taylor is out of the Mercedes AMG GT3 and will be taken by Team Medical back down to the medical centre here in the pit building for precautionary checks, of course. Well, while we're under safety car and we work our way through this and that's landed well for a couple of drivers, we'll detail the strategy for you in a minute, but Brock Feeney picks the Triple Eight. The BMWs are in as well and it's convenient we have a look at car 30 because one of the drivers of this car is in the commentary box. Great to have 2018 12 hour winner Drew Banker with us, mate. Welcome. Thank you very much. First time for me, so looking forward. <laughs> uh, how's it been for you today? 
Um, well, you know, we had a f fortunately we had our our small issue yesterday in qualifying, which then put us back a few a few places. But um, we had actually a good run uh, through the through the field this morning. Um, and now when it became a bit more hot, uh, it's suffering us a bit. Uh, we lost a bit of our uh, performance, but it's still a long race, so I mean, a lot can still happen. So just to elaborate on that a little bit, because the cars looked really strong this morning and you were able to run with especially the 912 and the 999 that was setting the pace earlier. But just that those last two stints in particular lost a little bit of track position and dropped 90 seconds behind the leaders. Yeah, exactly. Just like I said, I think uh, the temperature is not helping us at the moment. But, um, you know, we have to uh, try to keep pushing, uh, try to, you know, keep going and make no mistakes. And then uh, the race is still five hours to go. So. So how does that manifest itself? Is it the engine doesn't make as much power, the car's not as easy to drive? Uh, and what, or what can, if anything, what can you do to, to get around that? Well, I think for sure, I mean, I don't have so much experience with turbo cars, I'm, I'm getting it now. Um, but what I know from the past is that, um, yeah, it's always um, a bit more tricky for them when it, when it gets more hot. Uh, I think it's also normal for turbo cars. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, we are we are suffering that at the moment. It's quite a bit of pressure. Actually. Yeah. Um, but yeah, hopefully, you know, it will not get cooler anymore. So we will not get our our straight line or straight line performance back. But uh, we just have to try to do the best we can, make no mistakes, and hope for for something uh, to, to, to come back into the race. Well, and safety car periods like this do close that gap. You get that track position back, so at least you're in that mix. Exactly. How challenging has it been for you and for the team to adapt from the Audis that you were running in the past to the BMW M4 that you've got now? And bearing in mind, you haven't had them for very long. It's still a very new program for WRT. Yeah, exactly. We only did, uh, I think, three test days before, before this race or before Dubai, actually. Um, so we are... Not the best prepared, I would say, but of course, I mean, with WRT and BMW working together, I have no, uh, I'm not worried that we will be unprepared coming into a race, but um, yeah, like you said, uh, the, the, the change has been not easy. Uh, it's of course very different. Uh, the BMW is a very new car. It's a very, I find a high potential car. So we for sure can make something out of it, 100%, but it's up to us now to make it work. and. Like you said, uh, DTM, it, it worked well, but on pre-release now, uh, GT World Challenge, it's up to us to make it work. How important do you think it was, that decision to go to Dubai? Very different racing track to here, um, different environment, um, perhaps a little less um, of a pressure cooker situation uh, with Creventnik, and that, that's no disrespect to that race. You had some good competition there, particularly the Herbert Porsche pushed you very hard indeed. What did you learn from doing that and how important was it for you to do that 24-hour race with both cars? Uh, I think for me personally it was quite important considering I don't have so much experience with a car. I got used to how everything works inside the cockpit, how all the buttons, how the car behaves. Okay, it's different tyres, but you, you, you get to learn the ABS, you get to learn the traction control, you get to learn how everything, you know, how you have to work and everything because it's of course very different. Um, so for us, I think it was quite important to do this, just to get also for the team to, to be able to know how to work with the car because it's very different again. Um, and I think that's why it was a good preparation. And like I said, um, it's now up to us to, to make it work, but I'm quite, quite convinced that uh, it will work. But unfortunately, that takes time. Promising signs early. You've been quick here. It's nice to have you back. Looking forward to seeing how very quickly do you get back in the car at some point this afternoon? Uh, yeah, so I think Sheldon will, after Charles will now, oh, he's already in the car. Uh, he will do a double now, and then after that, it will be me. Good luck to the end, I guess. Great. Good luck. Possibly Excellent. see you on the podium for a second Bathurst 12 hour win. Dries Van Thorpe, thanks for joining oh, us. Thank you very much. There's Dries Van Thorpe for BMW M Team WRT. They're in good shape here at the mountain. Great to see the world of talent coming back to Mount Panorama and joining us up here in the commentary box. So they're in uh, sixth position at the moment with Sheldon van der Linde behind the wheel as the recovery continues for the Scott Taylor Motorsport. 
Uh, AMG, we've just had Lounsey up here and they're just about to crack $60,000 raised for the second year in a row. Yeah, for that come program. on, guys. It doesn't mean you can stop. No, get done it. Now, there you go. This is... The car's not going to be running around for a little while, so get some donations in. We'll, we'll keep mentioning it throughout the rest of the... Just under five hours to go now. But there's your excuse if you needed one. Find out all about it. Get donating for that uh, prostate cancer foundation and uh, use the has use the hashtag get checked. Uh, all the information is on the prostate cancer foundation website here in Australia. We've gone through another hour, Creelzy, and the big the numbers we're keeping check. Chad's uh, keeping us uh, updated with what we need to know. Uh, it had to be a 188, so we were about four laps behind maybe a little bit more and this uh, safety car is just going to take that magical 2k in terms of distance out of reach but still right there for the distance record so we've got two two separate targets to go at as far as the, the end of the race this afternoon is concerned Patrice an impressive young man oh, isn't very he and achieved a lot in his very young racing career speaks very well represents his brands very well and the team and, and and everybody at wrt let's not forget this is not what they were expecting to be doing right now they had very different plans with a different manufacturer uh, had uh, building up a, a gtp car an lmdh prototype uh, they've had to change direction i remember seeing to von son forsman at saw him at Sebring this time last year. Don't worry, something will come along and BMW very, very quickly when finding that WRT weren't going to be working with one of their competitors got in there. And that speaks volumes about what Von Son and his partners have done down the years uh, at that uh, team in Belgium. And do you think they'll end up at Le Mans? Yes. Mm. Yeah. They, 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 are sl they are slated to run the WEC portion of the BMW prototype and that car should be testing in Europe shortly RLL, Rahal Latham and Lanigan running the cars in the US not bringing those cars to Le Mans this year that's been left to Von Son's team and that testing very different racetracks of course uh, in Europe to what we find in the States so Vance and WRT have been integrated into RLL some of their team were at Daytona actually so yes and maybe Dries is part of that could see him at the Circuit de la Sarthe before too long We're on the banks of the Macquarie here in the central tablelands of New South Wales, the vibrant regional centre of Bathurst. It's a great mix of old and new, this place. New distilleries, amazing old architecture and heritage-listed buildings, some great pubs, bars and restaurants, arts and crafts and music events as well. And everywhere it leads, you end up at Mount Panorama, the world's great racetrack. And the Lick Molly, Bathurst, 12 hour, 4 hours and 53 minutes to go. Garth Tay and John Potter. Downstairs, Shay Adam, Chad Malon, Mark Beretta. And we're counting down towards the end of a race that has been compelling all the way through for its strategy, for its pace, and as always at Mount Panorama for its drama. Yeah, and unfortunately that drama has uh, befelled Scott Taylor and the team. We had Craig Lowndes up in the commentary box. The moment goes down here with Jeff Emery, uh, his teammate. You are halfway back from the commentary box, mate, and you got the bad news, hey? Yeah, I did. I actually said to the boys upstairs that I said we need some more safety cars to get back on the lead lap, but not by us creating the safety cars. So it's a shame. Like, Scotty's put a lot of hard work. Um, Ash and all the team here have, have really put, uh, you know, literally got the car out of mothballs and, and went right over it. We had a clean run at Phillip Island a couple of weeks ago. We're all really happy in the car. And, you know, we were, as I said, we we're raising good funds for the Prostate Cancer Foundation. So it's a shame that it is. Um, but look, that's motor racing. We know that. Look, the good thing is he's OK. Absolutely. You saw the replays. What was your take? Uh, I'm not sure whether it, it sort of the camera sort of panned away a little bit, but it looks like he's gone over Skyline. Whether he's got that grass verge between the run through and the curb, and it's just lost the rear. It looks like the, he's lost the rear and it's slapped into the wall. And we know up there there's just no room for error. Yeah, 
So, Jeff, uh, disappointment, but doesn't mean that we can stop shaking the tin uh, for the Prostate Cancer Foundation. We can still donate at any time. Yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously, it's for a good cause, so um, everyone keep donating. And uh, sorry, we can't continue the race for you guys. It's just a shame, but uh, Scotty and everyone's done a great job, and he's put a massive effort in this weekend for, for the foundation, so uh, keep, keep it coming. Even when the race doesn't work out, you still get three big days here at Bathurst. You get to share the car with a legend yeah. like Craig Lowndes. Not a bad weekend, hey? Yeah, it's been a fantastic weekend so far, so it's just a shame we're not going to finish it, but things happen. Unlucky boys, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Here's it. See ya. Thank you, Chad. Good to hear from Jeff Emery. He's a terrific guy, very experienced race car driver now. Won in GT cars, multiple one mate Commodore Cup champion. He's raced Super 2. He's contested the Bathurst 1000 in the past. So he's a very, very handy steerer. Had a remarkable season in the Pro Am class in Crera Cup last year with a championship that went down to the wire. One of his key rivals, Liam Talbot, in this field as well. and went to a count back and uh, he ultimately scraped his way through to claim that championship on the streets of Surfers Paradise last October. So unfortunate. Uh, it's rare that the commentator curse is struck from the same commentator that's actually driving a racing car, to be brutally honest. That's true. So that's a first for mine. Lowndes, there's nothing he can't do. Let's C be honest. Esp at Especially this place. here. Exactly. I think he's allowed. Yeah, he's allowed that. Absolutely right. Give you a quick rundown before we go back to Green. Jill Gunon with the lead now completely gone, of course. And that again shuffles up the strategy because they were in a great position. But now they're 13 laps into their stint in the Sun Energy 1 number 75. That's the sort of metallic copper coloured car sitting in behind the AMG safety car. Got three and a half seconds to priming in seconds. Let's have a look at the spares box highlights of the race so far. And after a, a hot paced but often dramatic opener, the race settled down into something of a strategic affair as teams roll the dice, working out fuel economy, tire life, pit stop strategy to get them into the final couple of hours when the intensity really ratchets up. And as often is the case here at Mount Panorama, today has been a story of restarts after safety cars as well. And they always breed intensity and really feisty racing when you want to make some moves for track positions. The easiest time it seems to do it is when the field goes back to green. That was uh, Aaron Cameron with a big crash down at the Spears Box Dipper. Gee, that bit of roads claimed some cars today. Unfortunately, everyone's walked away from it and that is the most recent accident, the reason we're uh, behind the Mercedes AMG safety car with Scott Taylor, the big crash on the run down the hill. Car 75 continues to lead the way. They've played the masterstroke from a strategy point of view. They've been through pit lane a lot, but it doesn't matter if you end up leading the car race at the end. Jill Gunon is doing just that. Leads the pro class. Boys L Pro Am now being led by Liam Talbot in the 65 car. There's still a lap back from the lead, but there'll be a wave around at the end of this safety car period. So they're actually gonna, for the third time today, find themselves back on the lead lap with Chaz Mostert still becoming that car at the end of the day. Yasser Shahin, not far behind, will get onto the lead lap in triple seven. So actually these safety cars now, Garth Tander, are keeping especially the 65 and the triple seven in this race from an outright contention despite the fact that they're Pro-Am cars. Well, the Pro-Am cars will be loving this safety car totally. because it gets that lap back towards the end of that one hour window that we've been talking about. They need to be driving, the AM drivers need to be driving the cars in the second half of the race. So for Yasser Shaheen and Jeffrey Ibrahim, who is in the 99 Boost Mobile AMG car, this closes the gap up for them beautifully. They get the wave around, they get back on the lead lap. Yes, they'll be on the tail of the lead lap, but it doesn't matter. You're on the lead lap again as far as scoring goes. And that just opens up your flexibility with strategy going in to this second half of the race or the remaining four hours, 45 minutes. And it's at this point of the race, really, and it's probably ultimately probably from this safety car point right here, right now, the engineers and strategists up and down pit lane will be starting to work backwards from the end of the race because at some point you need to pick a point and work backwards. So you've got the right driver with the right driving time available in the car at the end of the race. And then you've got to position yourself backwards to get to where you are right now 
and then strategize how you find yourself, how you lay your cards out to have it exactly as you want it to finish this race off in style. And ideally, you want to make your last pit stop as, as early as you can, yes. don't you? That, that's the problem that Krillzy was talking about earlier on, though. As, as we go deeper into the race, and if we stay green, then you, you're going to have to give yourself a window in case it just goes a little bit longer in laps than well, you thought Yeah, it was I mean, be. when you work backwards for that last pit stop, you have to assume that your last pit stop, you take it, it's green red all the way from that point. Yeah. Or you ha do have a bit of fuel saving margin in that time where you make that last pit stop. So for me, the car that's probably in the best position there is the Porsche. Yeah, it's shown its best ability to have great fuel economy and save the most amount of fuel throughout the course of the stint. The wave by cars make their way past the AMG safety car. I think the 65 Audi has to win the wave by tracking today. Been waved by so many times. It's made four laps back in total, I think, over the course of the day. Can I, can I just say there, it's been done very efficiently. And I like this idea of not waiting another lap for everybody to come back around. You're giving them a fighting chance there, but really they've still got to have pace ahead of the leaders if they're going to you know, make inroads into the race. In AFL Aussie rules parlance, it's a free kick, but it's not the goal square in front of the goals, yeah, is correct. it? Yeah. It's just off the side. So, yeah, I, I like that. The lights are out, so weaving ceases. I think the magic number we need to look for is 10 hours, 45 minutes. We need to get 75 minutes to the finish. If you can get there, get your pit stop done, you should be good to go to the end on green flag running from that point. Look at the queue lined up behind Gilles Gounon, and I'm actually just looking at the gap between Maro Engel and Shane Van Gisbergen. It's dangerously close to the five car length rule that we have here in Australia. You cannot leave a gap more than five car lengths to the car in front. So, Your car is in pit lane. Shane, green flag, green flag. always does. Running the rules to the limit. Jules Gunnar will bring us back to the control line and we'll go racing soon. That's the thunder on the restart of the Mercedes AMG leading the Porsche V8 versus flat six. The turbo beamers are in there at the back of this queue. Everyone else has been waved by. So they're at a different part of Mount Panorama now, heading up to the top of the hill. So this is a little pro shootout at the moment for this group of leading cars, seven of them, that are all in contention for this race. Up the inside, Triple Eight car on Philip Ellis behind the wheel of the 77. Shared behind the wheel of the more red Mercedes, if that makes sense, and he oh, might lose the position oh, here. He has, he got offline there, and the Helix car went straight through. Van der Linde needing no second invitation there. The door was opened, and he got his foot into it immediately. Beautiful, beautiful bit of opportunity. Now, there's a problem. There's got to be a problem for that Triple Eight car. Trying to assess whether there's a problem, or we have seen Shane struggle on the cold tyre at a safety car restart get up to speed but not to this not to this point oh, i wonder if getting off, off line, line like that yeah. you've just got a heap of pickup on the yeah. tire perhaps the track is now reasonably dirty after so much running this is the bmw 46 which has still got valentino rossi behind the wheel oh no correction mark uh, maxine martin now behind the wheel of that car from the last pit stop but the lender there has gone through on with another good restart. This time actually has put a little bit of a gap back into the Porsche number 912 in second. Two WRT BMWs are now miles ahead of Van Gisbergen. Yeah, that gap from Maxime Martin back to Shane Van Gisbergen continues to grow. Look at the gap now, we can't even see him in the back of shock. Van Gisbergen and he's continued on, just saw him go past pit entry, but this is strange. There's got to be more to it than just pick up and build up on the tyre on a low pressure tyre. He, he was six seconds slower than the leader and four seconds slower than the two BMWs that went past him on that lap. That wasn't, that, that wasn't all from that mistake, so clearly there was some continuing issue, whether it was just pickle. Mike, having said that, just pickle, um, and, and you know this, Garth, that you, you make you feel like you, 
you're running on 50 cent pieces rather than round tires. Yeah, it does. It, it sends a huge vibration through the car, and often you don't know. You don't know if it's a problem with the car or if it's pickup. And that's potentially why Shane's continued on this lap, because especially in the GT car, it does take a lap or two to clear. But the harder that you can lean on it, when we call pickup, it's the marbles and it's the junk on the side of the circuit. When you find yourself offline, the hot tire picks those marbles up, sticks to the tire, and it takes a lap or two to clean that off. But uh, it's looking to me to more. At first sector again for Van Gisberg is down. Maybe Chad has more. Yeah, the, uh, the word out of Triple Eight. I grabbed a quick word with, uh, quick word with Mark Dutton, who's the, uh, the usual team manager down here when we see them running on supercars trip. And uh, they thought it was just the cold tyre pace to begin with and maybe even to pick up from running on the marbles. So nothing to be too concerned about, but uh, Dutto confirming to me that he hasn't been happy with cold tyre pace really all weekend long. And also saw Paul Martin come down uh, from, uh, typically would say supercars, but I guess from the 12 hour, we'll call it this week. <laughs> and I imagine just having a chat about that restart procedure as well because it looked like Dado was doing the international signal for they pulled away from us. So uh, I'll try and investigate a bit more, but it doesn't seem to be a huge amount of concern down here at Triple Eight. OK, so the, the bit that Chad mentioned there, about, and we, I mentioned I mentioned the five car length rule, you also have to maintain 80 kilometres an hour. Yeah. So I'm wondering whether Shane was maintaining his 80 kilometres an hour and then crying that the others were jumping away. That's one thing. But just watching the splits on this next lap for Shane Van Gisbergen, he's 2.2 seconds down to the end of the second sector to Maxime Martin, the next car in front of him on circuit. So I don't think it's pick-up or build-up. I think there's more to it than this. Two, eight, eight, three Zero. seconds. Yeah. Three seconds slower than the BMW in front of him for Van Gisbergen. There's, there's half a second in lap speed between the top six and then car triple eight absolutely nowhere. So yeah. interestingly, though, he's now less bad, uh, less worse off than he was before. Now he's only three seconds being off the lap times of the, the BMWs. He was four seconds last time. So he is actually speeding up a bit. He did an 11 when they did a seven. Now he's done an eight when they did a five. But I mean, it's still not a good... I'm, hey, I'm trying to make lemons from lemonade for the guys here, <laughs> to be quite honest. Trying to give them something to look for. Good on by two seconds ahead of Priding at the front of the field. And this is why Jules Gunon is so, so good, because he's just been able to get his head down immediately and drive away from this field to the tune of 2.4 seconds. So instantly reasserting that track position, that buffer between him and everybody else. Remember, they were out to the tune of 18 seconds before this safety car, the most recent safety car was called. They were in a position twice today where they've been able to stop complete a service on the car and resume with a handy race lead what throughout the rest of the day has been a big margin so they're in such a good position but then you get someone of the quality that you're going on behind the wheel it just makes that job so much easier you can pull the most magic strategy in the world but unless you've got the driver to do the job and punch out lap times every lap which is exactly what he's doing and even this lap three tenths better than pointing in the in the Porsche Remember, the Porsche's taken a little bit longer each stint to get up to their ultimate performance. Gizzy's back on the pace, isn't he? Yeah, I was just going to say the exact same thing. The middle sector was probably the fastest out of the first seven cars. Yeah, absolutely. The six tenths down in the first sector. So the pace is coming back for Van Gisbergen. It's all happening at the front, though, as they recatch the wave by cars after the previous restart. That's a change of position, GT. So... Maro Engel has slipped past Thomas Pointing in the Porsche. The bright yellow versus bright green with yellow. And this is how it happened. So the entry to the chase. So it was even before they yeah. got to the lapped car. That was just on sheer pace and the toe down Conrad Strait. You mentioned down in the Pirelli pit bunker with Chad Nalon that the, the toe effect is more significant in these cars than some of the other things we usually see racing here. Textbook stuff, nice move. Myro said he's back one and two. Myro's at Myro Angle saying you're feeling it from a second and a half yeah. back. Yeah. And anything under a second, yes, you'll get the advantage of the draft, but also you get the disadvantage of aero push uh, and a little bit of air off the front of the car when you're trying to make it. All the supercars drivers hearing they're getting a toe from a second and a half going, oh, I wish. Um, and did you hear the moment that Pointing got passed? Instantly into fuel save. Massive yeah. lift and coast down into Murray's. Uh, as they've been doing all day, and yet still turning the lap times they need to do, but he's now falling into the clutches of Sheldon Van in the number 32 BMW M3. I think 
if you're a Porsche fan, though, you've got to be pretty happy with what's been going on with that Manti car car because they they are the single bullet in the gun uh, in terms of the front of the field. We lost the drove car, which could have backed them up a little bit earlier on, uh, and yet, the tactically, speed-wise, and certainly economy-wise, they do seem to, to have something for the front-engine cars around them. Yeah, they certainly do. They have certainly got some speed and some reliability. Their time in pit lane is impressive. They are the standouts in pit lane. So if it comes down to it, they've got what they need. Car speed, drivers, strategy, flexibility. Comes down to that 75-minute mark that Richard Crail was talking about previously. Porsche will be in the game for sure. The only question is, do they have overtaking ability? That will be the absolutely key if they need to use it. The National Motor Racing Museum, of course it's at Mount Panorama, it exists just behind Murray's Corner. It's a great place to spend a couple of hours looking at some of the history of Australian and indeed international motorsport. And five Bathurst winners in there, the Jag, which I know my colleague from the UK thoroughly enjoys. How lucky are you though? You got to ride down on the track to town on Thursday in the 68 Bathurst 500 winning replica Holden Monaro. It's, Monaro. Yeah. Oh. Monaro's and, and uh, Tirana's, that, for me, I'd be quite happy with that. If that's all I could drive for the rest of my days, I'd be very happy with that. That's the car uh, seal almost crashed here a couple of years ago, quite famously on national television during a demonstration session. We don't let him forget that either, just quietly. Nor should we, no, no. I don't think. It's a great place uh, that you must make it part of your trip to Bathurst. There's a, an incredible collection, ever-changing as well. As we follow this battle, Thomas pointing under some pressure from Shelton Vanderlyn behind them, Philip Ellis behind the wheel of the Craft Bamboo Racing 77 car. And then we go back to Maxine Martin in 46, the BMW and Shane Van Gisbergen, who continues to be in a little, odd little phase of the race in that car. He's 14 seconds now behind Jill Grenon, race leader, and eight seconds behind the 46 BMW. His next time. Maro Engel has gone all Maro Engel on us right now. <laughs> now that he's managed to get past the Porsche, Thomas Proning, he set a personal best at the end of the second sector, a full second faster than Jill Gunon on this lap to the end of the first sector. So as they cross the line, Gunon delivers a 4-1 versus a 3-1 for Maro Engel. So we saw yesterday and early today just how fast Maro is in this car. And it's not a matter if it's 5 a.m. or 10 past one in the afternoon. The other bottle, very quick. The other battle in the top seven is Phil Ellis. Philip Ellis right in behind Maxime Martin. That's the, uh, the number 77 Pro car in sixth at the moment, uh, behind the number 46 of Max Martin. And they're separated by nothing at all. And von der Linde hoving into view in the mirrors of Thomas Pliny into the Andy Cutley. Van Gisbergen 5 1 last time round, so he's quicker than the BMWs in front. Still not showing the threes that these leaders are doing at the moment. The, the other thing to take into account is that overnight there was a, a change to the tyre pressure regulations and the minimum tyre pressure that had to be utilised. So it, it was it used to be 1.4 bar, which is about 20.5 psi cold as they drive out of pit lane. That was the minimum pressure overnight, the balance of performance. And this came from SRO, who managed the balance of performance for GT3 racing globally, changed it to... Race control to all teams, a 15 second time penalty for car 777, safety car restart breach to be served at its next pit stop. Yes, yes she can. The Sport Park Audi R8, they're running nine. A minute 35 off the race lead. 32 seconds to transit, that's very nearly going to drop them back off the lead lap. Overtaking, and that's the four green flag during the wave by. That's the yes she means. So he was one of the wave by cars, and you can't actually overtake until the circuit itself goes green, even though you feel like you're racing because oh, you've been released. Oh, because the control yeah. line, yes, hasn't it? that's right. So you feel like you're racing again, but the reality is the leaders have to take the green flag, and they need to be racing, so... One of those little quirks in that rule that you need to be all over. One of those one percenters 
that we were talking about. You need to make sure you have clear understanding of all the rule sets. And that one's put Yasser out in the Audi team. Just keeping an eye on car 101, which is uh, one of the Volante Rosso Mercedes-Benz down here at the moment. They're just doing a driver change. Uh, they had to put out the pit board for the last two to three laps to get Kevin C into pit lane. Uh, they are suffering radio issues at the moment. And uh, it looked like he wasn't getting the message, but thankfully back in there and talking to the team. It's been a bit of a long day without that radio. A couple laps off the uh, lead at the moment. They're now doing the tyres and uh, plugging away to see if they might be able to get a couple more safety cars, get back on the lead lap for Josh Hunt at the end. Kevin C and Jonathan Hoy are competing in the Intercontinental GT Challenge powered by Pirelli all season long. That's why I dare here. They've linked up with Tech Harold Racing to contest that. Drag Josh Hunt out of retirement. Basically, from a team ownership role to jump in that car. This is a busy little moment for the race lead. And it finds Mara Engel now attached to the rear wing of Gilles Gunon in the similar AMG GT3. Uh, that I'll finish the point with the tyre pressure stuff at 1.8 bar now after eight laps, though. So it's a hot tyre pressure. We have talked already about the tyre pressure readings on the dash. Temperature, isn't it? Pressure. The dash yeah. pressure. Pressure so, and temperature. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they do measure that on the fly. So after eight laps, 1.85, which is about 26 and a half PSI. So the, it, there is a change to that. The point I'm trying to make poorly is that uh, I wonder if some teams have adapted to that change overnight better than others in getting those tyres pressured correctly to reach that minimum after eight laps. And I think the thing that you said earlier is, is important. This is not something that's just been put in place here, uh, this is globally by SRO. Remember, this is a, a new construction and compound of tyre from Pirelli. Data being collected all the time. Let's head down to the pit lane in the sunshine. Shea Adam. There aren't very many silver rated drivers brave enough to go up against the factory platinums in the heat of day at Mount Panorama, but that was phenomenal out there, Valentino Rossi. Were you enjoying it more now that we're in racing conditions? Yes, it's, uh, I enjoy a lot. It's, uh, it's great. And, um, you know, in the race, uh, it's, uh, it's different, always different. Also because, uh, first of all, you need to do a lot of laps. And um, we, always, we always try to, to, to go at the limit, but don't exaggerate and stay very concentrated. Because uh, this track, if you make a mistake, the, is, is a big problem. But I enjoy a lot. The, the, the feeling with the car is good. Uh, we make some good battles, and um, uh, my pace was was not so bad. Uh, we are we are on the top group, and uh, everything can happen because uh, it's still uh, four hour and a half to to the end. Looks like that we suffer a little bit with the hot, and some other cars are a little bit faster. But uh, with uh, all the um, safety car, uh, after you come back in the group, uh, so ev everything everything can happen. Now Maxime and Augusto will uh, will drive to the end, and uh, they have always uh, they are always very strong. So we try to make the best. But you're not going anywhere. You're still enjoying this. You're going to hang around and help the team out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I, I go to eat something because uh, we wake up this morning at four o'clock. So it's like uh, it's already 20 hours that we are around. <laughs> and, and but after I I stay here to to give my support. Yes. Very well deserved. Thank you. Gracias. Ciao. Ciao. Three people up here, and I'm sure millions watching around the world that uh, are just geeking out at the moment that that's even a thing that's happening. I certainly am. How cool. Fantastic. Valentino Rossi, well driven. And they're, they're definitely in the mix, the BMWs. We heard from Dries Van Tor that they've struggled as the temperatures come up over the day. And, that's certainly been represented in their lap times in the middle stanza of the race. Let's see what happens in the final four hours, 28 minutes and 18 seconds of the 23. Liquid Molly, Bathurst 12 hour. Three quarters of a second between first and second. Two AMG GT3s heading up Mountain Straight with just on four and a half hours to go in the 2023. Liquid Molly, Bathurst, 12 hours. Then about two and a half seconds back to Thomas Prining in the remaining Porsche GT3 arc. And he's got uh, about four seconds on Shell van der Linde in the 32 WRT BMW. That's the bright yellow, red and black Shell Helix car. And the top five is made up by the number 46, the second of the WRTs. That's the white 
with the BMW M stripes on it. The car that has been driven already this weekend so a couple much. of times, including a double stint by the doctor, Vale, Valentino Rossi, who has been so generous with his time. I mean, not enough, Garth, that he's having to get used to driving a GT3 car around the Bathurst, which he's never done before. But, you know, you would think that would take all his focus, but he has made time for absolutely everybody, whether it's been on the broadcast team or the fans there signing helmets, everything, all kinds of things. Oh, incredibly generous with his time. Uh, the queues to, to receive his autograph over the course of the weekend have been massive. And as to your point, John, always has time for us in the broadcast. You would have thought, to get to this stage of the weekend, he's had enough of talking to us and telling us about how much he's enjoying his time here at Mount Panorama. But you could tell from that last interview with Shay just how genuine his enthusiasm is for car racing, for being here, being part of the BMW project. And um, he'll be part of that project going forward in a bigger and bigger way. And it's going to be great to follow his journey and to see... Uh, I hope he comes back here next year, having 12 months under his belt, more understanding of the circuit, understanding the M4 BMW, come back next year and have a real crack at it. I'm, I'm sort of thinking slightly further forward, as you would expect me to be doing in terms of my association with the Le Mans 24 hours. Valentino Rossi, even in a G... These GT3 cars are eligible yeah. for Le Mans um, next year. And you think to yourself, Valet, even if he's in a GT3 car, the C of Orange, never mind getting him into a prototype at the front of the field. Look, look at that. I've already just said it. And I, I, the hairs are standing up. I've got everything. Uh, absolutely outstanding. Four and a half hours still to go here at the bank. Just keeping an eye on the, uh, the lap times that last time through, guys, and just waiting to see if Shane's car was going to start coming to him. He was the fastest driver on the lead lap, on that last lap, and into the 204s. So it certainly would suggest that maybe it's something to do with cold tyres. And it does make me think later on during the race, would they even be bothered going for a fresh set of tyres at the end? Maybe the best strategy for them could be to double stint all the way to the finish their tyres, because uh, clearly that car is not liking cold tyres this week. The, the issue with that is, do they have the grip when everybody else does get them up? And I don't think it helped. I, it clearly, it wasn't a help that he went so far offline at Griffin's Bend. That pickup was slowing him down as well, and it just exacerbated that cold tyre heat problem. Gap to lead for Van Gisbergen now is 20.2 seconds, so it continues to grow, that gap. So after the previous safety car restart, it was a big struggle for that Triple Eight Super Chief Auto Mercedes. Have been keeping, as Chad said, 0-2 have been keeping an eye on the second time. It's been quite fluctuating. There's no consistency coming from that car right now. So for whatever reason, we took some shots of the car externally. It looked OK, car balance-wise, but there's just not the speed in it that we would expect come from Shane Van Gisbergen and a Mercedes AMG. When you compare him to the speed of Gunon and Ed, Maro Engel at the moment, they're clearly faster. Earlier in the day, Shane was a match for them. So there's something, something's going on with that car. More than a match, actually. Because yeah. he, even though he had the problems, he was still, after two or three laps, able to stabilise that and then drive away. So, yeah. Having said that, with, with the fullest of perspective. The double this morning from Maxi Goats was an awesome drive, but Brock Feeney's been the star in that car yeah. all weekend yeah. long. He's been the most comfortable. They let him qualify the car in the shootout. He almost got pole. Second quickest qualifying lap in the history of Mount Panorama, but, and then expressed his disappointment at missing out on pole position. So, yeah, he, he's been the, the standout for me. In car triple eight. GT3 racing is great, isn't it? So you've got the two Mercs, seven and a half hours into a race, split by nine tenths of a second, with a Porsche and the BMW still very much in contention, and just 13 seconds covering the six cars at the lead of this race, with Van Gisberg 21 off the lead, and the car at the very tail end of the lead lap is Liam Talbot in eighth position. So still eight cars on the lead lap of the race coming into the final third of this year's race. And there is the 65. Out of position is Dean Fiore, a West Australian in the number nine Hallmark Proctor Group Audi. He's sharing the former 
Bathurst 1000 winner Lee Holdsworth. He's hung up the full-time helmet now from his supercars career. He's been in the co-driver role, of course, but focusing on some other life areas now is Lee. And then just behind them is Trent Harrison behind the wheel. So car number 50, 15th place outright, 191 laps completed. So there's seven laps behind the leader. They didn't even know they were going to drive that car when they rolled in for opening practice on Friday morning. It was a KTM when they got here. Correct. It's and an it, Audi now. It grew five <laughs> cylinders in a V. <laughs> yeah, doubled its cylinder <laughs> count. Yeah. It probably doubled, us. doubled the downforce as yeah. well. And they've done a great job circulating around. They're in front of uh, the 101 Harold Racing entry, the 47 Superbarn Supermarkets car, which we have had as a a decent factor for a class win this weekend given the driving talent and experience there. So given that only just got hold of this car, it's been a, a terrific drive. Glenn Wood has been driving and so too David Crampton who put this all together. He said to me on Friday, he said, mate, I've spent so much, we've invested so much, both time and money, to get to this point. We may as well just go and get another car because we're already here. Everything's been invested, but the, the big outlays happened now, so... Yeah. Let's just do the race. Let's get it done. And I, that's an awesome approach. I love it. And they're doing a really good job. And, and for Trent, getting up to speed in this car, uh, following some of these guys around would be very, very handy. The best luck for that car is a mid So it's had some pace. Glenn Wood qualified it in the yep. threes. Yes. So Glenn has some GT3 experience, but not a lot. Definitely not in an Audi. So... Jump into a car that you haven't driven before and do a three within a day around Mount Panorama. Seriously impressive stuff. Great to see that car still going. You hear about these stories at Bathurst all the time, about these deals that come together in various random ways. And uh, for the car to still be circulating, for David Crampton to be getting miles here at the mountain. We had that small moment at the exit of Turn 1 earlier this morning, but uh, the car continues on. And we touched on it in our coverage of qualifying yesterday, but... In last year's 12-hour Theo Kanduras had a big crash on Friday and wrote his car off. So Melbourne Performance Centre, the team behind Audi in Australia, shipped the car up from Melbourne, rebuilt it at the circuit overnight, upgraded it to the new specification, entered it in the race the next day as a replacement car, and they made it to the finish. That's the same car. So two oh, years in a row... That's extraordinary. It's been the super sub. It's come off the, the bench. The Nico Hockenberg of, uh, of Audi R8s at Mount Panorama. So the noise you hear behind us is the Makita and the Volante Rossi Motorsport number 24 Pro Am BMG GT3 coming up to start lap on the front straight now, heading into the first corner. Close your eyes if you're not here and visualize a lap of Mount Panorama. We're on Mountain Straight. Turn it up.
Well, there you go. That is a lap about Panorama. And that was about a 2098 as the car crossed the line for Jordan Love. Just a bit behind the wheel of that car. And heading up Mountain Street again. Wonderful, wonderful noises coming from that Mercedes. Pretty clean lap as well, to be absolutely honest. Half a second between the leaders. We have got a bit of a dogfight between the two AMG GT3s. Gunon versus Engel, half a second apart at the front of the field. It's been good to have Jordan Love here. Uh, he's been racing AMGs in Europe, specialising around the Nürburgring uh, in recent times. He's actually picked up some management support from uh, Mark Wendell's company, represented by them over in Europe at the moment, former F1 and IndyCar racer. Let's have a look at Triple Nine. So this is the run up the shelf, the narrow, blind part of the road, and this is a big delay from Maro Engel. Oh, behind the 101 Harold's racing car of Ross Palakis, blue flags flying. Pretty tough place to come across a slower car, though. There aren't many options to squeeze your way through. And it actually hasn't damaged the margin too much. It's back down to 0.5. There's our two leaders duke it out. Thomas Pronning in third position in the Porsche. That margin hasn't changed. No. The Porsche just floating off the back of the two Mercs, watching them do their thing without ever getting particularly close to trouble them. But he has pulled about five seconds away from von der Linde, who was right up his tailpipes for a few laps, sitting there looking like he was going to try and have a go. Learned all the part numbers on the back of that wing from the 912. He recited those in his sleep tonight. Sheldon's dropped back a little bit as well. The battle is still going on between Max Martin and Philip Ellis for fifth and sixth. They're half a second apart as well but again seems to me that Phil's not been in a position when we've seen him coming past the booth here to actually make a concerted effort to dive down the inside into turn one Hell Co Hell's Corner so are we in this fuel save again and Liam Tolbert still hanging on to the end of the lead lap and leading the Pro-Am Category. There's 21 seconds now from first Jules Gunon in the Sun Energy One car back to seven. Shane Van Gisbergen in the bright red number triple eight. They're at 22 now, so still not quite the pace. It's a tenth there, a tenth there, two tenths here, two tenths there. But generally speaking, Gartander, the progression for Shane Gisbergen is dropping away from the cars ahead, and particularly the leader, rather than either hanging tight or being able to close that lap down. Yeah, and it's still been very inconsistent, going on into the lane. So he's the first of our leaders. So what's that, 29 laps he comes to the lane with Maro Engel. So this is where these two cars are still off sequence from a pit stop cycle much earlier in the day. Yeah, th these were the only ones that didn't stop in that last safety car because it was just way too early for them. They were only eight laps into their stint, whereas everyone else was close enough to go, oh, we may as well just get in and take service, Chad. Yeah, I talked to the team, that last safety car was definitely not what they wanted. And as it stands right now, they need one more safety car to make this alternate strategy work for them. They've boxed themselves with the Kenny Habul uh, strategy, but uh, at the moment, they're probably one safety car shy. Yeah, thanks, Chad. Still a lot of this race to play out. In the meantime, one of the great supporters of Australian motorsport have got an offer from you. Here's something from our mates at Shannon's. Are you a motoring enthusiast? Shannon's are giving you the chance to win a trip for two to London for the 2023 Goodwood Revival. The 11-day trip includes airfares, luxury accommodation, car hire, Goodwood Revival hospitality tickets, and $10,000 spending money for eligible Shannon's Club members. Plus, win the all-new Indian Motorcycle Scout Bobber. Get 10 entries when you take out new Shannon's insurance on your special car, spouse's car, daily drive or bike. And five entries for new Shannon's home insurance. Call Shannon's on 13 46 46 or go online today.
So a pit stop for the leading car, Jugunon in. And car 75, after spending a minute and 17 seconds in the lane, resumes. So they lose their lead, but remember they're out of sequence. And now Mara Engel released out in front too, punching out uh, some green and personal best sector times with his lead. 4.1 seconds over the Porsche. Sheldon van der Linde in third place in the BMW. Those cars somewhere in the vicinity of 10 laps away from their next scheduled round of pit stops. So this race playing out nicely with four hours and 11 minutes to go. Before we bring you even further up to speed, let's head down to the lane and say hello once again to Mark Beretta. Oh, uh, guys, like this event couldn't happen without great sponsors. And Liquid Molly have been a fantastic sponsor back in this event for 10 years now. And Peter Bowman, the Global Marketing Director for Liquid Molly, joins me now. Peter, congratulations. A great event. What do you love about it from Liquid Molly's point of view? Well, as you can imagine, every morning when I walk into this place, it gives me goosebumps to see my <laughs> Liquid Molly brand all over the place. No, that's, an, that's such an iconic place here, iconic racetrack with a lot of legacy and heritage. So I, we, I really, I love to come here, see the crowd. We have such a big crowd this weekend. Unbelievable. I like, I really like to come this event, even if it's a very long way from Germany. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, you're, you're a big global brand. What, is, what does this event mean to you? How, how special is it? I guess we are, we are lucky because we are now here for 10 years, as, as you said, Mark, um, but we are a global company. We are present in 140 countries and we were very lucky because in these 10 years, this event has become more and more international, attracts international teams, attracts international media, and that was really, really helpful for our, for our international uh, brand awareness and, and reputation. Uh, you get to see a lot of these magnificent events, but I, I do get the feeling that Bathurst and Mount Panorama has a bit of a soft spot for you. Absolutely. I have seen so many racetracks all over the world and races in my whole life. This place is really special in any case. It's the, the layout of the racetrack is so special. I, I, I know a lot of the drivers, they love to come here. And I, they, the drivers that haven't been here, they have it on their bucket list to race here one day. Because this is, we, we, in Germany we say that's, that's a little Nordschleife, the little Nürburgring. Uh, and so everybody loves it. The little Nürburgring with kangaroos is the difference. <laughs> we don't have kangaroos, so not, not too much. You know, on the Nürburgring. And listen, we appreciate your support. It's awesome that you help us make this event happen. And it's been a great 10 years. So thanks, Peter, to you and the team. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks. I'm down here with one of the front-running Pro-Am teams. Yasser Shahin is representing the Ben. The Audis in general, it's been a tough old weekend for them. But still, you guys keep plugging. Yeah. Look, it's a 12-hour race, but it's been very, very hard going for us. We've, we've really struggled with this new tyre. Very, very high tyre pressures. And none of us have driven this compound at that pressure. So a challenge, but we've got four hours to go. Staying out of the headmaster's room is always important as well. You guys got slapped over the rest with a 15-second penalty for the restart. Can you talk us through it? Yeah, look, uh, the, we got the lucky dog, and the guy in front was holding me up, and so I got some encouragement to push on, and in that, in that uh, let's say, uh, spirit and heat, we forgot we weren't allowed to pass before the control line, so we'll get 15 seconds. But look, if that's the worst we do today, it's probably a good day compared to the others. 15 seconds out of 12 hours, not so bad. Not so bad. Good luck, mate. Christ. Cheers, bud. Thanks. So that's the word from the 777. So they're still looking to get their lap back, but there's still plenty of time for that to happen. One of the cars we've been following all day very, very closely, and we've been saying nice things as well, I'd like to add. Not just because one of the superstars from the Porsche Manti EMA Racing lineup has joined us up here in the commentary box. Matt Campbell's with us. Uh, good afternoon, Matt. Welcome to you. How's your day? Yeah, look, it's not going too bad. I mean, uh, we're running up front. We're uh, sticking to our strategy and, uh, yeah, obviously still a fair few hours to go in the race. So uh, just got to keep it clean and, and see where we end up with uh, two hours to go. How's the pace? Yeah, look, pace is hot. I mean, pace is really strong for sure. Uh, no one's holding back. Um, we're sticking to our strategy. We're not necessarily the fastest on track at the moment. But if we can uh, do a good job in the pits and, and on strategy, uh, hopefully we can make a difference there. Well, on that, your pit stops have been amazing. And at one point, I think we tracked it during a round of stops that you gained eight seconds over the BMWs, for example. So I know you're not going to tell us why, but it's a good advantage to have up your sleeve. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, we're, we're hoping to stick to that, you know, going into the uh, later part of the race as well. So, uh, yeah, we've got to try and do everything we can in strategy to be able to, uh, you know, try and catch up in other ways because for sure the Mercs today are really, really fast. And, uh, yeah, let's see what we can do in next couple hours. Strengths and weaknesses quickly for me. So we've seen the BMWs at this stanza of the race has just dropped off of the, as it's got a bit hotter. Where are you guys at? Yeah, we've, we've definitely dropped off a little bit, not too much. Uh, we've just lost a little bit of sort of straight line speed. 
but for sure compared to the uh, Mercs at the moment, we're really struggling across the top of the mountain, uh, especially with Aero Wash. But uh, I feel like that's been a trend all day, so not really a big shift, let's say. Uh, but we've just lost a little bit overall, so not a massive uh, change in car balance or anything. However, you do seem to be able to save fuel. That, that is a, a, a massive advantage that you guys have had. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, our pace saving fuel is very strong. Uh, we're not necessarily losing any lap time or anything like that. And, and actually, in some places of the circuit, we're actually uh, helping our car balance by saving fuel. Yeah. Um, so uh, it, it's not a bad thing, but uh, we're doing everything we can uh, to be able to get an advantage in pits. Just explain that. How, for the people that might not be familiar with it, how are you affecting your car balance by saving fuel? And that's the thing. Hang on a minute. You're going slower, but the car's better. Yeah, exactly. I mean, going into some of the big braking uh, areas, for example, you know, you've got much more of a neutral car balance. The car is a lot flatter, uh, and you're not pitching the car quite as fast, so uh, you're taking a little bit of load off the front axle on the initial brake balance, uh, and uh, yeah, just makes it a little bit easier on the entry phase of the corner. Uh, congratulations on the debut of the 963. Well, oh, you've got to disappear in a second. Um, how's it been like? What's it been like coming back to the 991.2 GT3? Oh, like putting on an old pair of shoes? Yeah, 100 percent I mean, uh, I've driven big this car. Big smile, by the way. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? Big yeah. smile. I hope you heard yeah. that in Matt Campbell's voice. Yeah, I mean, I, I have so much experience with this car now, uh, four years, and uh, you know, a lot of success with it as well. So, uh, you know, coming back to the mountain, we've only this is only our second time, believe it or not, with this car here. Obviously, a couple of ways, years away with the whole COVID situation, and now we're back. And uh, yeah, feels natural, feels at home, and uh, you know, always uh, one of my favourite weekends of the entire year. Last one because uh, your, your PR man Dave's telling me you've got to get back down to the box, but uh, Matt, has got some driving to do, and then I'm assuming that you're in the car for the end. Yeah, that's the plan at the moment. I mean, uh, you never know what's going to happen with safety cars and and everything like that. But uh, at the moment, that's the plan for me to be in at the end. Thoroughly enjoying seeing what you're doing in the world today, Matt. Nice to see you. Thank you very much. There's Matt Campbell, Mantai Airmo Motorsport. Great to have him back at the Liquid Molly Bathurst 12 Hour to look forward to their victory. And now he's all a big grown-up factory driver driving for Roger Penske as well. Very cool. They're in a pretty good position at the moment. They're second, just seven seconds behind Maro Engel, who leads the race. Four hours and five minutes to go. You've, uh, you've seen the development of that young man, Grilsey, um, from very early days. Um, I, I met him several years ago, but you've known him longer than me and seen him race more than me. Absolutely delighted that he has got the call, and it's a very Porsche thing to do, to take up-and-coming drivers, put them through the junior programme, and then promote from within. They do the same with their management structure as well, to be quite honest, in the car company as well as in motorsport. He's got a chance of doing something absolutely extraordinary when you see what he's got in his near future. Well, what I can tell you, John, is that he said more words in those five minutes we had him here than he did in his first full season of Porsche racing in Australia. He's come a very, very, <laughs> very long way, has Matt. He was the quietest, most reserved, shy kid when he popped into the landscape. He raced Formula Ford, actually, first. But he did a season of Formula Ford before he moved into Porsche Sprint Challenger. Andy McElroy, uh spotted him in talent, gave him a testament while oh, this kid can drive, and they put a program together and he, he smoked half the field in a Class B car in what was GT3 Cup Challenge and then jumped into an outright car in the final round and won by about 15 seconds. So, and since then, you know, the story's been well documented. Career Cup Australia champion, Super Cup, and onwards, and now he's a, a factory driver. So in the Porsche pyramid, they call it, they're stepping stones up through the ladder. He's done the whole thing yeah. and followed the script almost to a T, but yeah, he's still the same, very humble, very friendly, smiling, affable young bloke. Speaks a bit more now, and he's got some swagger, which is great. You've got to have it as a, uh, as a professional race car driver. Considering what he's done and what he's won, why not? Uh, the Mangalwear Racing's coming uh, to my neck of the woods and coming yep. to play in the, uh, the IMSA Porsche Carrera Cup North America. Yeah, uh, they're taking young Thomas Sargent, who won the Bath of Six Hour here last year, actually, and, and Sprint Challenge Australia last season. So he'll run one of a multiple car program. Yeah, Andy, ambitious as always. A uh, couple of cars. We're based out of Mooresville, North Carolina. That's not a car company. Yeah, it's, it's, apparently that's where you've got to be. And yeah, it's a really exciting program. So Macaulay's going to have four cars in Sprint Challenge, four in Carrera Cup Australia, and two or three in North America. I think we're going to have more than 40 cars again in Carrera Cup North America. We'll kick off at Sebring uh, in uh, 
well, what is it? Uh, about six weeks' time, isn't it, really, for that, when we get back together? But, uh, the next time we'll see Matty Campbell behind the wheel of a Porsche, but it will be the 963 rather than the 911. The, the thing about Matt, just, just to finish on that point for mine, the impressive thing is how adaptable he's become and how quickly he gets up to speed. And, you know, the moment he jumped into a supercar, he was quick despite that Porsche background. And then he's gone straight onto the money in the 963 program and very, very quick there. So professional drivers should be adaptable and they should be able to do that. That's why they're paid the, the big bucks to do the job. But, yeah, it, it's been super impressive and really cool to see him driving in that factory program. And to get the nice road cars as well because he's going around the moment in a Cayenne GT Turbo at the moment in Arctic Grey with the metallic copper wheels. Not envious, not at all. Four minutes, four hours rather, still to go. Well, before first light, as tradition dictates, we kick things off for the 2023 Liquid Molly Bathurst 12 hours. It started off relatively sensibly, and then we had the first big casualty, the only Audi Pro car in the wall, and we've not seen it again. Safety car out when the Porsche from Grove Racing and EBM went around at the top of the mountain. And then there was a weird section for the Lamborghini, the wall racing Lamborghini, where they had a couple of incidents. Another safety car, Superbahn, Supermarkets, Audi into the wall with the AMG number 44. It's all been happening at the top of the mountain, hasn't it? Because just after we've been talking to Craig Lowndes, his car was into the wall, Scotty Taylor Motorsport. At the front of the field, it's been a balance between speed and tactics at the 75 Sun Energy One Racing AMG has come out on top for such a long time, but they're down in sixth at the moment, as we've got uh, just over uh, 11 seconds between the top of the field. Here's the Bozell leaderboards for the classes. Maro Engel leading at the top. We'll give you the, all the gaps in just a moment. Fred Vavish is behind the wheel of the 55, which uh, leads the Pro-Am. The silver team, Andrew Fawcett down behind the wheel uh, there. And it's still the 111. That's the Mazda, the Mark Cars machine that leads the invitational class. There's the gaps, 11 and a half seconds between the Mantai in second and the Mercedes AMG team Grupa M that leads. They're battling it out. The team WRT BMW is just a little bit further back and not enjoying the heat of the day. Shane van Gisbergen that hasn't had such a great run in this uh, particular stanza of the race, but he's back up on the cycle, pit stop cycle to fifth position. Uh, the people further down the field and outside the top 20 have all had problems. Some of them you saw there in the spares box highlights that we played through for you. 209 laps completed, as we've completed uh, two thirds of the race. Uh, and that means that we have done just a little more than eight hours. And we need it to be about 2.15 to get onto that magical 2,000 kilometers. If we could do that to up before the end of the race. So we're holding now just six laps away at the moment, see how, see how we can get that back. If we get some good green flag running, Garth Thunder, then that is possible because we can't do more than the 27 laps per hour that you need to do that. It's just a question of whether we get the opportunity. We need the green flag running to do that, to fulfill Richard Crail's dream of a 2,000 kilometers completed in 12 hours of racing at Mount Panorama. Thomas Printing on screen, the Mante Racing, Porsche. Great to hear from Matt Campbell previously. I really feel like that car is in the game. Yeah. This car, maybe not in the game for this year's event, but in its day, it would have been a real hot rod. Shay. Could you guys imagine finding out that you were going to be in this game, the Bathurst 12 Hours, about a week before it actually took place? Phil Ellis, you were not planning on coming down to Australia, and it all just kind of unfolded. Now you've just completed your second double stint during the race. How's it been going? I mean, so far it's been uh, it's been mega, to be honest. Uh, I really love the track. It's been, been awesome these couple of days. Uh, a very steep learning curve, of course, uh, as everybody kind of warned me before I came over. But uh, yeah, just enjoying it. 
how did you get to learn the track? Was it the track walk or simulator? You didn't have prep time. No, because, so I got the call up in Daytona while I was there for the race, uh, so we kind of skipped sim time. And uh, other than that, we, we looked at some onboards from last year, uh, looked at the races from last year's, and other than that, it's really learning by doing. The track walk just shows you how steep the track is, but it won't give you a feel uh, of the car that, that will race in the end. Uh, so it's been very, uh, very tough, especially with the red flags in practice as well. Uh, so it's a very limited amount of track time, uh, especially with three drivers having to learn the track. Uh, Nikki also being kind of new to the AMG, so uh, two of us in the same boat, and uh, then Danny has our pulling horse. So uh, yeah, just a very steep learning curve, but uh, it's amazing. It's been good fun for the Craft Bamboo team. Thank you so much, Phil. Good luck. Thank you, Phil. And guys, just to give you a little bit of a wet appetite for the remainder of who is about to get in the Mercedes, well, we've got one Maxi Goats helmeted oh. and ready for the Triple Nine, so that's coming up here shortly. Best wishes from everybody in the paddock to Lucas uh, Luki, as he is well known by everybody. A nasty incident uh, at Daytona. And uh, we wish him well and hope he's back in a car uh, as soon as possible. Just a few moments ago, position nine, change. Chris Meese taking over at that as he dived down the inside of the end of the chase. The move on Fraser Ross, the 65 Audi. So standard. Audi's continue to yeah. battle. <laughs> standard that is. <laughs> Into the scene battling between the four rings there. Middle of plenty of those battles throughout the course of the race in the past for the Audis. But this car needs a wave around to get itself back in the game. Yeah. So they've fulfilled their driver time now with their AM driver, Yasser Shaheen, but they found themselves a lap down. And they need that wave around. There's three cars that are nearly two laps down for Veach, Mies and Ross. Uh, in the 8th, 9th and 10th positions, the leaders in the pro arms, in fact, and they are just ahead of the leaders at the moment. They are one and a bit laps down. They would get that back with one safety car. They don't really want to go two laps down. We are, however, looking at this at an outright level in that we want these cars to be in contention for the race. But we do need to remember that there's a class trophy Absolutely. on the line. Absolutely. And for the AM drivers in these cars, that's what they want. They want the Pro-AM class trophy. And right now, it's 55. That's the Fuchs Racing Schumacher Motorsport Premier High Racing entry. And Fred Babiche, uh, and that car has been in the wars today with some penalties. He's dragged that car back up the order. They're eighth outright, but they're leading the Boys L Watchers Pro-AM class. So still lift a big trophy and stand on the number one spot on the top of uh, the famous Mount Panorama podium, not too far away to our right. And, of course, the watch which features some of Mount Panorama in it uh, that you could win. Imagine if Brad Schumacher wins that. He literally lives here. He probably has already got probably right, just come down and collect his own stones. His walk of a night. Yeah. Mount Panorama sign. Have you seen his back garden? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very wild, wild for some reason. Quite yeah. rad, written out in white. Very nice time. driveway. <laughs> so there, there is that class battle. We, we would absolutely love for them to be in the outright mix as well because they become outright cars when the AM driver component, the semi-professional driver, has ticked all their boxes from a drive time point of view. And we're talking about that with Fred Vervish and Christopher Meese. Absolutely can win this race on raw speed. Yeah, 100%, no doubt whatsoever. So that's just another one of the storylines. The race within a race in endurance racing at Mount Panorama. I don't think we're too far away from a stop for this car because Mauro Engel is going quickly. Our race leader for Group M and Mercedes AMG is on a flyer with three hours and 53 minutes to go. crosses the line, 3-0, so the pace is starting to build, 29 laps into this stint, the window approaching, almost open, you'd think, to get into pit lane. Give you a lap time check of the leaders, shall we, as they come through. So, Engel across the line, gap back to Thomas Proiding, 2.045 for the Porsche, 16 seconds, and then we find Sheldon Vanderlinder at a 4-2, in car number 32, so he's 20 seconds behind the leader, Four behind the Porsche. Maxi Martin across the line in the number 46 BMW. So they're 34th of WIT cars. 204.9 for him. The story I'm getting out of all of this is that 
at the moment. None of them have got the pace of our race leader. Yeah. SVG at a 4 8, so he's in exactly the same boat in car 888. And then it's quite a big gap back to Shilgunon. But remember, they're out of sequence. They're not on the same pit stop strategy as the five cars leading this race. Gunon is in the lane just nine laps ago. And the same story can be said for Nicky Katzberg behind the wheel of the 77 Craft Bamboo car in seventh. They're only seven laps into this stint. So they're out of sequence relative to the five cars that lead the way at the top of the leaderboard there. And amazingly, if you look at the total on the left-hand side of the screen, all of the pro uh, cars, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and all of the Brazil Pro Ham cars neatly lined up. It's nice. And then four silver cars. And my OCD is very happy with that. It's like we've sorted the field by colour it rather is. than by position. It's, yeah. it's, it's a fluke that that should happen, but it, it's happened. And just to touch on one more point, if I may, uh, back at the shot there, so Trent Harrison still behind the wheel of that number 50 Audi that was a KTM at the start of the weekend, second in the silver class. <laughs> I thought they might go home with the Invitational Trophy, but it could be a Silver Class Trophy. Okay. Charles van der Linde, currently third in the BMW WRT run car. They have struggled. But the sun has come yeah. out and the temperature has come up. They have struggled for the performance. Which is interesting because they did really well in Dubai. And it was... Yeah. It was, in fairness, it wasn't super hot there, but even the overnight temperature, um, they don't do refueling in the pit lane in that series. You, you go out of the pit lane and into a refueling area. When I was doing my three hours in the pits in the middle of the night, I was in t shirt and shorts, it's allowed. And it was very pleasant. It was 18 Celsius overnight. And in the heat of the day, it was quite a lot hotter than that. And they did get closed down and pressured a little bit by the. GT3 Porsche of Herbert Motorsport um, towards the end. Herbert rolled the dice on strategy and didn't quite get it right, which is unusual for them. But they look pretty strong, so something a little bit of a different tyre manufacturer, in fairness. Di very different uh, characteristics of, of circuits. Uh, I'm just doing some quick arithmetic. I think after these lead cars stop, they will need two more full stops and a splash if they stay green to the end of the race. You're watching the BMW of Sheldon Vanderlinder, who we think is not far away from a pit stop strategy. So on that, OK, three hours and 49 minutes to go. And remember, in this race, we talk as much about time as we do fuel. And an ideal stint length is 75 minutes. That's the magic number, both from driver time point of view, but from a, a, a full stint on a tank of fuel. 35, 36 laps, about 75 minutes in these cars as we've seen all throughout the day. So you need to work back from 10 hours and 45 minutes to where we are now into this race with eight hours and 10 minutes in. And that's a bit of an indication as we see Fraser Ross squeeze down the inside of Tony Bates. And I get the feeling this may have been playing on for a little while between these two, who have been racing each other for a while in GT cars. Oh, hello. Oh. Hello, I'm here. Hello, coming through. Excuse me. Bump and run at the Scuderia Auto Art Chase. And now the Audi is clear of that car. They're not even on the same. No, I was just trying to find them on the time. That's there, exactly what I was doing. Miles apart. <laughs> so, Fraser hey, Ross look, in 10th, Tony Bates in 12th, but laps between them. I've got a car in front of me. I'm racing it. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. We're race car drivers. We're simple creatures. There's a, there's a car in front. Pass, pass it. it. Move on to the next one. There's another car in front. <laughs> pass it. Yes, exactly. Rinse and repeat. <laughs> uh, go on with you. Uh, arithmetic. Oh, well, Realty. it's not particularly good. So, uh, 75 minutes, I think, is where you need to look at. So, okay. how many times can we squeeze 75 minutes in the remaining three hours and 48 minutes right. left in this race? That's the, that's the question. That's what the teams will be looking at now. And, and it will be a case of balancing, getting to a point in the race where you know you can make it to the finish, but staying out of the track position and hoping you don't get a safety car, because that, yeah. that could end your day right there. So there's a fine balancing act to run at the end, but 
the way the cars are so split right now, so you've got these top five cars about to make a pit stop, and then the next two that we definitely think are in the mix aren't going to stop for another 20, 25 laps. Yeah, they're, 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 I think they're one pit stop better off. Yeah. I really do. But they the, are. The top, the, top, the top five, I think... So right. after this one, two more, and then they need a bit of help or a little bit of fuel saving. That's that's the point. So if you look at Lucas Stolls in 75, Sun Energy One Racing, the car that's been there all day, and Nicky Katzberg for Craft Bamboo, who for the second time in a row could MacGyver a strategy that gets them into contention at the end of the race. So they will run deeper into the race. So that room, the deeper you go into it, the less chance there is yeah. of you running the thing out of fuel in a green race the whole way yeah. to the end. But all that relies but on 3 hours and 46 correct. minutes of green flag running. Which has happened exactly once, once in the history of this race. And I don't reckon it happened in the last 3 hours and 46 minutes of the race either. We traditionally do see safety cars in the last portion of the event. So you do have to work your strategy out based on green flag running. Of course you do. All the way to the end, because that, for fuel burn, is effectively worst case scenario. Yeah. And any anything that happens from a safety car point of view, you need to think about on the run. So down in the Prelude Pit Bunker, boys, it's time to talk strategy again. See if we can forecast what's going to start happening. We're going to bring up those same five drivers and I'll let our friends in the commentary booth pick which ones we're going to talk about. Don't pick Craft Bamboo because I've not loaded it into the screen. Gentlemen, <laughs> take Chad, your pick. Can we, can we hear about the Craft Bamboo car? Please? Yeah, I knew you'd say that, guy. <laughs> you got the 75 up there. Yeah, we've got the 75. This is the one we think's in with a real chance. Yes, it is, but there's... There's an if, there's an asterisk, okay? So if I look at this at the moment, we know that they cleared Kenny's uh, minutes early. It was barely even an hour. And that was legal because they're racing in pro. And since then, they've been trying to go goon on, stoltz, goon on, stoltz, all the way to the finish. But the problem for mine, guys, is they're still in this awkward era of, yes, they're a pit stop up on the field, which we know looking at the timing screen, but they need to be able to get that safety car period right on where Stoltz and Gunon's driver time is going to start to cross over. So they've got Stoltz in the car right now. I know timing's saying it's uh, Gunon, but it's definitely Stoltz in the car right now. And they're hoping to either double him now and be able to clear him and then go Gunon to the end or do singles to the end. But both scenarios still need one more safety car to make it work, I reckon, because they're just going to fall afoul of a half stint somewhere, if that makes sense. So, yes, they could get home without that extra pit stop, but for the driving time, they do need a half stint somewhere and that safety car would make that work for them. Yeah, OK, that's fascinating. So they're, they're in a reasonable spot, but it's not clean sailing, is it, basically, yeah. is what we're saying? Yeah, that's how I'd put it. They, they reckon there's about a, there's like a 10-minute window. If they just got 10 more minutes out of Kenny's car, they reckon they would have had a bit more flexibility towards the end of the race. And that was a safety car, ultimately, that led to him having to get out early. Uh, the Give other the Porsche, guys... Chad. The Porsche, yep. Mm. So this has been very similar to what we saw with the race-winning uh, strategy from 2020 with the Bentley. They started the day uh, with Prining, in went Jaminet, in went Campbell. Campbell's only done two stints. They're really saving him so much so that he had time to go up in the commentary box to chat to you guys, and he'll double stint at the end. And this is really steady as she goes. We haven't really seen, I reckon, the proper fuel economy from that Porsche. We know it's got quick pit stops. We've got someone in the lane right now, by the way, but it's not one of the front-running guys. Uh, so, yeah, that's steady as they go, and very similar to what we saw from the 46. Only difference there is they've sort of played a pro-am strategy because they did have a silver-class driver in Valentino Rossi. So for mine, they're going to be going Farfus and Martin all the way to the end of the race. Uh, triple nine's worth looking at because they're not far away from a pit stop. And in fact, yep. the top five cars will be in the lane fairly soon. Yeah, so my data's a couple laps late here because I've got Maro down for 29 laps. If I peek off, it's actually been 33 30. laps. Yeah, so they are right on the buzz. You can see the fuel mileage that they've been getting. That had a safety car period in it, similar to this one. So they've got 35 laps out of that first session today. And uh, I think that we're going to get about 35 laps of running in this one because we had a couple laps of safety car very similar to that opening stint. Uh, where do you reckon they're going to go here, guys? I think Grenier gets back in it. Maro might actually be done by that point. I have to look at the numbers. Yeah. And then Marciello to double to the end, I'd say. He's done a bulk of the work, the heavy lifting so far, Maro. So, yeah, I think he's going to be fresh out of driver time. And, and he said on air earlier that they're keeping Lelo for that, that closing stint, yeah. the finishing stint. The one that I find intriguing here because it's definitely not played out the way any one of us would have thought. We've got Shane Van Gisbergen in that car right now uh, and it's, it's looking to me guys like they're really saving Brock Feeney to the end of the race. I mean they gave him the keys to the car to qualify yesterday as we've got Freddie Vavish in the lane right now 
but it, it's definitely starting to shape like they're maybe going to let Brock off the leash at the end of the race. That's a huge responsibility. I, I also think that they're going to have to potentially double stint tyres at the end too because that thing looks awful on cold tyres. Or do they go Gertz because um, they've been able to keep him in for that one stint? It really will depend. Whoever gets in the car next will be probably giving us a hint as to who's going to finish. Well, yeah. I'd expect it to be Maxi Gertz to do drive next. I, I don't know why you wouldn't put Brock in the car. Just finally, I know we don't have the graphic, and but then there's a segue coming, Chad. Car 32 <laughs> on a very similar strategy to the triple nine and the 912, the yeah. BMW. Yeah, I've been keeping a bit of an eye on them. I, it'd be easy enough to whip up a strategy graph, but it looks pretty similar to that one. Just just pretty much change your colours out and your, your names out. And that's what the BMW strategy. I'd say that's strategy A today. For, it's yeah. similar to what we've seen with the 912 similar here with the 999 uh, a couple of doubles here interestingly we haven't seen a single double stint from that porsche yet all single stints the whole way through yeah, yeah the only team that's been doing the singles the whole way through even uh, rossi with that double stint there was a double i actually i actually went back through the data and looked at that double stint there his average lap time in that stint was even quicker than that stint so despite yeah. the fact that he's only raced 45 minute races his whole career on two wheels on an endurance stint that was pushing two hours he was getting faster and faster if you've got it, you've got it, Chad. Yeah. Much like you in the bunker. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, we'll come boys. back and we'll, we'll pick some winners within the final two hours, I think, when we see how this all plays out. The reason I asked about Car 32, John Blundoff, is because we're joined by a member of its team up here in the commentary box. We are indeed. Welcome along, Charles First, How are you? Oh, sorry. Let, let me turn you, you on. <laughs> turn the uh, microphone on. Uh, not quite the pace you were looking for in the, the middle part of the race. So... Uh, any ideas what is causing that? Because you went, the cars went really well in Dubai in the heat of the day. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Dubai was uh, was good. Um, I mean, I, I was personally not there, but uh, I mean, they did a great strategy, and I think Sergi also played a big, a big role there. Uh, and here, yeah, we saw that the pace was actually not too too bad in the beginning of the race, but as the heat comes up, it's uh, it starts to be quite tricky for us. Uh, for the engine uh, and for for the tires, it's, it looks like we suffer a bit more than uh, the, the other cars. But on a, I would say, on a general note, we are, I think, just lacking a bit of pace, especially compared to the Mercedes and, uh, and the Audis. Some of our viewers are a little worried about the uh, the fact that there's a little bit of, of misting on the side of your car, and you'd see it particularly on the on the white car. Obviously, a little bit of fluid or something coming out the car and, and, and around the back. Are you guys not worried about that? Well, uh, as long uh, as we are now talking, the car is still running, so it's uh, I would say it's a good sign that we. Uh, yeah, no, it's not, not, not a big issue for the moment. Uh, I would say it's been hurting us. What's the tactics to the end of the race? Sorry, guys. Uh, well, now we, uh, I think we will try. I see your children's wearing a bit white. Um, oh, very white, too. No. <laughs> well, okay. He knew we were watching him. He's yeah. just trying to scare <laughs> yeah, you. Yes, exactly. No, no, no. Uh, well, I think now, so we have uh, Sheldon in for, uh, I would say, um, no, Dries will go in, then Sheldon for a double, and then uh, Dries, I think, will double to the end, so something oh. like this. But, uh, yeah. So that's the, the target, and uh, normally we save the tyres, uh, so we, have, we should have new tyres for the end of the race. Obvious question for me as a rookie at this place, how have you found our backyard here at Mount Panorama? Uh, it's amazing, honestly. Uh, I mean, it's my first time here in Australia. Um, it's the, obviously first time for me <laughs> in Bathurst, and i got to say it's definitely one of my uh, favourite tracks. It's, uh, it's very special to drive here, uh, and when you can yes, take a good lap to put together, it's, the feeling is just great. Uh, on the other side, I also had the, the lovely chance to double stem tires uh, <laughs> earlier in the race, but I think that was one of the most scary experiences I ever had. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's part of part of the travel, part of the of the, of the race. But uh, no, this this experience is something I will for sure uh, keep in my in my heart for a very long time. You're only 21 years of age, so you're very early into your racing career. But for the Australian audience who might not have seen you race before, you've never been here. Uh, what, what have you raced up to this point to get you to this point in your career? So, yeah, to make the thing pretty short, I uh, started with karting, as I would say, uh, most of the drivers. Then I moved to Formula 4, in which I've been driving two years, and I was a teammate of uh, Liam Lawson. Oh, we yeah. drove together, so for the people here, yeah. pro probably know him pretty well. Uh, and then uh, we, I moved directly to GT Racing uh, in 2019, if I'm, uh, if I'm right, directly, obviously, with uh, Team WRT. And I had a chance there to, to grow uh, and to drive with uh, great drivers as, uh, as Christopher Mies, uh, yeah, Kevin van der Linde and uh, Dries van Toor, uh, which is uh, uh, now a very good friend of mine and uh, teammate I've, I've had now for already a couple of years. And, uh, and yeah, so that's the, the thing. Then I had 
had uh, the opportunity to, to join Audi as a junior driver in 2021, and uh, now it is his first year as a factory driver for BMW. So the challenge is big, but it's definitely uh, a great challenge. What's the transition been like with the mid-engined car to now a front-engined turbocharged car? Mid-engined, normally aspirated car, front-engined turbocharged car. How both GT threes in terms of the formula of the car very different. Yeah, it's quite different. I would say each car has its uh, positive and negatives, but uh, yeah, it's also I think a question of getting used to it. Uh, the audio obviously is very agile on all uh, the twisty, twisty parts and tracks. Uh, very good on the brakes um, and maybe a bit more edgy on fast corners. Uh, while for the BMW, it's I would say the opposite. It's maybe a bit, uh, yeah, a bit slower or just a bit, yeah. I would say. It, I don't really know what to say, but just a bit more, well, yeah, just just a bit heavier, I would say, in slow corners. But in fast corners, the car is very stable and gives a lot of confidence, which is very nice. And it's also very good on, on curbs. So, yeah, it's just, uh, just a matter of some positives, some negatives. So, I would say the car in general would maybe suit better endurance tracks or in the continental tracks uh, than the Audi. Maybe uh, the Audi was better, probably, uh, I will see that our car is fitting now. And on that queue, we'll let you go because it's going to get busy down at uh, BMW Team WRT and the Porsche in as well. So thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Good to meet you. Thank you. you. There's Charles V. It's great to have him here at the Bathurst 12-hour. Watch him. He's a bright young star of GT racing in the future. As pit lane gets really busy and uh, as we let one of the drivers go back to the lane, both BMWs, Again. as they've been doing all yeah. afternoon, roll into a track some service. What, what's going to interest me is if the Manti Porsche gets, EMA Porsche gets more ground with the quick pit stops they've been making. So we'll track that. So second, third and fourth, all in the lane together. Maro Engel stays out. As we've seen that car all day, they're just extracting one more lap, two more laps at every round of pit stops from a fuel economy point of view in car triple nine. Good. Advantage of running in clear air, perhaps out in front. Tyres going on the Grello Porsche. Augusta Farfus adjusting the steering wheel on 46. Porsche's gone. It had some track position, remember, over the BMWs. Fire the car up. And one BMW leaves. We'll wait for the second one as well. About four seconds apart when they rolled into the lane. So Van Gisbergen's gone through to second. And Lucas Stolz has gone through to third. Porsche, minute 22 in pit lane. They are making chunks of time in the lane. Manti EMA racing. Four seconds quicker than the 32 car. And we wait for the 46 to leave as well. A little bit longer in the lane there for car 46. So once again, as the leader comes in, Chad, the Porsche is at its absolute best when it's in pit lane. I ran the stopwatch on the tyres on that one, guys. 11 and a half seconds. I timed the 888 guys out earlier at 16 seconds. It's 888, for goodness sakes, one of the best in the business. Now, granted, a lot of the people that they would have working on their tyres at a supercars race not here this weekend, but... Porsche guys are saving times on their tyres, definitely. Be good to get some fuel numbers as well, but they are so quick, couldn't even notice the moment they were over the line, and they already had the rattle guns on that left-hand rear. Yeah, I mean, they made six seconds in that pit stop over the two BMWs, just like that, six seconds, as, as if by magic. Didn't have to thrust the car, didn't have to drive it hard, didn't have to take risks. Races can be won or lost in pit lane at this place. In comes Triple Eight now to the lane. Just keep an eye on what Maro Engel and Grupa M do. That should be Maro done for the day. He has driven the wheels off this car and had a, he's 113 laps completed for Maro in this race so far. If they can't do 75 minutes, as you're suggesting, which is spot on crazy for the, the sort of laps you're doing, then it's two more pit stops after these stops that we're seeing for these cars. The other way that Porsche could be saving time in the pits is with the fuel saving on the track because the less fuel we need to put in it, obviously the less time you stop stationary in pit lane. And I just wonder if there's some fuel saving games going on there. Have we even seen them do an actual proper full fuel run yet in this race? Or are they just playing the fuel game at the moment? Out goes Raffaele Marcello. It's always exciting when he's behind the wheel of an AMG, especially a bright yellow one at this place. So a minute 25, bang on where the BMWs were. And that just verifies that the Porsche is the only car that is gaining significant amounts of time through this pit stop shuffle. 
Triple Eight still sitting there and waiting. Busy time of the race. We're building up to the finish of a strategic Bathurst 12 hour. Lots to offer here in Bathurst. Shopping centres, farmers markets. Here we go, pan for gold, believe it or not. This is how this place became prominent nationally in Australia's first inland city. There's an adventure playground, great buildings, with crumbly caves and a whole lot more to see and do in the central west of New South Wales. You really must come here and remember the 6.213 k's of Mount Panorama is a public road about 330 days a year. You can come and drive as many laps as you like. This is a very, very long stop for Triple Eight Race Engineering. Driver change, out of the lane they go. Yeah. Nine. The Porsche was there for a minute 20. Yeah, it looked like there was dramas on the left front completing that and getting the crew man back over the line before they could drop the car and send it. So Van Gisberg and he lost 51 seconds in, in that stint on track and then a pit stop that's near on 40 seconds longer than your opposition. That's a minute and a half near and that's half a yeah. lap. More than half a lap. More than half a lap. So that is going into the last three and a half hours of this race with definitely one hand tied behind your back. We know that car's got speed when it's running right, but not really sure or fully understand exactly what happened to Shane in that stint. Because after that safety car restart, where he just dropped like a stone and it just never really fully recovered. So with three hours and 31 minutes to go, give or take, six seconds between friends, we've got the Number 75, Sun Energy One car, back at the front of the field. Now, what that car is about two thirds of the way through its stint. However, another 10 laps. If they can get 12, 13, 13, 14 laps, that would give them 34. And that car has done that, then they'll be leading at the end of this race hour. And whilst that doesn't count for anything, that just tells you about the difference in the strategy. Then we'll have exactly three hours to go. 180 minutes. Definitely being off sequence, the Sun One Energy car and the Group of M car that Ra Raffaello Marchiello's aboard now will prove at some point the defining moment in correct. this race. Correct. They had the opportunity, didn't they, to, they were 10, 12 laps in to their stint when the last safety car came out and they chose not to. So when did that happen? That happened, it feels like... Hours ago. Four hours ago? Yeah. So we could look back at an event that happened in the first third of the race. Correct. It, it was the defining moment I for track position. Correct. To get in the right spot for track position. Doesn't mean you're going to win it, but get you the right, right track position for the last phase. And you said for better or for worse. Right now we don't know no, if it is know. for better or for worse. Correct. It's just a thing. Yep. <laughs> because it's going to happen. There will be a storyline. There's three and a half yeah. hours to go at Mount yeah. Panorama. Something will happen. It always does. It's just whether you, that moment in the race where you went off sequence with your opposition mm. was the right call right then or not, you don't know. But being off sequence, I think, is a good idea. You yeah. do something different because you can't go head to head because the cars are so close on performance. Do it in strategy. Now, we did see car triple eight on screen right now. It's slightly slower in pit lane after the tyres had been changed. The reason being, they were making some setup adjustments in the blanking at the front of that car, and making some aerodynamic changes as well. So there was a little bit of panic trying to get those done in a rush, but team manager Mark Dutton was very quick to praise his mechanics for being able to do that so quickly, uh, given that it's not their usual gig to be changing uh, setups on one of these cars uh, in such a rush. Obviously, much more at home doing it to their V8 supercar. Chad, with the taking out or putting in, I would think taking out at this stage of the day. I can uh, go and ask Dutto and uh, see if I can answer to that one. I'll ask him right now, as a matter of fact. Uh, Dutto, the commentary team are wondering, blanking coming out or blanking going in? Feel free to give me whatever answer you want to that question. Yeah, no, blanking co coming out. As obviously as there's dust collecting in the in the rad, also it's getting hotter during the day, so you have to adjust that to keep the engine operating at the correct temperature. Thank you, mate. Cheers.
That does slightly change the balance of the car, though, doesn't it, Garth? Because the, the airflow changes over a very important part of the aerodynamics of the front of that AMG. Yeah, I know Mark Dutton very well, and he gave an honest answer there, but didn't tell us the whole story. And it was, would definitely have been <laughs> shock horror. about aerodynamic performance of that car. We heard from Jamie Winkup very early in the day, who's driving the sister Triple Eight run AMG Mercedes, saying car's got plenty of front. So I think they've taken front aero out of the car to, to balance the car out, make it less nervous, make it more comfortable to drive across the top of the mountain. That's my guess anyway. We'll wait and see as the race continues to pan out. Aerodynamic changes uh, allowed partially in the roll set here. The sort of things we talked about there are fine. You were not allowed to change the wing angle, as far as I'm aware, Grill. So you, and I, I read this, bear in mind, I read this on a long flight uh, coming down from uh, Daytona, but I'm pretty certain once you're in the race, you're not allowed to change the wing angle there. So the way that you change the front aerodynamic performance of the car is you take the blanking out. So what Mark Dutton was saying was true. That does affect engine performance as far as temperature and things like that. But it does have a very large bearing on the amount of downforce you have in the front of the car. So hence, that's probably why you answer the question when you are asked, oh, no, no, we're just controlling the engine temperature. Right. But there's always a secondary purpose when you're doing those sorts of things. And that would have been front downforce. Anything you do on a car is going to have an effect on it and normally you would balance that off with another change you don't want to be doing too much because you don't want to change the overall characteristics of the car quite clearly the amgs are going okay this one just needs a little bit of fine tuning i'm just checking the timing screen for this car on screen maxi goats back aboard the triple eight car and he has just set the fastest cumulative to the sec end of the second sector for that car. Not for the race, but for that car. So, Maxi feeling more comfortable, whether it be this tyre set, the change of the balance to the car, whatever it may be. As we suspected, there is speed in that car. Yeah. It just wasn't as comfortable as you'd expect Shane would like to have had it. And potentially not prepared to risk the car at that stage of the race, but there's still three and a half hours to go. Yeah. Crucially, they're still hanging in there on the tail end of the lead lap. Remember that the pass around, the wave by, does not run all the way through this race. So you have to be there or thereabouts and back on the lead lap before the start of the last 60 minutes. Yeah, so there's, there's two hours and 25 minutes left of wave around potential time yeah with three hours and 25 left to go in the race so you need that safety car to come if you want the wave around in the next two hours and 20 minutes effectively to enable you to be back on the lead lap and get you back in the game for the last 60 minutes sprint to the line as far as the cars and how far through their stints they are and this is crucial at this stage the leader 23 laps into somewhere near 34, 35 lap stint. Second, third, fourth are all four and five laps. So that's the Stoltz car, the 75 Sun Energy One car, as I say, on 23 laps. So they've probably got 10 to go. And the next one that is well through the stint is Nicky Katzberg in that number 77. So those are the two cars that are off kilter the car was talking about that. Well, Mercedes AMG GT3 fires across the top of the hill. A record number of them in the field this year. It's a fascinating car and I think we should go and take a closer look. The AMG GT3 is, as the name suggests, the racing version of the AMG GT, the flagship two-door sports car created exclusively by Mercedes-Benz High Performance Division. Last year, the AMG GT3 swept the podium, the first time in Bathurst 12-hour history in the GT3 era. The 2022 Liquid Molly Bathurst 12-hour podium. Mercedes-AMG prides itself as the world's fastest family and this year at Bathurst, AMG's customer racing family is represented by drivers and personnel covering at least four continents, 
including former winners of the 12 hour and global GT racing stars. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic race car. It's an all around very good compartment car. So it's good when it's cold, it's good when it's hot, it's good when it's raining, it's good when it's dry. So it's a car that allows us to be competitive in every track in the world, every championship, every tires. And I think that's what makes the big difference for us is that we are always there because the car is so fantastic. I think it's a car that is very reliable, has many years of development. It's a very forgiving car to drive as well. All the amateur gentlemen drivers like it a lot. Oh, it's incredible, especially time in GT3 is high down for car around the, the mountain is very crucial, especially up top of the mountain. And the car has been really balanced, you know, even from last year having one, two, three Mercedes finish in the better stuff now. And hopefully, fingers crossed, it can happen again this year. It's a good car around here, uh, stable and fast corner. Uh, so it should be good over the mountain and looking forward to drive the track. I mean, it's quite re uh, reliable in the race. Uh, normally, it's a car we can run without any issue. Uh, it's good, more or less, in every track. It's, it's awesome. Over the top of the mountain, you know, as I said, it's very different to what I'm used to. So, uh, you know, you're scraping over the top, you're on so much faster than, you know, what us Aussies are used to. So it's a lot of fun. Um, as I said, I always jump out of it with a smile. I just enjoy driving it. It's always good fun and, and the racing's always exciting. Powerful product, one, two, three on the podium last year. It's the first time in the history of this race as a GT3 Enduro that one brand had swept all three positions. You better believe that Mercedes AMG here and all around the world trumpeted that one pretty loud. Oh yeah. It's not often you get to sweep the podium at this place. It's a huge performance and right now they're eternally battling for the win with about four of them all in the mix in this as this fascinating strategic race plays itself out. And the pace is picking up at the foot of the field as well, Krelsey, between the top two. Look at the lap times and the, and the splits that are coming in now from the Sun Energy One car and the chasing Triple Nine, the Van Filters Gripper N car. That's a new fastest middle sector of the lap for Raffaele Marciello last time around. Casually punches out a 3-0 on lap 227. 3-3 three, three for Marcello behind him, the gap 9.6. 3 zero is the fastest lap we've seen for a while. Yeah. yeah. So these two, these two cars, although they're on alternate strategies, pitting at different times, find themselves locked in a battle for 15, 20 laps at a time, then they go off for a little period, do their own thing for a little while. By the time they've both done their pit stops, they're back into a battle. There's 10 seconds between the two cars, but don't think they're not racing each other on the stopwatch and on the timing screen. There's a very, very heavy battle between the two of those cars for the lead of this race as the strategy continues to play out. We've been talking up the exploits of this young bloke, I mean, this weekend, but we've been doing it for some time now because it's well-deserved. Bump down to the Super Cheap Auto Garage, Triple Eight, and say hello and good afternoon to Brock Fenny. Hello, young man. How are you? I'm good, guys. How are you guys going up there? Uh, we're having a nice time, but not having to work quite so hard as you are, mate. Uh, how's the day been for Car Triple Eight? Just give us the, uh, the top-level summary from your point of view. Uh, pretty tough. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a long day. Um, I tell you what, the double stints are actually quite difficult. So I got out of the car pretty sore then, and. Uh, had some lunch, had a bit of physio, and yeah, now I'm, I'm suited up. I've still got a bit of time before I can jump back in, but yeah, I think I'll be finishing the race. So um, it's hard to know. I'm in and out of the truck, but you know, we're still there. We've got a straight car, and hopefully we're in it at the end. Nice job yesterday, Stu. I thought you qualified very, very nicely in qualifying itself, and then your performance in the shootout was exceptional. You broke the lap record. Unfortunately, you didn't break it by enough, but Mauro Engel got you, but... You must have been. You must have slept well last night with the job that you did yesterday. I thought your name's Stu and I'm Carlos, mate. Oh, you are a Carlos. Bit mixed That's up. True. Come on. That's true. Um, yeah, yesterday was good. Uh, it was awesome to go up against the best GT sort of guys in the world. I felt very out of place in the press conference up there. A lot of Germans <laughs> and factory drivers, so it was a bit awkward. But um, no, it was good. Yesterday was awesome. Uh, yeah, don't think we've probably got that outright pace that we had yesterday today, but um, we're trucking along okay. Uh, but yeah. A shootout at Bathurst. This is my first proper one, so it was pretty cool. Have you spoken to Shane since he's jumped out of the car? It looked like that stint for him previous was a real struggle. It looked like the car balance went away from him. Lost a lot of time to the other AMGs throughout the course of that stint. Did he mention as to anything why? Yeah, I briefly spoke to him then. Um, yeah, just comfort in the car sort of thing. I think even in my stint, I was struggling quite a lot with the balance and 
uh, been a little bit unpredictable at times. So the cold tyre switching on has been really difficult, you know, for us as a team, and I think a lot of people down pit lane. So it's something that you know we need to get better to be more competitive at the end of this race. But um, we'll learn from that and Maxi's stint now, and, and hopefully we can make some tune-ups to the end of the race. Rock, you've been racing the AMG with Triple Eight for a, a season now, but what have you got out of having someone like Maxi go who does this for a living every weekend? Just about he's in one of these cars. How do you? much do you draw out of his experience in the GT3 platform? Yeah, massively. Um, it's the thing that I was probably most looking forward to this weekend was working with Maxi and, you know, I try to plan to do a bit more of this racing. So as much as I can learn from him um, from a driver's standpoint, but also, you know, mechanically minded and, you know, his thoughts on the car as well. For me, I sort of just jump in the car and, you know, got, oh, it's got a little bit of understeer, it's got a bit of oversteer. So for him, he's a bit more in depth and, you know, knows what tools make those changes. So it's been good to learn off him. Um, you know, he's a class act. He's doing a great job. He did a great job this morning. Uh, same thing again here. And I'm um, sure he'll hand it over in good hands at the end. I know people still come up and ask you about Adelaide, mate. I know you're looking forward to the new season. You've got lots to focus on, but pretty special moment, hey? Uh, it was very cool. Uh, it's 2023 now, so we're sort of all back to zero. But uh, it's good to kickstart the year here. Obviously, it was a ripper end of the year. Um, you know, certainly slept a bit better in the holidays. So uh, looking forward to getting back into supercars. We've got testing next week, and it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. All right, you're in for the end. We understand. That's what we've worked out. And you just nodded, so we'll take that as a yes. Thanks for joining us, mate. Good stuff this weekend. You've driven really, really well, and best of luck to the finish. Thanks, mate. Cheers. There's Brock Feeney down in the Super Cheap Auto Garage. I'll take that as a subtle nod, but I think he gave it away. That's what our numbers are pointing to anyway, and, and just with the driver time for how long you can spend out of a car, it all makes a lot of sense. Race control to all teams. Pit lane drive through penalty to car triple eight for a breach of pit stop procedure. Now, if you ask if we planned that timing, we didn't, and this is why. So we understand it's a breach for equipment use, and there's a mandated use of equipment that can be taken over the red line to work on the car. So to this point, they've done the driver change. They've done the drink bottle. We're doing tyres right now. See it. Which point of the stop does that take place? There's something going on at the back of the car. There was something going on at the back of the car. And now we're doing that front blanking change that we spoke to Mark Dutton about. Didn't look like there was any hand tools used in that, but there's a hand tool being used there. Oh. Ah. <laughs> oh, and it's, a, it's a breach of the regulations. Tough for a, a supercar team that's so used to one set of regs to come in and have to adapt to another one. It's not an excuse by any extent, but they do have to adapt to a different set of regulations to what they do do every time. But, but it's the rules of the race, and you, you do need to abide by them. They do have a very dedicated GT team mm -hmm. part of this program, so they'll know the rules. Chad. Well, we'll get a word off Mark Dutton, who's had a good look at the replays now. Uh, did you feel like you knew it when you saw the replay, Dotto? Yeah, we knew it just before, unfortunately, uh, but it's it's definitely on us to put our hand up. We, uh, we misread the rules and uh, got a bit excited on working out the best way to tune the car and service it and forgot that uh, you can't have those tools doing any work in pit lane. So you can see on the TV, we adjusted the wing. Uh, to do that, the proper way is to bring the car into the garage. We did it outside. We've just served our penalty. All right, so you're gonna cop that one on the chin, hey? You have to, mate. Can you come back from there? Oh, anything can happen, but uh, yeah, really disappointed with myself on that one. Okay, mate. Well done for owning it, and uh, good luck. Cheers. The, the key thing there is if they put that bat in the box, that would have been fine. Yeah, it takes way too long to put the car on skates, back it into the garage, adjust the rear wing, and send it back out again. You wouldn't, you wouldn't take that opportunity. So I you, know you'd go down a lap, whereas a drive through penalty will cost you 32 seconds. Yeah. Mm. Shake. Thomas Prining out of the 912 Porsche. Thomas, the Mercedes drivers have been complaining about the comfort and drivability of their cars right now with the current conditions. How nice is it in the Porsche? I don't know how nice it is in their car, but it's a lot faster in there, so. Uh, I don't think they have anything to complain about. All in all, uh, we have a good car today. We made some big steps from yesterday. I'm happy with that. 
For now we're just uh, lacking a bit of pace to stay with them, but I think with our special weapon Matt uh, ready for going to the end of the race, if we maybe get a bit of luck with a safety car and we're in the mix, we can still fight for the win. Your pit stops have been so much shorter than everyone else's. How have you guys been able to save so much fuel while still running quickly? Well, on the one side, we're very efficient on fuel, that's true. Um, our engineers uh, prepared us well uh, in terms of how to do it. And also our crew, honestly, has done a phenomenal job on the tire changes. We, I think we were probably the quickest in the paddock, so it is uh, worth an applause. Good luck. Thank you. Two thirty-one laps in the books, and this intriguing 2023 Little Molly Bathurst 12 hours continues to keep our keep our attention. Stoltz from Marcello by 12 seconds, vastly different pit strategy. Some 19 laps between them in terms of the last time they were down the lip. Matcha Javani. In the 912 Porsche, the whining gearbox. Let's see how he tackles the mountain. Going up to turn two right now. Let's follow him and you can turn it up and enjoy the sights and sounds of Mount Panorama. Have it a lap effectively sitting alongside Matthew Javane. And whether in sound and vision or you were just uh, listening in around the world on our audio channels as well, pretty neat lap and a pretty clear lap as well. Garth Tandem was looking very carefully at that. It's a little mistake going into the first corner for the 101 car, not quite working out for them. Neat time from Javanier last time around. That transmission wine in top gear is uh, something else, isn't it? Really is. Sitting in third position, they're just 35 seconds off the lead in that 912 Mantai Porsche. We're coming into a critical few minutes, few sort of stint lengths, I suppose, in the Liquid Molly Bathurst 12 hour from Race a control strategy point of view. 90 second time penalty for car 50 for exceeding maximum continuous driver time uh, to be served at next pit stop. That's that's the brutality of the rules in this race. If you overstep the mark from your driver time, we've been talking about it all day, you get wrapped over the knuckles pretty seriously. So 
They'll have to sit in their pit box for a minute and a half to serve that penalty. I would imagine before their next pit stop. That was from earlier on today, Crailsey. The documentation comes in. It was exceeded apparently by over seven minutes, so not close there on the 103 laps. So that's minutes. genuinely missed the regulation, I would say, from the team perspective. Heard a bit on their plate this weekend, that team, with a car change and getting everything organised to be able to drive this Audi. So they'll be take their penalty, move on, try and finish the race off. Guys, always great to see one of the legends of Australian motorsport, Mick Doohan here. Mick, uh, I know you're an AMG man. Cars are doing quite well this weekend. They are. They've certainly got some numbers out there, don't they? So, but, but I mean, equally, they perform well and they're reliable, hopefully. <laughs> but, I mean, um, they've got some great drivers here as well and, and equally here with young Brock Feeney going extremely well, sort of the first time here doing this. Uh, we've seen Valentino Rossi go around, but we also know you're pretty quick in a car around a track as well. What do you love about this place? It's just a unique, a unique circuit, isn't it? It's hard to really call it a circuit because it's a road, but, I mean... Uh, it, it, ever since we've we've been kids, you know, Bathurst has been something. So it's a special place as well. It's a uh, very much a, a driver's circuit, or back in the day, a rider's circuit. So it's a challenging circuit. And, and when you throw in 12 hours of, of racing, anything can happen. So, so really, it comes down to strategy, and that's why everyone's so excited about who's going to be where in a couple of hours' time. Rick, were you surprised by how well Valentino has gone here? Not really, you know, the, the guy, well, he's a seven-time MotoGP world champion. He's been racing in MotoGP for the past 20 years and then with the, the, the smaller categories before that. So he can learn a track quickly. Generally, the guys like that, they can walk a track, do two laps, and they're on the pace, and, and you need to be. So, And the car, he's been playing in Formula One cars, been playing in go-karts, been playing in cars. So, look, it doesn't surprise me how well he goes. But, I mean... He'll keep getting better and better and better because these other guys, his teammates or whatever, are just a couple of tenths quicker. They're the things that you take your time to catch up on. And the guy he's driving with, all these guys here in this box, they've been doing it since they're kids and, you know, put them on a motorcycle to see how they go. But, but I mean, he's doing a great job and, and, and uh, it's amazing how many people are here wearing 46 to, <laughs> to see Valentino. We love our motorbike champions, Mick, you know that. Got to ask you really quickly, um, Jack's year ahead, your son. Well, big step up for him this year, big job. Absolutely, like um, it's uh, at the moment he's still just F2 and then, um, you know, we'll, we'll, let's see what happens from there. Um, but he performed well last year, the first year in the, in the category. So, look, he's still young. He's working hard at it. He's sort of knocking on the door. So hopefully one of those doors will open and then let's see how he goes. But um, he's up there. I'll go and meet up with him um, late next week up in Bahrain for the first round of tests. Awesome, mate. We love watching. It's great to have another Australian lurking around there in the Formula One world. Fingers crossed. Yeah, hey, Mick, you. thanks, mate. All the very best. Great to see you Thank here. Cheers. <laughs> Stay away. <laughs> I'll do my best. Thanks, guys. <laughs> uh, great to see Mick doing in the house. He's always here. He's been an AMG ambassador for a long time, so, but he's also a rev head, let's be honest. Great to see him here. So, to all of the Valentino Rossi fans around this amazing venue, record crowds across this year's Looking Only Backers 12 hour. And, Certainly a lot of them drawn to this race in part for Valentino being here for the first time. Hopefully they've liked what they've seen and keep coming back regardless. Certainly been a show since these cars first turned some laps. We've had Formula One cars cutting laps. We've had Matt Hall in the sky. We've had all sorts of stuff. Some really good support racing yesterday. Lots to like as we watch car 75 and right on screen we see Jamie Winkup. This is uh, really boiling up nicely. Well, we're crunching some numbers. Yeah, I saw you do that earlier. And I've reverted to a notepad as well, just for proof safety of mind. The, the set, Sun Energy One Racing are right on the cusp of getting to the end on two stops, I think. But I, I think they're missing about 20 minutes worth of time somewhere in there that they need to find and magic up to get them home without having to make a splash with 15 or 20 minutes to go. So you think... I reckon they're short. When, when you say they're short 20 minutes, it's, they're short 20 minutes worth of fuel in the car, yeah. isn't it, to get and, the strategy to work to the end of the race. We'll bring Chad in on this as well. Chad? Yeah, I, I've sort of run out of room on the, on the number 75 tab to add stints to, but what we can do is just use the time backwards. So Gunon's got two hours and 24 minutes of driving time left. Mm. 
Stoltz has an hour and 25 minutes of driving left. So they need to get to that magic two hours, 2.24 to go in the race, yep. and then hopefully hand the car from Luca over to Jules without exceeding Luca's maximum drive time. And that's where that potential 20 minutes may lie, right in the middle there. So can they get to that 2 hours and 24 minute mark without overstepping Luca's time? Now they're probably a lap or two from having to bring Luca in. Now do they double stint him and risk running him all the way to the one, uh, out, what is it, 150 minute straight mark? Yeah. Or do they actually put Jules in the car right now and go singles to the end? But uh, this is what I was talking about earlier with that half stint, guys. I just thought that they were just half a stint away from being able to pull off this incredible strategy. Yeah, and yeah. The, the, the way that they've manage this race with getting being a full pro car and having Kenny Habul do a very small amount in the early part of the race boxes them into very tight driver time windows so they've got a lot to manage for the remaining three hours of the race for this car they didn't they wouldn't have done it this way if they didn't think they were a chance no. and that hey with a quarter of the race to go they're leading so they're going okay they've got a very fast car and two very very fast drivers in the driving roster to finish this one off and, and if you remember, this might not be their chosen strategy because what they did was when they put Kenny back in when they had a, a, a safety car out on, on the track to, to try and extend that window. So they couldn't have planned for that car. And that's what's got them here at the moment. They're, they're due it in a lap or two's time and there's going to be almost spot on three hours to run. They've got more than a half a chance here. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And we, mu we mu mused earlier that that time when they went off sequence, would it work or wouldn't wouldn't work? At the moment, we're still, still not sure. Still don't know, which, no. is, which is exciting for the race because it could go either way. Chad, I know we've still got you in the lane. Uh -huh. There's the other group of cars then that are all on the same strategy that stopped 15 or 16 laps ago. And we're talking about the 999, the 912, the BMWs that are all in that similar sort of mix. So my numbers sort of look at, they'll aim to get in around the nine hours, 45 mark. So 45 minutes from now. And then they can run from that point. If even a little sooner than that, they could run from that point up to the 11 hour mark and stop with 60 minutes to go in the race. So it'll be a time stop rather than a full tank of fuel potentially yeah. and get to the end with a shorter final stint. Now, who do you reckon that's going to suit? I reckon 912. Yeah, 100 percent yeah. Exactly yeah. right. I'd be I'd be backing the 912 if it becomes a bit of a fuel race uh, in that last round of green flag pit stops. Still very hard to tell at the moment, guys, but yeah, it, we do have sort of two relative strategies playing out across the top five. And it's advantage to the 75 if they can somehow make that all work for them. They could potentially get home on two stops from here. We're about to find out, Chad, because it's barreling through pit entry right now. Oh, I wish I was in that garage. <laughs> oh, I'm going to run down there and see if I can make it because I'm really curious to know how they're going to play this one. Leave the mic open. Let's hear Chad run down there. <laughs> we I'll save this, my legs. We want this live. <laughs> Apparently, my esteemed colleague is already waiting down there for me, which helps. So. The, the question is, do they drive, Do they make pit stops to drive a time or are they playing with fuel and can they be that flexible with the fuel strategy? And remember, you've just seen an example of what happens if you exceed the driver time, that cumulative driver time of 150 minutes. You get a massive penalty and it just that ends your day straight away. Fuel first, no driver no change. Driver so change, Luke yeah. is staying in the car. Yeah. That answers one of our questions. Crew staying behind that red line, but actually checking brake wear there. You can see yeah. him looking into the wheel, having a look at brake wear. We saw some of the AMG Mercedes crews changing front brake pads early in the day. I think these team, I'm just checking, yeah, they did a pad change earlier as well. Yeah. This team. It's quite early in the race. Yeah. So, but I'd rather have fuel, fuel only. Nice. I'd rather have coming. nine hours old pads rather than 12. Three hours is a long running here. So there's only 62 seconds in the lane from entry to exit. Still only stop. Mm. So does that mean the next stop they take tyres, drive a change, service with the lot, send it on its way? Shay? Moreover than it being a fuel stop only, guys, it was a timed fuel stop. In other series, we've seen uses of leashes, broom handles. This was a swift kick to the leg to the refueler when it was time to remove <laughs> the probes. I did think the 62 second time was very yes. fast for a yeah. fuel only, yes. especially for the Mercedes, who we do know that you don't burn fuel for free. They've been fuel for much longer 
than the Porsche, for example. So that makes sense for what Shay was saying. Still a lot of strategy at play with the 75 car. But it answers our questions. It means that they're doing this to drive a time and then they intend to get Jules Gunon in for his run to the flag. The end of the 12 hour. Just put a little tick next to that question. Oh, what, not, a, not a big tick, just a little tick. Well, there's still some serious question marks over whether they can still make it. So the, the plan now, we heard that Jules Gunon's got two hours and 24 minutes left of driver time. So they'll run this time stint with Luca behind the wheel, right up to the point when he has to get out the car. And then hopefully that crossover time is enough that uh, Jules can get in and run right to the end. But there's still going to have to be a stop in there again to get them to the line. But, but so they'll be able to do it on time, that last stop, rather than a full tank of fuel. So 2.24 he's got left to burn. You've got to give yourself a little bit of leeway there because depending where you are when time elapses so you've got you've really we've got 257 and a half to go at the moment so you want to get down to 220 possibly 215 so you're looking at a 45 minute stint here at the least before that car comes back in and does the, the driver change and by then he would have had his 60 minutes which is fine that's all good and then it comes down to, so that's that's part one of the equation is the driver time so that works, thank you very much. So that is a big tick at that. Then it comes down to the fuel and tyres, and that we'll find out later on, Jack. Yeah, so he's got one hour 20 left as Luca. So Jules got two hours 24. So put them together, that's three hours 44. And uh, we're well and truly under that in terms yes. of time remaining. So that part's fine. Mm. So if they go, OK, well, let's just run him an hour 20 in this stint, which they could easily do on a, a load of fuel. I reckon they've put one hour 20 minutes of fuel in that car, potentially. The other option here is after I've added... So if you go exactly what you said, Krause, they can do all that stint on one, and then they could easily get Jules in and out with his two hours and 24 minutes. Split that in half, that's an hour and 10 on each stint. That's easy. But that would get them to lap 308 by my count. And we're on for 316 laps in the race. So... If I was to just put the fuel numbers together and the stint numbers together, I have them eight laps short from the finish. So yeah. they said they needed a safety car. That's a long safety car. And eight laps is about that's, 20 minutes. That's, that's 16 to 20 minutes yeah. that Richard was talking about earlier. So they've still got some arithmetic to do in the 75 garage to try and strategize their way into a winning position against the 999 Group of M car. Don't count out the Porsche either. That car's 28 seconds off the lead of the race behind Marciello, but you get a safety car and we turn this into a strategy race and a pit stop race, that Porsche will be well in the game. Had a quick chat to Matt Campbell while he was up there. He said, if I be in front of those Mercedes, they're not coming past me. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's got a track record here of passing big front engine, burly sports cars in his history as well. So... Those that love Aston Martins will not have fond memories of that. And, and actually, he, uh, he fair-stitched Raffaele Marciello up at Turn 1 that year as well on his path to victory with a Carrera Cup-style move, the big send at Hell Corner. There's still a lot to play out in this race, and that's what we love about this. To use a test match analogy, we're at the start of day five now, yeah. and all the results are on the table for this one. Is it going to take spin? That's the question. We're building to a big end at the Liquamoli Bathurst 12 hour. A beautiful Sunday here in Bathurst Town. The spares box highlights take us back to the early wee hours of this Sunday morning. It, it feels like an age ago and yet not long ago, all at the same time, doesn't it? There's been some bruising incidents as always at this place with the Grove Porsche into the wall. So to the Adrian Beats Lamborghini, one of uh, five, six non-finishers from this race to this point of the day. And this was one of them. Cameron, after a starring performance throughout the weekend of the Belmont Racing, Sadie's AMG, big contact with the spares box dipper and big damage to the back of one of the nine AMG GT3s. And here's another one. That for Scott Taylor from the prostate cancer. That was his first stint in the car and Craig Lowndes had literally just left the commentary box. This, an error from Triple Eight Race Engineering. Uh, they were not allowed to use that adjustment tool outside of the pit garage, and as a result, they were penalised for that. 
As it stands, car triple nine leads the car race as we roll into the final three hours. Two hours and 53 to go. We're nine hours and six in. This driver leads by 29 seconds from Matthew Jamine in the Porsche and Dries Vantor in the BMW. Three different brands in the top three positions. In the final three hours of this year's race. Class leaders. Triple Seven has reached the front in the Bozell Pro-Am class. Chris Meese and Ricardo Phil are the pros. Yasser Shahin, the Am in that little arrangement there. And they're still the first car a lap down in the running order at the moment. Fraser Ross second in class and Brad Schumacher third at the wheel. There's still a lot to play for there to get the class on. A silver being led by Dylan O'Keefe in the number 10 Audi for International Motorsport. And that's the overall leaderboard. There's a lot to play out in these cars on different strategies. In particular, car 75. That's led a lot of the day with Lucas Stolls behind the wheel. They've put fuel in. And it's now marginal whether they can get to the end on one more stop or not. All we do know there is that the guy that's won this race the last two times it's been held will be the guy bringing it home once again. And if you want anyone to bring a race car home at this place in GT3 spec, I'm pretty happy to have your money on Jules Gunon. The one thing that we did talk about with that number 75 Sun Energy AMG, the metallic copper coloured car, is how long Lucas Stoltz has been in the car. Because remember, he can only go to 150 minutes straight through. Cumulative, yes, a continuous driving time, continuous yeah, which, is a, which is a double stint. Yeah. yeah, so he's got to be, they've got to be aware of that. But we're not expecting that Stoltz will do a full stint. No, exactly. They did the timed pit stop for fuel uh, uh, at that previous stop. Uh, that's that's the only thing I disagreed with with Chad on, where he said he, they'll run him all the way through to the end of his driving yeah. time. They can't run him for all the way through. No, because it'll get too close to that driver. Correct. Maximum driver, continuous driver time window. So we always knew that the 75 car was going to have to do some juggling with its driver time as it came towards crunch time in this race. And it's going to be great to watch that. They managed, they managed it so well to now, so clearly they know what they're doing. Hey, they might, we might be the one, only ones in this pit lane stressing about it right now. They yeah. might be fully under control and ready and comfortable with where they're at. Let's, uh... Oh. Oh, Hello, thanks. guys. Oh. How are you? Oh. <laughs> what time is it? Did we um, catch you again, I'm actually, oh, no, I'm, I'm six minutes early. I'm is sorry. That one, is Crazy? that one of those watches from before? Yeah. <laughs> you, said, you said three o'clock and I'm early. I'm sorry about that. But I have been to the top of the mountain today and I've, I've really done it all. And I thought, I, I just want to experience the other end, the other extreme here. And this is the Piper Hide Sec uh, marquee and suite area. Let me just show you around. You're, you're right above the pits here, which is fantastic. Uh, you've got a tremendous... Uh, array of Piper Hide Sick champagnes to enjoy. Everyone's having having a good time up here. The tracks are, are you having a wonderful time? Oh, absolutely wonderful. The attention is fabulous. The race is great. The best place to be. Gee, she's a very good saleswoman, isn't she? <laughs> exactly right. Come out and I'll show you uh, where we go to here. You come out then onto the uh, the grass deck and you come under these beautiful umbrellas. And hello everyone, how are you? And you get to enjoy the racing from from right here, trackside. It is absolutely magnificent. And, and should should the thirst set in, uh, you will you've just served right where you are with little Piper Hide Sick champagne. I mean, <laughs> does life get any better, really? Oh, I'm not I'm not one to be I'm not one to be greedy, as you guys know. But um, this is pretty hard to leave, really. Uh, cars coming into pit lane. What a view! I might just um, cheers to you guys. Yeah, cheers. Cheers Barrett. to you working hard in the commentary box, guys. It, it's not doesn't go unnoticed. We all appreciate it. It's a it's a big it's a bigger tradition it's bigger tradition of Barrett's getting the <laughs> glass of bubbly in his hand as <laughs> seeing a room by the side mm. of the track. Isn't Doing it? it tough, boys. Doing it tough. Yeah, all it's right, like Barrett. Good day. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Come on over. Everybody's welcome. <laughs> Watch car drink the three cornerstones for Barrett's. Well, he's got old Jerry Maguire on us. He only needs the shoes now. It's a different level of catering from where he was a couple of hours ago. <laughs> yeah, that's of right. Mountain, isn't it? He has experienced the full Bathurst 12-hour experience today as our Mark Beretta. Uh, it's lucky he's a ripper bloke and does great things for charity with Tour de Cure. Otherwise, he'd be very easy to dislike that bloke. Nah, nice Barrettes. Good work. You've earned it. Uh, this is a, a pit stop. I think the engine cover was coming off this car. Very briefly, making some changes to the rear of the Myland Partners. This is International oh, Motorsport. Yeah, oh, oil, a bit of a top oil up oil. going in the back of that car. These guys running well. They're leading their class. 
237 laps. They are quite some distance in front of the number 101 Harold's Valenti Rosso Motorsport car. So they've got a bit of time to burn here by the looks of it, as much as that thing's burning oil. So it's rare you see that in GT3 racing, to be honest, isn't it? It's maybe tough as nails, these maybe cars. just a precaution. Yeah, really. just double check everything because they have that margin. Take the time, make sure everything's okay. So half a minute, half a minute, 29 seconds. If you want to be absolutely spot on between first and second, there is the 101 car that is second in that silver class, but it is laps down on the number 10 that's just pulled out. So even if they catch up that Audi that just left the pit lane after a little top up of essential fluids, they're still at four laps behind. And there is that Audi heading up into the Audi cutting, remarkably enough. Very apt. Yes. Oh, apt. apt Very like good. That. I see what you did there. I see what you did there. <laughs> you can come again. <laughs> Crazy. Don't encourage him. <laughs> hey, we don't all have banners around the road for a good Richard Crail. Calm down. Don't encourage that either. Thank you. So just still crunching all the numbers. And of course, a drop of a Pirelli tyre onto the dirt, there's somebody hitting the wall. We don't wish that on anybody, but that could change things. Any kind of mechanical dramas. And just because there's half a minute between first and second and 14 seconds between second and third, three seconds between third and fourth. So that's the, the top four set cars are within 45 seconds. Now, that is, that is not in any way, shape or form a big gap here. That's a half speed. Yeah. That's a you know, that's a side-by-side -side incident with a slower car that puts you off the track or damages a wheel and tyre. You've got to loop back to pit lane for an unscheduled stop. This is not over. Do not write the headlines yet. With two and three-quarter hours to go, Raffaele Barcello with the blinking 001 in the top right-hand side of the windscreen. For those of you around the circuit, stick to us on 103.9. And once again, thanks to all of our technicians, all of the hard work that's gone on before this, before this race started, in fact, before the cars were even on track. That's the running of the cables and the fibre for the cameras and for Bathurst Council's IT department running all kinds of communication links, as well as that FM transmitter so that everyone here, the huge crowd here, can stay in touch with what's going on, whether they're down in front of the pit lane or up at the top of the mountain. There's camping as well, staying in tune with what's going on. Huge team effort that's brought this together. And we're coming in now to the decision-making times. Will it be the teams that make decision, or will the mountain decide for 2023? Temperatures in the mid-20s this afternoon at Mount Panorama. It's a stunning day. There's a massive crowd at this place and enjoyed a fascinating tactical race. It, from a strategic point of view, it, it's got memories for mine of the 2018 race. Didn't end the way we liked it that year, but we've, from a fuel and a strategy standpoint, with varying strategies all converging to the end, with a bunch of different contenders. But right now, in my eyes, there are five cars that can still win this race, definitely, and never, ever rule out a Triple Eight race engineering run car in this race until it is absolutely over, because they will always find a way to be in the mix. And that team in the past have been out of contention in the closing, theoretically out of contention in the closing hours. And then something's happened in their past cars, and they've got the elbows out, and they've raced their way into the podium finish a couple of years ago. And very much lots of cars brings to mind. So I think Maxi got back in sixth places, and a minute 56 seconds off the lead. Yes, it's a long way back, but I would never rule them out until they're a lap down within the final hour of the race, which is when that wave by rule really does end. We're in the midst of a long green flag run. Raffaele Marciello is the race leader. And we're thinking 10 laps 
if not a little bit more, away from making their final pit stop. Ten laps, two minutes and five seconds a lap. Near on 30 minutes, and that gets them right into the window of doing the race on one more stop to get them to the chequered flag. We know that Marcello will be the one to finish in car 999. I think there'll be another stint in there for Mick. Grenier, I think there has yeah, to be no, from the driver Marcello time. Marcello will go too far yeah. into the maximum, allow continuous driver time for that one. So they'll get him out, freshen him up. It'll have to be a 60-minute stint yes. for Grenier because you need to, once you're out of the car, you've got to stay out of the car as a minimum rest time for 60 minutes. And then Marcello will jump back aboard. So the number nine, Mercedes, to bring it home. The moment they think they can make it on two more pit stops, they'll pit. Yes. And, and pull Raffaele out, plug Mick in, and then run him for 60 minutes, and then the next lap basically get him back in, and that car then will be good to go to the chequered flag with new tyres, fuel set up, race to the finish if you need to. The Porsche is in a similar situation. Matthew Jaminet behind the wheel there. They're 28 seconds behind. We know Matt Campbell will finish for them. I, I enjoyed knowing the finishing drivers this far out from the end. Yeah, yeah. They've unraveled most of them. So it gives us an example of where people are going to be. So Dries behind the wheel, Ventor behind the wheel of car 32. They're another 18 seconds further down the road from the Porsche. So at the moment, triple nine... 9, 12 and 75 who are out of sequence for mine are possibly the three favourites and then there's a fight between the BMWs and possibly Maxi Goats for the final step on the podium but that's just at this stage there's still 2 hours and 41 minutes to go in this race a whole heap can play out between now and then 245 laps in 9 hours and 18 minutes in the books and we're still seeing fast lap times and fours in this leading group of cars This has been a proper endurance race. I've really enjoyed this, and it's still plenty to play out. It's set it up, set itself up nicely, hasn't it? Yeah, just enough cars on alternate strategies to make it interesting for the final three hours as the 55 yeah. Schumacher Motorsport car heads into the garage. We've got a pet reporter going down there at the moment. Uh, Shea Adam uh, is standing by looking at that car. It didn't sound good last time by get Shea to have a word with the look most local of local teams. Bad news, guys. Reports from Brad Schumacher himself that the car feels like it's dropped a cylinder, so they've taken the engine cover off. They are in the bay now, two mechanics trying to figure out. It does sound a bit wonky, listen in. Yeah, it sounds a bit like a misfire. It's got too much of a rumble to it. So, bad news, because they had turned their day around. Yeah, Shay, they were third in the Boisel Pro M class. Oh, that's, the, that's the telltale sign, oh, just yeah. the uh, universal signal to switch it off. V9 just doesn't sound anywhere near as pleasant oh, as the V10, no. does it? No, no. what do you have? Shut no, it down, no. guys. Might be just something as simple as a coil pack on yeah, that. Yeah. All of the cylinders have individual that's... coil packs nowadays, but. Try and isolate that, thanks very much. Not like the old days when you just used to put something metal on it and see if you got a, a shock, because one of the plug leads had gone. Grab hold of the plug leads and find out which one was off. And we'll start pulling them off. Pretty complicated back there in the engine bit. I think we can say that uh, our Chad has not been their lucky charm this weekend. No, definitely won't run the Chad sticker on the rear wing of that car Aww. next time it makes its way out. Team taking the opportunity to fix another, some other issues on the car, just fixing up the rear wing end plate on one side as the rest of the crew attend to the engine. A mid-mounted V10 engine, so it's actually buried quite deep yeah. in the engine bay at the back of the car. So you can see the crew actually in on top of the rear of the car. It's the best way to work on it. And I'm wondering whether they just think it's a sensor or something like that that they can get to either replace or it might be as simple as just reconnect. Uh, Nowadays, racing, I mean, in the old days, you had half a chance of chasing something down if it was a bit of woofy carburetor or something like that. Nowadays, so much electronics on there. First thing you do is turn it off and on. Then you do the old three-fingered salute, control, on, delete. 
latest thing I think he had under that is change the steering wheel, see if that makes a difference. And then after that, if you've got to put the computer on it, then you know you're going to be in for a little while. Leader of the race on screen right now, continuing on. This car been largely untroubled throughout the course of the day. There was a bit of a wonky strategy move early where they went one lap off sequence with the majority of the field and found themselves with poor track position. They battled their way back at very good speed, very good strategy. Currently enjoy a 26 second lead over Matthew Jimenez in the Mante Racing Porsche. They were quite lucky actually on that Garth, weren't they? Because it was a mistake and, you know, Maro admitted to that when he came in here. But they only dropped down to fifth and they didn't lose the lead lap because it was under a safety car. And so they were able to use that as a springboard and start again. At that point, V1 of the strategy gets ripped up and thrown in the bin or crumpled up and a three-pointer from the back of the garage. And then they've worked their way back and they've been very canny to work through the fuel save and got that car, Creelsey, right back into it in terms of picking off a few places where they could by, again, staying less time in the pit lane as the WRT team are getting set up. We're hearing it could be car 46 in pit lane. And it's Augusto Farfus behind the wheel, speedy Brazilian driver. So Maxime Martin will jump back behind the wheel of this car. They're still on the lead lap. They're in fifth position. They're a minute and eight seconds behind the lead. Augusto's been in for 27 laps. It's been a really solid stint from him. So we heard from Valentino Rossi, really strong double stint early on. Average low 205s and was near as makes no difference as quick as all of the pros that were around him throughout much of his stint. And he's left it up to the two full-time professional sports car racers to do the bulk of the heavy lifting on the run home. Big in lap, don't they? Yeah. It, it is important. In the lane. And Lucas Stoltz was so close behind that he's actually already overtaken him. So that had been a good, very good battle as the number 46 WRT. This is the white BMW with the M Sport stripes comes on the pit lane. In very early, gentlemen, as you might notice. Uh, well, not very early, but still earlier than it should have been. Augusto Farfus is getting out. Maxime Martin is getting in while the refueling goes on. But you might notice there are those dreaded dolly skates to take the car back into the garage. The scrutineers have deemed that the rear taillights are not working. And so the car must be repaired out on the track at, well, before it can go back out on the track, if you see what I mean there. So the rear taillights are covered by the suit in effect which has come out of the back of the car and now Maxime Martin being told to wait patiently they put the car up on the air jacks they're going to roll it back into the garage clean it off reconnect a plug and then it'll go back out on the track to finish this race but this takes them out of a podium finish of which they were firmly in contention that's the Garth Panda spray that he's been talking about all day long and it's it's gone a step too far it's a fair rule we do need to have working car lights and brake lights visible at all times so uh, technical officials have deemed that that needs to be repaired and you, to do that, as we've seen with Triple Eight, you need to do that in the garage. They are the last, the last car on the lead lap. Um, Nicky Katzberg will just go through and take the position. The number 77 It's the AMG, another AMG. A fair fleet of them here yeah. this weekend, isn't there? Plenty of AMGs, and they're all running towards the front of the field. This battle for position, Dries Van Poel and Lucas Stolz. I don't think Dries needs to be too concerned about the AMG behind, because he's only five or six laps away from the stop. Let's quick fix. Four kicks back into the lane. Everyone clear, fires up, and away they go. Lincoln with red tail light in the middle is the rain light, which I think also comes on when they're on the pit lane limiter, doesn't it? I noticed that earlier on. So, as Richard mentioned earlier, this four position, but Stoltz has plenty of speed over Dries Van Thor at this phase of the stint. So, 
So the 75 Sun Energy AMG, as we said, for the last four or five hours running off strategy to the leader, Raffaello Marciello in the Grupa M AMG. As the race has progressed and the temperatures have risen, the BMWs have just slipped off the pace. They were right there in the early phase and they were looking very strong by their own admission. The car has lost performance in the heat of the day. First time that car has been to Mount Panorama though, so very much gather a huge amount of information for their next assault on the mountain. BMW's had a huge amount of success here at Bathurst. They're very proud of that and they'll want to continue that in the GT3 era. I, I still think this is a fascinating strategic battle at the front of the field. And I'm not sure if even the teams involved, Garth, know whether they've got it right yet. In some respects, the top three have played what you might say standard strategy yeah, yeah. on this. They've, they've stopped at the times that they stopped, that they've needed to stop if they've been green or they've taken the opportunity under the AMG safety car to come in. The first car that's off that, we've been talking about it a lot, the Sun Energy one, number 75. They went to a different strategy to give themselves a little more flexibility in the back end of the race when they put Kenny Hubble back in all those hours ago to do a little more time uh, at the back end of the safety car lap, when they, at the safety car period, when they knew it was going to be quite a long and complicated cleanup. They've been down the pit lane at least two or three times more than anybody around them, but that hasn't seemed to be a massive disadvantage. They've given themselves something different. They've given themselves an opportunity to fight back. And now Lucas Stoltz has got pace. He's got right in front of him, the third place, Chris Van Tour. And this is a battle on pace now, not strategy. So they've had both in spades today. Well, it's 11 stops for the 75 car yeah. versus seven for the car in front of it, the BMW. So they certainly have got their money's worth coming down pit lane today so far. I still feel like there's too many sliding doors to go, too many moving parts in the rest of this race, the remaining two and a half hours before we can be definitive about which strategy is going to be the, the winning strategy, whether the line and length, the par strategy, if you like, the first three cars are running, or the off strategy that Lucas Stoltz and the Craft Bamboo AMG of Nicky Katzberg are running as well. Now, I still think, to follow on my wonky test match analogy early on, I still think there'll be a moment where it's the final overs and all the batsmen are up around the... All the fielders are up around the batsmen trying to block it out. At least we won't have to get the late metres out no, this year. Uh, no, exactly right. So I, I think there's still some marginal stuff to come from cars that are going to be really close to doing it. 75 is one of them. I, I hope after such a great race and such a great tactical race and such a quick race that this is decided by a bit of brilliance rather than a mistake. I, 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 it could be either. People are going to get tired. Drivers are going to be tired. The Garth talked about this right at the beginning, and, and we, we have to mention this again. The track is actually getting narrower. Uh, it isn't, of course, in reality, the white lines don't move, but the bit that you can use at certain parts of the track here now, Garth, is probably one, one and a half cars wide. Yeah, the marble's offline. Turn two, where we are exiting right now, is a classic example for that. You can't run side by side no. through the majority of the circuit, so if you're going to make a move, it needs to be definitive. You need to get it in and get it stuck and get the job done. And if you're on the outside, you need to make a decision. Do you hang in? and go for gold glory, or do you succeed or cede your position yeah. and fall in behind and maybe try and fight back in another position of the circuit? So there's those sorts of things, and it's a great great way to explain it. The racetrack does get narrower, so your, your opportunities become less as a passing opportunity, but also it's easier to make a mistake, and that's what happens late in these races. We see it in the 1,000, right. and we see it here in the 12-hour. Mistakes happen in the last phase of the race because the playing surface becomes trickier. Yeah, and, and smaller mistakes have bigger consequences. You know, if you've been half a car's width offline and missed an apex in the first hour of the race, you probably wouldn't have even noticed it. At this stage of the race, that could put you in the face. Yes, that's correct. We saw graphically with Shane Van Gisbergen earlier oh. when he got offline and picked up marbles and junk on his tyres, it took laps 
to recover after that. So if you survive going offline yeah. and don't end up in the wall or in the gravel trap, you lose speed and it takes laps to recover that. So there's still plenty of two and a half hours to go. There's still plenty to play out here. Two and a half hours is the maximum uh, continuous driving time. So if you've got a driver who's had his hours rest, you are now in the window, Krilzy. You don't have, I mean, you don't want to mess up what you're doing now, but you are now into that window if your final driver has had his rest and he's ready to go. And, and that will be a, a deep breath moment for Sun Energy One because that's what they need to worry about for A. Lucas Stoles and then Jules Gunon at the end of the race. But they've still got a little bit more to go before they can get Jules in the car with the two hours and 24 minutes he's got left Correct. to complete the race. Well, it's not far away. I uh, wanted to touch on this car. It's the Mark Cars Australia entry. Uh, Jeff Taunton took over this enterprise that was set up by Ryan McLeod. These cars made their debut here at Mount Panorama in 2015 and they've become a staple of this place running in the invitational class. This is the first year in four that we've seen the Mark 1, the first generation cars run. They're built to be endurance specialist race cars. And this team have been through the ringer. We, we need to send a shout out first and foremost to Keith Kasuki, who is doing well, we're told, and feeling a lot better after a big crash earlier in the weekend down at the chase. They have, I believe a braking issue going up the hill and it had quite a heavy impact just in front of the ridges there. So unfortunately that Mark 2 entry never made the start of the race but Keith is okay and the car safety systems did its job. This second car have been working hard for charity and right now they're on course for a good result in the invitational class. In fact, they'll win it by being the only ones to get to the line if they do indeed get there. It's Grant Donaldson behind the wheel, Darren Curry and Jeff Ta uh, Taunton himself have been uh, working hard. They're about to be mobbed by BMW across the top. But if you have a look at the roof of that car, there's uh, Valentino Rossi's excited face and the doctor logo and at the conclusion of the race and there's still a couple of hours to jump online and bid for this it's been signed by all the drivers in the field including valentino rossi i'm sure we can get garth to sign it for you as well as around a thousand champ uh it will be auctioned off so they're going to take the roof off the car and give it to whoever wins the auction as the prize uh jump on to their website it's linked through the bathurst 12 hour social channels uh, over the course of the weekend. So jump on there. All the proceeds will go towards the official charity of our event, the Ronald McDonald House Charities. It's a great cause. Uh, Pirelli have donated one of Valentino Rossi's race-used tyres from today to go into that as well. Really good cause. Jump online and uh, you literally win a roof of a racing car that raced at Mount Panorama. And uh, I think that's very cool. Well done to the Mark Cars Australia team. They're raising the roof on charitable donations at Mount Panorama. Group of M Racing lead the race. Last couple of rounds of pit stops yet to come on the mountain. We were musing, by the way, why, why Valentino Rossi was called the Doctor. And I just accepted that and never thought about it. Now, there's a couple of different... Um, look it up there's a couple of different explanations to that uh, one that he uh, earned a degree back in Italy and therefore has the right to call himself a doctor um, which is fine I quite like that um, the other is that he adopted the nickname uh, himself um, because uh, it's uh, it, uh, the doctor, because I don't think there's a particular reason, but it's beautiful and it's important. And in Italy, the doctor is a name you give to someone for, to, for respect. It's very important. Uh, however, Rossi has all often said that uh, the name arrived at, uh, the, the doctor nickname that he arrived at, is because Rossi is a common surname for doctors. So, take your pick. All, all of those have potential, knowing the character that Valentino Rossi exactly. is. Yeah. I don't think they'd ever know the truth, to no. be honest. And even if he did know the truth, he'd make up another story just to throw you off it. Here is the number 32 WRT BMW. With two hours and 24 minutes on the clock and things beginning to pick up intensity. 
down in the pit lane. Driver changes will be going on. Krilzy has been tracking this very carefully. Just now. slowly moving towards the edge of his seat. <laughs> yeah, as absolutely. As, as we get closer to the end of this yeah, one, he's slowly, slowly moving towards the edge of his seat. He'll be standing for the last hour with our Richard Crail. 24 AMG Mercedes. Jordan Love at the wheel at the moment in the lane. Currently 11th as... The fourth place BMW M4. Dries Van Thor heads back out. That's Fatsu that brought it in. Yeah, curious just to know who's going back out. I saw Dries getting out of the car, but I have to say, I couldn't quite see who got into it. So we'll find that when it goes out of the pit lane. And 32 is shown from the Linda now behind the wheel of that car. Now, if he's got the time left in the bank, he can go from here in terms of continuous driving time, Krills. There is another consideration that no driver can do more than three hours, 40 minutes, as in comes in total throughout the race. 340 minutes. It's 340 minutes, sorry. Three, four, Which is five and a half hours. Five and a half hours. So, okay, yeah, that should be that, all right with us. Yeah, they'll never get close to that. Mara Engel's done 400... 440 minutes from this point. So, uh, yeah, I think they're pretty good with that. And you're right, with uh, the amount of time they've got to go, they can get there. Uh, speaking of getting there, you better get to Newcastle. It's not that far away. The opening round of the Supercars Championship here in New South Wales. Supercars will hit the streets of Newcastle next month in a much-anticipated return to the Supercars calendar. If past events are anything to go by, you won't want to miss this. They've hit all the way up the hill. Ricky's out of business. He's on the road. Tickets are on sale at ticketech.com.au and all the action is live right here. New starts now, the new era for supercars starts on the streets of Newcastle. You can get your tickets at Ticketek, March 10th to 12th. It's not that long away. Uh, as all of the supercar teams know, they're flat out getting ready for this. An exciting new era. Can anyone beat that man on the right is the big question mark. Find out. It all starts in five weeks' time. Cannot wait to get there. Let's go back down to the lane. Here's Shay Adam. It's a very rare opportunity when you get the opportunity to talk to the driver right before he gets in for this final stint. Jewel, just a quick word. How are you feeling before you begin your final stint where you could win your third consecutive Bathurst 12 hour? Yeah, I feel good. Uh, it's definitely very hot today. Already uh, with uh, Luca, we drove quite a bit. So now it's going to be the last two hours. But when you train during the winter, it's for those moments. So I feel really good and really hungry for going full, full attack. Good luck. Thank you. The intensity is real, guys. Oh, is it ever? Thanks to George, who's tweeted in from Italy, hashtag B12HR. In, in Italy, someone who knows his job really well is called a doctor of his craft. And that, That's he cool. says, that is the reason. That, that, I like that, that George. That sounds fair. Love it. OK, guys, we're not too far away from the next round of pit stops starting here, and that does include the leader at the race at the moment, Raffaello Marcello. So let's try and break down exactly who the contenders are as we approach the end of the motor race. Now, we've pretty much worked out that there's either two stops for some of the drivers left or one stop for some of those drivers left, and we know roughly who we can expect to see in the car at the end. So, guys, let's work through the top five in the field, and we'll talk together here and see if we can sort of come up with a bit of a guess as to who's going to finish the car. We'll start with the 75 uh, boys in the booth. We know that Kenny has pretty much done his work early. We know that Luca is in the middle of a stint right now, and he's pretty much good to hand that over as we speak because we are past the two-hour 24 to go mark. So, guys, I'm sure we all agree, Jules Gunon is going to be the boy Correct. in that car to finish that race. Super. Yep. yep, absolutely. OK, well, let's go across and see how that's shaping at the moment. So they're about mm, getting to about th lap 308. So they'll have the better part of eight to nine laps of a short uh, splash and go to do at the end of the race at this stage. Uh, this is an interesting one. Mario Engels used up all his driver time. Grenier's got a single stint left. Marcello's in the car right now. He's about, she, he'd have to be imminent, a lap or two at most from pitting, and he's going to get out of that car. The interesting thing about this strategy, guys, a single for Grenier, and then 
Rafa is going to have just a single stint at the end of the race. Now, that's good news in terms of keeping him fresh, but it's going to be a very, as we get Stoltz in pit lane right now, actually, a very rapid pit stop to get that driver change done at the end of the race. We'll quickly move on through. Uh, we know that we're expecting Matt Campbell at the end of the race. Prining's done his lap, so Jaminet is out there. Uh, is he back in that car, guys, with Jaminet, or did we see him get out of the car? Uh, no, Matty no, Campbell's out, out there, yeah. Matty Campbell's out. So, Campbell in. Yeah, so Campbell's doing a double. So you see what I mean? We're going to have Marcello with a single up against Campbell with a, a double at the end of this race. So at least in terms of fatigue and keeping the driver fresh, you'd have to score that advantage to the triple nine, yeah? Yeah, totally. So All the right. Porsche's got one stop to go, don't Porsche's they? Porsche's got so, one to go. Yeah. yeah, they can't get home on here. They're probably going to come in around lap 280-ish. It'll be... They can make it on uh, one stop, though. I think they're in about lap 290 off the top of my head. Uh, Van Gisbergen, Feeney and Gertz. It's not really worked out for them since they got that penalty. It's been a very strange day for Shane Van Gisbergen. I think he's done for the day. He nearly did three and a half hours. He can do four hours... Uh, five hours... What is it? Five 40. hours 40. Yeah, so yeah. it's just... I don't know what's going on with SVG this weekend, but it's been a strange one, put it that way. Uh, we do know that Brock Feeney's going to finish in that car. Maxi Gertz is out there at the moment, and he's actually in the lane right now by the looks of that. So they'll be handing the triple eight over to Feeney, and that'll be a double for Feeney at the end. So that's going to test him. He did a double earlier in the day. Uh, this is an interesting one, guys. I'll be honest, I haven't been keeping too much of an eye on the 77. It's been flying under the radar. We've got Nicky Katzberg in there at the moment, but would you say that's the gun that they're going to plug in at the end? Your Cadella. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. We'll see they're, where they pop um, out. They're a lap back, Chad. I, yeah. I think they're out of the mix, unfortunately. As are these guys now yep. as well. But I just wanted to give them a special shout out because I know a lot of people will be wanting to know where does Rossi stand. They were on for a podium until they had that brake light issue. Uh, but we've still got Augusto Farfus to try and get that car back up. And we'll see how we go. If they get some wave arounds and things work out their way with multiple safety cars. And the other guy that's doing a really good job right now, we know that Vanderlinder is in that car and Sheldon is expected to double stint. So long story short, the guys who are currently first and second in the race have this many stops left. The guys below them have that many stops left. Those with two stops are going to have a very short stop for that last stop. Ah. And for the Porsche, it's going to be slightly longer. Well, here is the triple nine in the lane right now. So that will affect exactly the strategy that Chad was talking about. So Marcello, Raffaella Marcello, in on lap number 258. It's taken him 26 seconds from pit in to get to his pits. The fuel hose goes on on the left-hand side as of the rear of the car. And no driver change, guys. Uh, zero driver change. No driver here. change. So we were expecting here that Grenier would jump into a 60-minute stint to fulfil the requirement that Marchiello had to be out of the car for 60 minutes as a minimum and then get back in and finish it. Yeah. But that has to happen by doing a driver change right here, right now. So... Well, unless they're content with Grenier's ability to finish, finish the race. race. Yeah, that might be it. That could be it. Yeah. It's a big roll of the dice for someone who's never been here before. Still going on hydrating. He's just waiting for his opportunity to shine, isn't he? So they're still... I, I can't see this strategy for Sun 75 working. I, I think, like Chad said, they're going to have to have that splash, and I don't know if they'll have the track position enough to make it without losing the lead. So fuel and tyres for Marciello. No driver change. He's back on his way. Fuel and tyres. It took tyres as well, didn't oh, they? 1 minute 21 in the lane, so right. they, they want to have for that. They would have, should have lane. taken yeah. tyres and fuel for that lane pit lane time. We'll get the team down in the lane to chase that one because it's probably a reasonable, important story as to why they didn't change drivers, given that's exactly what we thought. And the, the PR that we've been talking about from the team themselves, unless they've been leading us up the well, They started yesterday with that. Maro Engel told us that yeah. it was highly likely that Raffaello Marcello would be finishing this race. So 21 laps into this stint for Lucas Stoles. We know Jules Gunon will finish this, and he will be fine to get to the end on driver time. That won't be a drama. Nine hours and 45 minutes in. This is all starting to become a little bit clearer now as to who can get there. It's certainly, well, it was. it's clear on fuel for the 999. Not so much on driver. driver it's clear on 9-12. Yeah. Yeah. They're good to go to the end now. One more pit stop for the Porsche. They're home. No problem. So they're the first one that we've got a really clear example of. And then there's one more pit stop for the 32 BMW that currently sits in fourth place on the road. Sheldon Vanderlind is in. 
He's already been in the car for a stint, so I imagine, I wonder if Dries Vantor goes on it. Did he just jump in that car? Uh, yes, uh, Van Der Linde did. So Van Der Linde will double stint to the yes, end of the race correct, as well. That's correct. So the 912 Porsche is good. Good to go. One more pit stop, fill it up with juice, throw some new Pirellis at it, full send. So too for the 32 BMW. Well, do Porsche throw some new Pirellis at it. They just took tyres at that previous stop. So do you get yourself a bit of track position? In the Save last pit stop, 10 seconds Matt worth of Campbell part told us, you put me in front of those Mercedes and they will not find a way past me. That could be the way to do it. Yeah. Chad made the point earlier that I don't know that we've seen everything that this Porsche has to offer. I'd buy that. With pace, fuel economy, tyre life and everything. And we have heard from Matt Campbell through the day saying we're sticking to our plan. We're not. We're driving exactly how we want to drive the car right now. Correct. So I just wonder, and you need some serious restraint to do it, to hold back for 10 hours of racing. Yep. Keep holding back, keep holding back. Do not show your hand and lay it on the line at the end. What was it that you said right at the beginning when we were assessing the cars, Garth? You said, you know, BMW is fast in a straight line. Uh, Audi's good across the top. The Mercs have got a serious amount of grunt, but the Porsches just do everything well. They're the, they're, I think at Bathurst, in this current specification, they're the best all-round car. You but said that right. You said that 11 and a half hours ago. I just feel like hours. that's the best all-round package for this circuit. All the other cars have genuine strengths and weaknesses at various points on this circuit, whereas the Porsche is probably 80% of everything. Yeah, whereas the Audi's 100% across the top, but struggles with torque off the corner. The Mercedes, great torque off the corner, but maybe not the top speed or not quite the, the ultimate performance across the top. I just feel like the Porsche, for the last couple of years, has been the most rounded car here at Mount Panorama. You throw the keys to Matt Campbell Stop. in the last two hours of the race. Tell him, dangle a carrot in front of him, say there's another Bathurst 12-hour trophy just up the road. Go get it, son. Yeah. It's also a car that Manti and the drivers know very, very well indeed. It's coming to the end of its development. The car's been superseded. The new model's already out. They want to send the 991.2 GT3R with another big international victory. The, the 991 body shape has done such good work for Porsche in Carrera Cup, in GT at Le Mans and in the World Endurance Championship the IMSA. One more dash for that car. There's a little bit more energy about this car at the moment as well, just in the way it's starting to move around. And Matt starting to hustle. I'll tell you what the lap time is. It's a 234, so Took that's a hustling. Took yeah. a second out of Marcello on that lap. The, the, the other point I'll make, of the contenders, I don't think the BMW's got the raw speed in these conditions to go with the Mercedes. I reckon this is the only car that can trouble the 75 and the 999 on raw, outright lap speed at this in this part of the race. It was 9 o'clock this morning, I would have backed the BMWs in. Yep. They were really quick. They had the same level of single lap pace as anything around them, but right now, I think the Porsche is the only thing that can hold a candle to the 75 and the 999. Rich, you mentioned that this car's got a very different attitude about it. And we only had to go through one braking zone at the end of Mountain Straight, and it told me straight away they've shelved the fuel saving. <laughs> it's right. maximum attack time now. So they've been playing a very smart game. At, look, at the honest, let's be honest, they're a minute behind the leader of the race, and they're 30 seconds behind the car they're on the same strategy with. But you get that late race safety car, and this car is well in the game. But they've still got a stop to go yep. where they could make up some time. That's correct, because they've been so fast in pit lane over the course of the day. There's three laps between them in stops. Porsche could probably go three laps longer, potentially, than Marciello. It could be a case of who blinks first uh, as to whether you put tyres on or not. So if the Porsche pits first and doesn't put tyres on, triple nine, mirror that and just keep the track position. But if triple nine pits, the Porsche could then go, right, we're going to roll the dice and not put tyres on in our final pit stop. That could be an advantage they're looking for. He's doing a lap time check on this current lap. Previous lap for Lucas Stoltz, a 3.6. Previous lap for Raffaello Marcello in second, a 3.4. Matt Campbell 
on his way the previous lap that he completed he's still to complete the current lap with a three five here he comes three four very very close at the top of the field and all those lap times that you're looking at at the moment are within a second or so of the best laps that those cars, the best laps that those cars have put in. So things are waking up here, still just over two hours. Two hours and eight minutes to go in four, three, two, one. And now the race is coming alive. They've not exactly been cruising all this time. That's not fair to say that but they've been working themselves into a position from where they can launch in to the last couple of pit stops. And we're down to the last, well, single pit stop for most of them now. Who's got tyres left? You'll have tried to save a set of tyres. Here's a brand new sticker set of Pirelli's going on to, is that the Ben car coming in, the 777? Yes, it was. Ricardo fell out, Chris Meese will, should jump in that car for the end and we'll get some brand new tyres for his troubles. Hi Chris, So Here, there, there's here's the car, here's yeah. some new Pirellis. Oh, We're going to fill you up, can you turn it up to 11 you. please? So there now focus will be winning the Boisel Pro Am class. Yeah, the race within a race, they're 1.8 laps behind the outright lead and they're running out of time. We've got an hour and six minutes before the opportunity for a race by to get back onto the lead lap end. Uh, at the, after the 11th hour of the race, into the final hour, you have to drive to a pit lane to get out of the way of the cars that are fighting for the lead. You don't get your lap back. So they're running out of time to engineer themselves back onto the lead lap. So right now, it's just go as quickly as you can, focus on the class victory. Still can stand on the top step of the podium at Mount Panorama. And that'll be a result for Yasser Shahin. Put this team together, Hattie Sport Customer Racing Australia. So right now they're battling the Pro-Am, the 65 of Mostert, Talbot and Ross in ninth position. But the fair amount of track position between them and a pit stop now as well. So these guys looking pretty good for class victory, but still two hours and six to go a long way. Keep in mind, the longest domestic GT race in Australia last year was three hours outside of the 12 hour. Here's Daniel Gaunt. Congratulations to young Dutchman Lawrence Van Hoopen who won the NZGP not too long ago over at Hampton Downs. Daniel Gaunt won the NZGP on two occasions in the past. The few races to hold the title of Grand Prix without it being around at the Formula One World Championship, one of only two. The leader in the lane, Lucas Stolz pits. And a critical moment for this team as they set themselves up for the run to the flag. Penultimate pit stop for the leader of the race. Marcello makes his way through turn one as Jules Gunon climbs aboard the 75 Sun Energy AMG Mercedes. We expect that this is the second last stop for this car. Remember, this car had some overheating issues earlier today. Car controller. <laughs> Just checking the front grille, making sure that's okay. Tyres going on now for Jules Gounon. I wonder whether also they just take tyres in this stop and then that gives you the flexibility as to whether you want to take tyres in the last stop and go for ultimate speed or don't take tyres in the last stop and try and get some track position if that's what you need to get into the lead of the race ahead of the final hour. We're in New South Wales, that's Sydney Harbour, the world's great natural harbours. And this city is an amazing place to visit. Bridge, the Opera House, all the historic buildings and all the amazing things to see and do every time you come to this place. And uh, that's what you see when you fly in and then jump over the Blue Mountains to come to Mount Panorama. Spares Box highlights.
As we work our way into the final two hours, she's been a bruising affair, a fast affair, with long green flag runs, the highlight of a day that's claimed some victims on the mountain. The Grove Porsche was out early. It seems like an age ago at times, the Adrian Dietz Lamborghini had a pretty brutal run for an hour there, and unfortunately, they were out of the race after just 70 laps. The young gun, Aaron Cameron, who will race S5000 open wheelers this year in 21st position and out of the race, 89 laps in with a big crash down at the Dipper. 47 super run cars involved in that as well. And then massive one for Scott Taylor, similar location, this time went in side on. That team having raised a heap of cash for charity this weekend. Pit stops, strategy have been the feature. And all through it all, this car has done a bulk of the leading with Raffaele Marciello behind the wheel, Mauro Engel having driven so well and Bathurst rookie Mick Grenier doing a really nice job on his debut. Still question marks over their strategy. This is how the class leaderboard looks with the Pro-Am class going the way at this point of the 777, the Bend Motorsport Park entry. And the Audi also leads the way in the silver class with Daniel Gaunt behind the wheel there, 12th outright for International Motorsport. And Mark Cars Australia Cars up to 18th leading invitational. We've just seen the 75 pit. So they are out of sequence with the other leaders. We're expecting stops at about the 10 hour 20, 10 hour 30 mark to get them to the end, if not a little bit later on. So Mercedes AMG, Porsche, BMW with Team WRT still in the mix. Let's see where your favorite driver stands. Quiet day for the Hallmark Property Group crew. They're running around in 13th place. Mark Sini, Lee Holmesworth and Dean Fiore. Lee is behind the wheel of that car at the moment. They're in the Pro-Am class and running fifth in category. So that's how things shape up right now. Just over two hours to go at Mount Panorama. That 30 seconds at the front of the field, of course, as we've been seeing, can disappear in a moment or two. Let's uh, head down the pit lane where Chad's crunching some more numbers. Chad, what do you got for us? Well, now that we've had that 75 in and they've uh, made that driver change over to Gunon, we now have a bit of an idea presuming that they all did take on a full tank of fuel as to when this last round of pit stops may happen. So well may the mechanics just get a little bit of shut-eye because we're not too far away from really the climactic finish that we all wanted to see here. So as it stands, the race leader, how are they looking at the moment? Yes, g'day, g'day, car triple nine. I think we can expect them in around lap 295, guys. Now this is, again, if, they, if they're if they going to run 37 laps since that last pit stop, which is the longest that they've really got out of a green flag run, so, presuming that they did fill it up, I think Triple Nine's going to come in somewhere around the 295 mark. The big surprise there was that they didn't do the driver change on that last stop. That means they have to do a driver change on their last stop. And I kind of feel that means that they'll make it very hard to not do tyres as well, because right. they're going to be triple standing tyres to the finish. Plus, trying to do a driver change on fuel only would be too stressful. So, fuel, tyres and driver change. So, they got one big long stop coming up, in other words. Now, we go back to car 912 as the Valente Rossi team come on in. Uh, I've got them coming in about lap 290. So I think they'll be the first in. They were the first to pit in that last round of pit stops. I think it'll be the same again, unless they've been, as Garth Tander was maybe talking about earlier, they've been keeping an ace up their sleeve for a little bit more fuel mileage towards the end of the race that we didn't know about. We'll have to wait and see. They will have the opportunity to roll the dice on taking tyres only, knowing that the 999 will have to take tyres, surely, at that last stop. And that leaves us with car 75 who is currently sitting third. They've, of course, got one more stop left. We can expect Gunon to finish that race in that car. If they took on a fuel tank, uh, a full fuel tank at that last stop, they get to lap 300. So every five laps, 290, 295 and 300. Now, they'll obviously be taking fuel only because that is really a splash and dash IndyCar style to the finish. And Chad, on current numbers, 316, 317, looking likely for total race distance. So they, they'll need to put essentially a 16 lap, 17 lap fuel load in that car. So the cool thing about it, you've got three guys in contention and the order of the race that they sit on is how they will have the length of their pit stops. So the leader has the longest stop, the guy in second has the shortest stop and the guy in third has the shortest stop of all of them. It's like a golf handicap. Yeah, so it, it actually plays out beautifully for us. The big thing is that 30 second gap, there's just no substitute uh, for pace, is there? So the fact that they've got a 30 second lead right now with this car is the ultimate hand. 
Uh, they want this to run green to the finish. A safety car would sure, well, to be honest, we'll just throw all those numbers out that I just came up with. If you're over in Europe listening and watching or in the US, uh, congratulations if you stayed with us in the UK or Europe. What is it? Uh, 4.45 in the morning on uh, a Sunday morning there. 5.45 in Europe. Thanks for staying with us. Don't go anywhere yet. Get yourself coffeeed up or some beverage of some description, like Chris Suku, who is uh, putting on the coffee and making breakfast. So he doesn't want to miss a further minute of the race. I think that's smart, Shea, don't you? I think it's wonderful, and it's a great idea to find a comfy place to sit and watch the race, too. And uh, that's exactly what Luca Stoltz has done. Luca, that was a very long stint for you in the peak heat of the day. How tired are you? It's still OK. Uh, our Mercedes AMG is quite cool inside, so uh, I'm actually still quite relaxed. and. Uh, yeah, I was actually hoping to get another set of tires to catch a little bit of time back. But uh, yeah, now Jules is in the car and uh, yeah, we're still in a fight for the podium. Um, currently, I think we need a yellow uh, to win. But yeah, we are still in the fight. That's you done for today? Yeah, Jules to the end. Are you comfortable with Jules being in the car since you have co-driven with him so many times? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, he's French, but <laughs> I still like him. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, he, he done an awesome job in Daytona recently, and uh, last year did the finish. The, the last two hours, I'm really confident that he, that he can finish the race. Uh, but yeah, I'm always a bit nervous when, when other guys finish the race. So yeah, let's see. Thanks for the comfy seat and the chat. Thank you. In, in Jules Gunn on defence, uh, doesn't he now race under the flag of Andorra? Yes, he does. Yeah, in, in the Pyrenees. So, I uh, uh, that's a bit harsh from Lillo, I thought. <laughs> I thought it was great. Yeah. Just a lap time check on the previous lap for the top three cars. 203-31 for Marciello. 203-32 for Matt Campbell. 203-21 for the 75 car. So, talk about pace at the front. They're all doing exactly the same pace. 30 seconds between first to second, a further 13 seconds between second and third. So, you heard Lucas Stoltz say there, we need a safety car, he's right, they do. Yeah, it's that, they're 16 laps short, basically. If this, if this was a, a Bathurst 1000, they haven't got quite to that magic lap 132 number you need to get to make it to the end. So, that's that 20 minutes we've been talking about for the last couple of hours, they're just slightly short. Uh, if you're a BMW fan, and I'm sure there are many, like, given who's driving them, and there's they've got great heritage here at Mount Panorama. The, the 32 car with Shelton van der Linde behind the wheel, 49 seconds off the lead at the moment. They're basically on the same pit stop strategy as the Porsche. Probably not quite the same economy, but it's a lap or two the difference. Their issue is they're a further 19 seconds down the road, but... They're on the lead lap, and they're only 50 seconds off the lead, so I don't think we can rule them out no. by any extent. Certainly for podium, and then if the 75 has to make, when they have to make at this point, that last pit stop on lap 300, then it could be a battle for third place between them and that BMW, and there could be a track position advantage potentially for the BMW. So that will be worth following between those two. The full arm class, eighth, ninth, uh, and 10th and 11th, actually, at the, at the top four there. Uh, Chris Bates leads that for the 777 car. Uh, and he is just under a minute ahead of Chas Mostert in the number 65 car, which has been there or thereabouts in that category all day. And uh, a further 1 minute 15 seconds back, Jamie Winkup's now been plugged into the number 99. The boost mobile AMG, the uh, black and dark red car. That's the battle there for the top three. David Reynolds is a couple of laps further back from that, so it's unlikely to be able to pull that back on pace. But that doesn't mean that some kind of incident could. Still an hour and 54 to go. Yeah. I should be Richie Stanaway in that 99 uh, car for the end. Yeah, I would have thought. So, uh, Mies Most at Stanaway, it's a growling TV show of mine watching. He's pretty feisty in the battle for Pro-Am at the finish. Mies has got the upper hand at the moment in the 77. Currently enjoying fairly lengthy green flag period 
<laughs> through this phase of the race. Hey, I'm just trying to drum up a bit of business here. Uh, but where I was getting was we have 53 minutes left of wave around time. Yes, that's the a good race. point. That is a good so point. So if we are going to have a safety car that has the potential to bring some more players back in the game, that safety car does need to fall before one hour to go left yeah. in this race. Yeah, very good point, Garth. Richard Creel, Garth Tander, and then John Heindorf in the booth. It's Chad Barretts and Cher patrolling the pit and the paddock. And all of you keeping your eyes open for us. Thanks for all the tweets. Hashtag B12HR. Been very, very busy. And the international audience, as well as the people here at the track, chirp, chip, chirping in as well. And. Hope you are feeling up to it for this last just under two hour sprint. It's the it's the dash for glory, lads. Here's proof are that you... I've given up on laptops and reverted to the notepad from a strategy point of you've view. You've worn your laptop out today, mate. It's, the, it's the numbers having, you've been running. It's having some issues, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, two hours fifty-two under green now, which eclipses the previous record. Uh, in this race, at least, the longest green flag stint. So it is a long, long haul of green flag running. John, you made mention that the speed is starting to come back into this race. I just noticed Jules Gunon's last lap was a 2.02 set out. Peak lap time for that car was a 2.023 yep. much earlier today. Yes, so half a second away from the best yeah, lap. Jules Gunon starting to do Jules Gunon things in that <laughs> car again. We saw him do this last year in the last stint of the race. Close that gap to the lead down. It was near on 44 seconds, down to 41 seconds. So, still showing good speed in this car. The I know. Last, sorry, uh, the, the last three years of this race, it's been run. So, 2022, 20, and 19. The fastest laps of the race have been set in 2019 on lap 300. Yeah. Lap 2022, 305 laps in. That was Kelvin van der Linde being angry at the end. Remember that? Yeah, I do. Uh, and last year, 256. So to reiterate, going on to previous lap now, 2026. Yeah, though he's slowly making his way back down. Current fastest lap of the race is actually Chaz Mostyn. Yeah, 2021, back on lap 170. So getting back towards the peak speed for this particular car is going on the quickest race lap in the 12 hours GT3 history. So the pace today, just echoing how quick this race has been. And just to reiterate, 314 laps, 1,950 kilometres, the lap and distance record here, that was 2020. That race was run at 162 kilometres an hour average over the day. It's the Including third quick... the pit stop. Yeah. The whole race, from start to finish, 100 mile an hour in the old school. It's the third quickest endurance race in the history of this place. All the 1,000s, that was the third quickest race. And I know you'll hate me for saying this, if this goes green towards the end, this oh, will go there's further. There's our safety car. Garth oh, yeah, just said it before, but he gets away with it. I suppose I, it's fair, he's no, won I'm back sorry. five times. No, he's I allowed, did pull yeah. up a bonnet. I did pull up a bonnet. He's won it, so he speaks for some credibility. If it goes anyway, green. It's a great start. If it goes green. If it goes green. You were about to see it. Yeah, it, it, it will eclipse that. We'll, All go, right, further we'll go 514 laps. Yeah. I don't think we'll get 2,000. I'm not sure there's enough time left, but uh, it'll be quicker than that. Imagine telling someone even 20 years ago at this place that you would run 12 hours at 100 mile an hour average yeah. for the whole day. Including safety cars, pit yep. stops, the whole shoot and dice. Yep. Yeah, no, you wouldn't have even, probably wouldn't have believed it 10 years ago. Mm shows the speed of these cars, the professionalism of the teams, and the ability for drivers to continually punch out fast lap times. That's been the impressive thing today, is Richard Crail becoming disappointed when we see a 204 lap time. You would have been wrapped five years ago to be in the fours at any stage of the race, lap time-wise. Motorsport family's been tuned in from around the world. Mark Mahi up early. He's been watching from Brisbane. Lucy Hickson, who was uh, Max Martin and manager, team manager, I think, at Le Mans, uh, certainly. And uh, Dries Vantor as well. Drivers tuning in from all over the place as well. This has really caught the imagination. 
Porsche. What have Porsche got left? That gap is not coming down. It's gone out a wee bit. Maybe a second, a second and a half. Yeah, it's been swinging backwards and forwards, hovering between the 30, 31 second. Buffer first to second. Maybe just as they make their way through lap traffic. Yeah. The, thought. Uh, the, the, the lovely thing about not having as many cars as we've had in the past is here, all the cars we've had have been absolute class in terms of teams and driver combos. Also, it means that with a bit of luck, you hope you get less incidents in traffic. But of course, if you're trying to catch somebody, you're hoping for the leader to get, oh, a little bit of a fumble just as they're going through a couple of cars that are battling for position. So what we're seeing here, and I actually really quite like this, we're seeing genuinely the relative performances of these cars and drivers. And it's going down to tenths of seconds here, tenths of seconds there, but when you've had nearly three hours of green flag, of course, that is going to spread through. Yeah, it's proper, he proper heads-up racing. We're not seeing it door handle to door handle, but they are wringing the neck of these yes. cars. They do not have any more performance in them now at this stage of the race. They are giving us everything these cars have because they want to maintain track position. So Marciello wants to maintain his 30-second lead over Matt Campbell. Matt Campbell wants to maintain the 10 seconds over Gilles Gounon because as Chad referenced earlier in the pit stop report, we're expecting that the leader's going to have the longest pit stop, Porsche the second longest pit stop. So we're effectively, like you, it was a great analogy, there's a golf handicap yeah. coming up yeah. to finish this one off. And that will close the gaps up. That's why we're seeing the cars being driven so hard right now. This is the third place Pro-Am car in the pit lane, the Boost Mobile AMG. They can't get to the end from here, so they'll have another run down the pit lane. Looks like uh, Jamie Wincup is staying in the car, and he's going to be offered a new set of Pirelli tyres. They look brand new to me. And just behind, it's the... Nicky Katzberg. Yes, it is. The, the fifth place Bamboo car. fifth place car. So he can't get to the end for no. me either, Garth. No, they can't. So that's interesting because they were running on an alternate strategy, as Craft Bamboo tend to do. Run some pretty adventurous strategies. It worked spectacularly last year. Yeah, they're, they're half an hour short, yeah. basically, to get to the end yeah. from here. They've been a bit of an enigma for mine today. They've been competitive-ish, but not quite enough to be in that leading mix, but they've been better than that group of cars. Come and Doesn't gone, haven't they? Yeah. Definitely come and gone. So that's going to be almost a stint and a half he's got to do on those Pirellis that have just been bolted on to that. I suspect they'll just give him a glug of fuel to get him to the end when he comes in again. It's been a couple of teams like that, though, in fairness, Grillsy. That have been there or thereabouts, but more thereabouts than there, if you <laughs> see, see yeah. what I mean. I'm with uh, Rich, though. I've, I felt like the 77 car was coming and it was playing itself into the race. Just drifted in the last stint, I think, stint and a half. And taking this stop now, however it's played out, will hurt them. Yes, definitely and another is, one to go. It is Dan, Danny Hughes with their head behind the wheel of that car. All the years that I've commentated on uh, Danny, I'd never probably met him and had a chat with him. We put that right on uh, Town to Track earlier this week. And uh, what a smashing lad. Chris Meese still trolling around as well. Ticking off the laps in the 777. That's the first of pro -Am cars, ninth position there. With a minute's gap to Charles Mostert. Cars on screen, Trent Harrison leading David Russell. They are for position on the timing screen, but there's nine laps between them. So, yes, <laughs> even if D Russ does get past Trent Harrison, he will not elevate himself on the timing screen. I saw this car involved with a big moment at the top of the mountain, found itself backwards in the run from Skyline to the Dipper. How it kept going, I don't know. But the team well, how it did job get wiped out by the yeah, following cars, kept, to be honest. Kept it in the game. It's a bit of a meeting of the minds going on at the back of the garage here at Gripper M. Yes. Now, what's going on here? I just heard that Paul Martin, mm. Bathurst 12 hour, that's Paul there with the headset on, 
from the motorsport operations team is down there talking to this team. So He's got a book with him too, so that generally means you're pointing out some sort of ruling. It's Campbell Little as well, part of motorsport operations for the Bathurst 12 hour. Well, that's uh, technical then. Yes, yeah, so little story going on. Maybe some chat up there or Shay. Just when were they last in? Snoop around. So they were last in 15, 15 laps ago. Okay. I wonder if they needed to get a data stick or something like that. That's what that's been done. All of the things that we were talking about earlier on that uh, Motorsport Australia have. Uh, the, the only obvious one, Heidi, is driver time, but three hours 34. That's fine. You, you As in total driver time, driver time yeah. so far for Marcello. I mean, we're just hunching at the moment as to whatever that discussion might be. It's going on, but Mauro Engel was there and he didn't look overly thrilled with what was taking place. Uh, Lucas Stoltz What's that? They've isn't far away. Something, the mechanic has something in his hand here. Don't find out exactly what that is. That's what the discussion looks to be around. There's an awful lot of stuff that is uh, data that's passed backwards and forwards that isn't done in real time, it's done on data sticks and things like that. And so there are sensors, there are bits and pieces in the car that are independent of the uh, manufacturer. Of the yeah. manufacturer. Yeah. 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 So some of those things, they've got to be running. And all the time, yeah, that's all right. All the time. Yep, they're series data loggers, race data loggers, all sorts of systems capturing information. Set, as you say, John, separate to the actual manufacturer systems in the car. Doesn't change anything, the fact that Marciello's still going very quickly. They're at the 3.9, 3 3.95 for Marciello, 3.91 for Matt Campbell, 3.66 for Jules Gounon. So he continues to be the fastest of the top three and just slowly closing that gap down. That gap to lead now for Gounon is 39.8 seconds. Still with an hour and 40 minutes to go in this one. Yeah, that's wiring. That's, that's yeah, definitely a I think it's some sort of logging apart, device. Definitely yeah. a logging device. Yeah, so where there's data not coming out of that car is what I'm hearing. Yeah, oh, really? Different sources up and down the pit lane. Okay. Texting madly to try and find out what's going on. Our team will be there and we'll report that. An unscheduled pit stop at this time when you're in this area, you know, you, you, you do not want an unscheduled pit stop. So what the team will be trying to avoid is the requirement to change out whatever that yes. data capturing device, assuming it is some sort of data capturing device. Con confirmed that yeah. it is a data logger issue that is uh, coming through from a number of sources, as Krillzy has said. Now, whether that is something that can be swapped out, whether it's a card, collection issue or whether that's live data collection because some of these cars have um, the series have um, effectively a, it's not exactly an internet modem but it's something yeah, similar they do. Yeah, and, for and telemetry you, yeah and you get you get uh, at various points around the track it uh, downloads the data in real time And what it does is it has got to transmit, it's got to send that data back to race officials throughout the race. That is a race requirement, it's a race rule. Now the modem that does that has broken down, so what race officials have done is they've given them a fresh modem and it's got to go in at the next pit stop. So it's going to slow up that pit stop, that's what the discussion is about at the moment. But it is a race requirement, they've got to do it guys. Barrett, have they got to come and do that straight away? Or are you no, an extra on, pit stop? On, on the next pit stop right. is fine, yeah. Okay. So it doesn't mess up their strategy, but it does mean they've got an extra bit of work to do, Krilzy. There's a lot of happy people at Manti EMA racing at the moment. <laughs> well, there's still a long way to go. There you don't is. wish ill above no. against your opposition. What they're doing there, to, to steal one of your quotes from today, I loved it, is the team are MacGyvering up <laughs> a way to get this done as quickly as possible. Yeah. And when we were talking about Manti earlier on and how they plan the race, 
I was once, uh, I think it was three, no, it must be four, five years ago at the Nürburgring, 24 hours. And they got clobbered on the formation lap and broke a radiator. Came in on the end of the formation lap at the Nürburgring, 24 hours. And they planned and schemed and had the right strategy, won the race. You know, so you start from the absolute worst part of it, and the car came through to win the race. Timo Bernard was driving the car at that point. Let's uh, go back down to Chad and see what numbers he is looking at at the moment. Ah, well, actually, I'm, I'm talking to the Pirelli guys in the Pirelli pet bunker. How good nice. is that? Because they've been such a big talking point throughout the course of the weekend that I wanted to bring in Matteo Praga from Pirelli Motorsport. He's come all the way from Italy to be here at the 12-hour once again. Great to see you. Everyone's talking about these new tyres, but let's just talk logistics. How many people, how many tyres? Such a big operation to bring all the way down under. Yeah, this year, let's say, Batos is our first event for the GT department. And uh, it's a wake-up call after Christmas break. And it's always a big challenge from a logistic point of view. We bring nearly 2,000 tyres uh, that are shipped from Europe. And uh, we are about 35 people, staff, between fitters, engineer, engineer logistics and marketing. And uh, yeah, it's, it's the first time that we bring a new product that we already tested last year in Europe. And uh, it, it's interesting to see how it behaves in Bathurst. How does Bathurst compare to some of the other tracks that you go to around the world in terms of what the challenge is for the tyre? But the challenges are different because Bathurst is quite unique because you have a, a section that is very fast and uh, is generating not much temperature in the tyres and the mountain that is very twisty and you generate a lot of temperature in the tyre. So you need to find the right balance to have a product that has a wide range of use. And as well, between the morning and the afternoon now, there is a big gap in terms of temperature. So degradation, warm up and everything are, uh, you need to, to manage them differently from the morning to the afternoon. And as well, the product has to cope with these different conditions. A lot of uh, the race fans here are excited to see lap record speed and qualifying. I imagine for Pirelli to bring a new tyre and see those lap times would be just as exciting for you guys too. Yeah, it was exciting. Honestly, we were not expecting to beat the record. We, know, we knew uh, with our references that uh, the new compound uh, had more grip, but we were not sure about the conditions that were ideal for that compound. But yesterday, yes, it was a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> well done with the new tyre. It's very fast on track, very durable in all conditions. Great to have Pirelli's partnership here again at the Liquid Millie Bathurst 12 hour. Thanks, Chad. Massive logistical effort for Pirelli to get tyres into the country to support this race. We thank them for their support. They've been an enormous backer of this race since 2016. Let's go down to Shay. Well, guys, it's looking a little bit better here at Group M. For some reason, the box just happened to come back online. Now, they have not been stood down yet from replacing the box, but they have been told, be ready to do it at the next pit stop should there be another hiccup. But for now, you're back up online. You're OK. Shay, what happens to the data that wasn't being transmitted then? How do they replace that? Is there a data card that will have to be looked at after the race to make sure that none of the parameters that that information um, was relating to, none of the parameters have been broken out of. They basically haven't broken out that bracket. Well, I would expect that the data is still being logged inside the car. It's just not being live transmitted back to race control, which is what the requirement is as per Appendix 6. So now that they've got it fixed and they've got the transmission back up and going again, that's one part of it. Race control will have to examine it further after when the cars go to post-race tech. Nice work quoting the appendix as well. Good work, right into the rule book. Come on, you've, Down you've worked with Miss Adam before. <laughs> yes. well, I'm not saying I ever doubted it would be a thing. <laughs> that, that's, I mean, is that lucky or unlucky? I don't know. Because well, well, it, oh, I'd be still nervous. So, yeah, I'm uh, still exactly. nervous there. What happens if they get through that stop and it stops transmitting again? But and you've got to come got back and force go. you back. That, 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 that will definitely the ends button. there, right? They will force you back. Mm. Yeah. So at the moment, they've been given a little bit of leeway. So the decision is made to make is, do you just change it out with caution? Because you've got, to, you've got one more stop. You've got one more chance to come in and do a precautionary change anyway while you're performing your pit stop. But if it's a connector or a part of the wiring loop, you could actually put the new one in and it not work. Yeah, well, that's true. So you, you're rolling the dice either, either way, way going, aren't you? Either way. It, it, does, it does mean that there'll have to be scrutiny on that data when they come in. And this is the things that we were talking about earlier on, like uh, tyre pressures and all of that sort of thing. Also for the, the turbo cars, there's boosts, pressure. That's all part of the 
BOP. Now, this isn't a turbo car, so that's not one of the things that would be looked at. One of the things that would, was changed overnight for the AMG balance performance change was the lambda numbers, the air, what, air fuel ratio ah. that the cars are allowed to run, the, the window they're allowed to run in, the fuel burn rate, effectively. So I do wonder whether they just want to make sure that they're logging all the information to make sure that is all operating in the right window. Matt Campbell continues on his way. He's trying to chase down Raffaello Marciello. An hour and 33 minutes left to go in this one. I wonder if at a point on Conrod, perhaps they just got Lelo to reach out and give the thing a bash. <laughs> <laughs> a bash? The old, the I old, thought you were going to go with alt control delete. The old, no, the old technical tap. Just, <laughs> which is the, the simplest version of have you tried turning it on or off again? It's been a, it's been a day at Mount Panorama. Oh, Some people started very, very, very early. By early, I mean Thursday. Let's take a look at uh, and remind everybody about the class structure that we have here at the Little Wally Bathurst. 12 hours. And head into the Pro Am category, the triple seven. Eighth position overall, just on two and a half laps away from the lead. Could have been a bit different, actually, that, but still leading their class for the Ben car and still discussions going on down at Group M at the front of the field. Uh, Chris Meats leads Chas Monster in the blue number 65 in that Pro Am class. Uh, by under a minute now, 55 seconds, Chas, he's just been chasing that white Audi down. Chaz Mostert with the fastest lap of the race, actually, some time ago, lap 169. So, very many hours ago. That's the second Audi in the Pro-Am category, inside the top 10, of course. An adventurous race, this car, <laughs> yes, hasn't it? <laughs> Contact with the wall. Drive through penalty early for Chaz when he was at the wheel, leaving pit lane, crossing the blend line on a cold tyre. Third in that category, the dark grey and red boost mobile AMG. Jamie Winkup looks to be taking this one to the end. You said that's red or orange? Uh, oh, it's definitely orange. It's orange. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. Boost orange. Yeah. Boost orange. Yep. Yeah. That colour down here in Australia. This car, we expect, though, has one more stop to go. Yeah. When they took that previous stop, it was too far out of the fuel window to get to the end. So, third, still up in the air for that car. Richie Stanaway's only driven three hours and 14 minutes, so I expect him to jump in. He'll jump in. there. And it's Derby Reynolds who's trying to chase them down. He's just about one and a half laps away from them and a step on the box the, in that uh, pro -arm class, silver class. Well, that's running down, the leader there running down in 13th position, Dylan O'Keefe behind the wheel of the Mylands team. I, I, I'm not sure they've been headed in this in that silver category, Grills. No, they've, they've been on top. Uh, David Russell led very early in yes. 47 before they yeah. had that incident. That's right. The spares box dipper. Uh, 25 yesterday, Dylan O'Keefe, and didn't surprise us, but impressed us all with a low 202 yep. early in qualifying. Oh, that really was very impressive. impressive. Yeah. yeah. Nice lap. And here's the uh, 101, Harold Valenti Rosso entry. Josh Hunt behind the wheel. Hasn't driven for a long, long time and was dusted off. They needed a, another driver in their roster this weekend to make the seating work to get into the silver class. And here is that class leader, Dylan O'Keefe, running down into the Scuderia Auto Art chase. Ninety minutes to go at Mount Panorama in the Liquid Molly Bathurst 12 out. There's still lots to play out. There's still a round of pit stops to go. And if you're not up to speed on the strategy yet, the car that's leading's got the longest pit stop. The car that's second's got the second longest pit stop. And the car that's third has got the shortest pit stop of them all. And there's a little question mark over our race leader from a technical standpoint. The data logging device that is was failing to transmit data and then it started transmitting again and then we looked and there was some consternation down in that garage at group of m racing so there is a little question mark over whether they need to change what is essentially a modem 
to make sure that transmits. And if they have to change that, it could define the outcome of this race. Well, how long does it take to change that? They have one more pit stop left in this 90 minutes. How long does it Where take to it? change? Where is, Where is it? it in the car? <laughs> if it's my internet service provider, about two weeks. <laughs> Yes, very fit. Now, she knows, the, uh, she knows all the regulations because she was caught in Appendix 6 there. Is there a requirement for that to be transmitting all the time? I would imagine there would be, right? Yes. And so, so that's where I'd be nervous that it just randomly starts working again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, electrical things don't just fix themselves. Let's find out some more from Chad. Uh, having a look at that gap. So Marcello back to Campbell. It sits at 31 seconds. So you might go, well, they've got 30 seconds up their sleeve. That would be a little bit of time to play around with it. But if the Porsche decides to not throw tyres on it, that's about 12 seconds right there. So what was a 30-second gap should be more like maybe even about 18 seconds. So now he's starting to get pretty hairy if you can change out what's essentially a piece of computer work in about 18 seconds. And then there's still the question mark over the driver solution for that car, Chad, towards the end of the race, because we expected them to put Mick Grenier in that car in the stint that they're yeah. in right now. So that's another question mark over the triple nine and it getting to the line. Unless they know something Ang about continuous driver time that we don't. Well, Engel can't get back. No, no, he's, he's, he's maxed out. He's maxed out. Uh, 340 minutes. Or he, he's been trying to win this race on six prior occasions, Mauro Engel, and if they don't get up today, it won't be because of his effort. He, he has been mighty. He's left nothing in the fast draw I mean, at all. He's taken it out of the filing cabinet, turned it upside down and shaken it on the floor. He would go beyond what he achieved here yesterday, which will be remembered for a very long time. He stints in the morning part of this race and came in and was telling us about how he felt and he said he, he was getting goosebumps just remembering driving into that sunrise. He loves this place so dearly. And it's, it's been unkind to him. Came pretty close in 2017. Quite public spat uh, after that race ended abruptly in a, a Scott Taylor Motorsport entered AMG. And they drove his heart out at the end of last year. But the only unfortunate thing for him in that race was that he was chasing Jules Gunon. And uh, you tend not to work your way past him. OK, here's Appendix 6. Um, it must be fitted and operational at all times that a car has left pit exit. This is the Mortex Balance of Performance Logger, tele telemetry modem and the in-car warning system. So GPS there, telemetry modem, modem to BOP, logger wiring loom and two modem. I wonder if as well, if, if it's the telemetry system and the warning light system that if that's failed it's more about the warning system. they may not be getting the warning system in the car yeah, we touched on that earlier today and that will be why they need to fix yeah, it yeah that's right it's more I, I do as soon as you mentioned that that yeah. system is all interlinked correct it's more for me it's probably more i mean they do need to have the telemetry for the bop requirements to make sure the car's legal while it's on circuit at all times but from a safety perspective having that in-car warning system that's when it starts to become much more regulatory, I believe. And that's unique to this race, that system. So yeah. that's that's why there's the big question mark over it. And and as you touched on, uh, Garth, it is, it is regulatory. So if you go if, through... If you're another team manager, are you looking at that right now? Uh, I'd be sniffing. Yeah. Correct. Guys, this data logger in 999 is becoming a real issue. It has dropped out again. They believe it could be a heat issue is causing the problem. Now... It is estimated it'll take 30 seconds to swap it out if they need to swap it out. And if it is working when the car comes in, as the car comes in, if it's worked in that last period, then it's OK to continue on. They don't need to update it, swap it out. But if it's not working, they're going to need to swap it out, and it's 30 seconds worth. So when when we got it, had it reported back to us that it just magically started working again, I was still very nervous for this car because yeah. electrical devices in hot environments like race cars don't just cure themselves. They tend no. to get worse before they get a whole lot better. And the fact that it's dropped out again does not surprise me. This all ties in to things we've been talking about all the way through, including your tyre pressures and things like that. I, I'm, I'm not sure what you do about this. I'm not sure what the officials do about this. That's why there's the conversation going on right now, because 
in, in some ways it's out of the team's control. It's not their fault. It's not their piece of equipment. Shea Adam. Would you guys like a little bit of good news about this team, however? Yes, come on. All righty. So drive time so far, Marl Angle, four hours and 28 minutes, which means that he still has a little bit of time left. The team realized that and said, Mauro, would you like to go in for the end? He very much would. So anytime they get below the one hour and 11 minutes to go mark, they can come in, do their final pit stop, and put the guy who put the car on pole and did the fastest lap ever for a GT3 car in BOP homologation to go back out to try and win his first ever 12 hour. Sure, they've told Mickey Grenier that yet no. because he was sitting there with his balaclava on, <laughs> helmet, ready to go. <laughs> so maybe had that was a quiet conversation with Maro Engel. So Grenier waiting. Maro not suited up just yet. Chad. Imagine the reason why they've got Grenier ready because if a safety car was to happen before that point, it would be Grenier's job to finish because. Uh, Rafa definitely can't stay in the car, and we know that it would be too early for Engel to hop in. So I just wonder if they're keeping him there for the next 11 minutes as an absolute safety option. That's a very good point, Chad. So we thought the 75 car was the one that had a tight driver limit window, but also 99 or triple nine now starting to see if they can make some strategy on the run and get one of their seriously hot guns back in the car to finish this race. How long? No, in 11 minutes. Yeah, how, I was going to say, how long has Marcello still got on his drive time? Well, in 11 minutes' time, it becomes an option to put Engel in. Yeah. And from that point on, then Engel is an option to finish this race. And, and they'll be good on fuel either way. So they're 25 laps into this stint. We've seen that car do 35 easily, Chad. Yeah, they're actually good to the tune of seven minutes with uh, Marcello's continuous driving time, guys. Right, smush it. That was, that was the thing. Yeah, good. Talk about a few balls in the air right yeah. down in the Group of M team right now. Spinning plates. Yeah. Managing a technical issue with the car, managing driver time, managing strategy, managing what they're going to do at the next pit stop. Do they take tyres? Who seemed to remember a while ago, Raffaello Marcello triple stinting a set of tyres yeah. at the end of the race for track position. It's a big call. Imagine sitting down at the start of the day and you're told that your window for driver time is seven minutes. Seven minutes. <laughs> Out of 740 minutes in a day of car racing, seven minutes, that's your window. <laughs> that's why we love this stuff, isn't it? And that's why we said at the beginning that it's just a, as much about the brains behind the computer screens. I, I mean, they're not on the pit wall here. We don't have the pit purchase. But all the guys who are working in the bunker trying to work out what's going on, it's just about as much about them as it is the guys on the rattle guns and the drivers behind the wheel to ensure that they get themselves into a position. And what about Shields Gunon? What about Shields Gunon then? Because he's now closing in on Matt Campbell. Three seconds the gap now between Matt Campbell and Shields Gunon. There are eight laps between them in terms of how long they've been out. So that's nothing. That really doesn't affect the strategy unless Gunon decides to stay out longer and catches a late race yellow. That's the, that's the only thing that he has an advantage. And still, the debate is going on down at Grupa M. There's a whole load of man filter guests down there. They're involved in it as well. They've got the little area for those guys to be plugged in and watching and listening. And there's drama on the track with a battle, a real life battle for second and third in the overall. This drama off track with all kinds of problem solving to be done. Decisions, decisions to be made that may well affect the outcome of the 2023 Liquid Molly Bathurst 12 hours. And stay with us as we head towards the last, well, what are we now, 80 minutes still to go, Garth Tander. And this one, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm literally rubbing my hands here because there's so much that can still happen here. And there's still, what, there's still four cars within a minute at the front of the field. Yeah, there is. And the reason that Gilles Gunon is pushing on so hard right now, trying to close this gap down to Matt Campbell, is the expectation is the 75 car will have a shorter pit stop. So yeah. you might not actually have to pass him on the racetrack. Yeah. And he'll do the Porsche, what Porsche has been doing to everyone else all day, spend less time in the lane and pass him in pit lane. So just when we thought 
that we had this one worked out. With 80 minutes to go, there's still so many variables. Gunon took near on a second out of Matt Campbell on the previous lap. On this lap just gone, it was another half a second. 2.02.9 for Jules Gunon. A 3.4 for Matt Campbell. Maro Engel now is now hel helmeted yeah. up, suited up, ready to go. We're not quite into that window yet where he's able to go to the end. But, well, they can't both get in the car. I mean, that, that, that would just be an embarrassment. Rock, paper, the scissors down there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Gunon, though, continues this <laughs> stalking effort on Matt Campbell. When Gunon got in the car, the gap to lead was near on 50 seconds currently at 32. Here's another question, and maybe this is why the why the debate is still going on down at Grubber M, and thanks to Chris Humphreys, who's a British Marshal, uh, and Matt G, and a couple of other people who've tweeted using the hashtag B12HR. Uh, let's not forget somebody's already been penalised for using tools in a pit lane. So will that modem come out without it having to be used for tools? Is it just a simple plug-in, plug-out? I don't know, chat. The other thing to think about now is we're past what would be what we call in Australia the critical lap of the race, that you can get home with one more stop uh, left in the motor race. So if we were to catch a safety car from any point from here to the finish, they could make it all, all a one stop, all three of them. Uh, by the way, guys, I'm just watching Richie Stanaway uh, throw his race suit on. So there was some speculation with Jamie Winkup finish uh, that Pro-Am car, but I'm guessing it's going to be Richie because he's gearing up. Sitting in at third position at the moment, just over a lap ahead of David Reynolds in our battle for the last step on the podium in Pro Arm. Gunon's taken six tenths of a second yeah. out of Matt Campbell this lap. Matt has got that. some traffic here in the Porsche. It's down to under two seconds now, that gap. And keep in mind, this car's got a shorter final stop than the 912 Porsche. So once again, Shulgunon is dragging car 75 into contention with the issues surrounding the question marks surrounding triple nine. Is Matty saving his tyres? Surely they're not going to be a double stick no, at the end. No. They're going for it. She's hammered down now. So Matt Campbell gets his way past one of those lap cars. Shulgunon will have to deal with them and actually will likely come across this lap traffic. In that car, I'm trying to look. In the lapped car, who is it? Is it Lee? 10? Okay, that's Glenn Wood. Oh, yeah. So, does it Glenn get out of the way up. before the shelf? Yes, he does. So, nice, nicely. Very experienced operator is Glenn Wood. Heck of a story that this weekend. Yeah. Turned up in a KTM, uh, start practice in qualifying a KTM, ended, uh, ended in a, an Audi R8, and the race in an Audi R8. Uh, those asking about the sin didn't take the start this morning. The Daytona sports cars run sin. Northamptonshire's sports car manufacturing, the number 66 in the invitational class. Shame because that was a bit of a fan favourite. We're inside the last uh, hour and 15 minutes, and Garth Tang has got his elbows out. <laughs> Typical. Getting physical in the commentary yeah, box. It's going to get just physical the position on there. the race circuit as well. Is Jules Gunon now comes out on the back of Dylan O'Keefe to put him a lap down. Matt Campbell's already dealt with that car. There's another car up the road for Matt Campbell. So lap traffic getting involved with this battle for second place ahead of our final round of pit stops. Critical, especially for Gunon to get as close as he can to the back of that Porsche before those pit stops take place. And we're four minutes, give or take, away from the magic number for triple nine on the driver time scenario to get that car in as Manny drops a couple of wheels off on the exit of the final corner. Dylan O'Keefe does the right thing. Uh, correction 47, David Russell does the right thing. You'd expect that. Very experienced pedal around here. And lets the bright yellow and green Porsche go through. And Gunon now has to work his way past the Audi, but the margin 1.6 seconds. Russell lets him go here. That's smart, smart play. Gunon will be happy with that. The clear lap traffic before they get to the cutting. It becomes pretty much one lane across the top of the mountain. So that gap now, second to third, 1.4 seconds. So as they negotiated that traffic, you would say that Gunon was the winner with that one, closing the gap down slightly more. Half past four in the afternoon. 
here. The shadows beginning to lengthen. There's parts of the racetrack that are in shade. Where the leader is just about to be elbow there and heading down the first part of Conrod Strait. So track temperatures are going to be all over the place. That'll change. They're changing that device, guys. They have to. I can see. Yeah. The way, I, they have to, don't they? The way they have things, there's double-sided tape, there's cable ties there. They have it all laid out. Could this race two years in a row be Maro Engel chasing Jules Gunon to win Bathurst? Could it be? Or could it be the other way around? <laughs> it's awesome. They, You're they've, asking uh, me questions I don't have I, the I know. Right I'm, now, I'm seeking guidance, Garth. <laughs> Surely they're going to have to put that car in the garage to do that. Well, that's the next question. Well, BMW had to, wipe if... the, had to put the car in the garage to wipe the rear lights. But, but did they, they had to plug something in, I thought I heard Shay okay. say as well. All right. But they're going to have to unplug something on this car and plug something back in again. So that would fall under the same circumstance, you would imagine. So if they're getting that car on the skates and it's bringing over. it in the garage, it's over. It's over as far as track position goes. Yeah, and then they have to fight back. And then, and then, and then they're Engel. waiting. They're hoping for a safety car to close the track position back up again. And then you get Angry Maro. And then you get Angry Maro. Oh, and angry I think Angel. it's Angry Maro on steroids this year because it's two years in a row <laughs> that he'll be chasing yeah. down the lead of the race in the final hour. So an angry Angle is a fast angle. Well, we saw how fast he was this morning when he was calm and serene in the yeah. sun, sunrise. So can you imagine what he's going to like? be like when he's angry and tired as the sun sets. 3-6 for Campbell, 3-3, three, three. two minute 3-3 three, three for Jill Gunon last time round and both of them yeah. with two wheels off the exit at turn one. We put the stopwatch down, we can see the gap now. Both in string together. And Bathurst has done it again. It's <laughs> found a way to create a unique storyline and keep us on the edge of our seat. Matty Campbell oh. way too wide two coming wheels. out of turn one, Gunon driving through the dust that Matty Campbell throws up. Here we go, get a nice face full of dust coming on the mountain straight. No hint of a lift, by the way, not a scintilla of movement from the right foot from Matty Campbell as he went through there. Sorry, John, just to touch on this issue with the group at MCAR, if they change it, it has to be from, and it will be from a technical directive from the Bathurst 12 hour, yep. from yes, the 12 yes, hours yes, technical yes. department. So they will make a call ultimately and say, no, you have to change it. Right. And then the team has to enforce it. Just felt from the body language the last time we had the cameras in that garage that there was almost a resignation that that was going to take place. So you're right, it's completely out of their hands. It's not something they've devised to put in this car. It's a logging device supplied to them the cruelty of motorsport sometimes, and in particular the cruelty of the mountain. It can give us and it can take it away just as quickly. We're still speculating though, that hasn't taken place. The, the 999 car is out, but we will, it looks to me like we'll find out very shortly as the team lay out tyres, come to the front of the garage ahead of what will be their last pit stop for the race leader. Battle for second, third, Rage is on. Here's Matty Campbell. A bit tight here on the exit of turn one this time. It's much nicer. He's our leader, leaving the cutting. 30 seconds up the road. Raffaello Macciello. Driven spectacularly well. Managed the speed. He's probably blissfully unaware that all this is going on in the garage. Just just course he is. You, you would never tell them, would no, you? No. You would never tell the driver that. He's just been told well, to get no, on and hit his marks. There's nothing as a driver you can do. No. So there's no point telling the driver, no. because all it will do is distract them. So uh, just get a little bit more information on this. The team are saying the logger is functioning correctly. The modem, which is the part supplied by the event, is what's not working correctly. So they're going to replace the modem first. If that then works, potentially, if that then works correctly, and they're still not getting data, they'll have to come back in and replace the logger as well. But right now they believe the modem is the issue. Uh, just to change tack very, very quickly on that, amazing scenes around the mountain and indeed around the city of Bathurst all week, a, a three-day event attendance of 53,446 people. That is an event record. Uh, it's even larger than the 2019 event, which was held over four days. So 53,446 <laughs> people have come to Mount Panorama. In comes Triple Nine. This could be All right. the moment of the motor race this afternoon. Ah, isn't it amazing on the things on which 
motor races can turn. You cannot fault the drivers at all. You cannot fault what the teams have done. Reliability, potentially, from something, an electronic device, basically, not connected. Porsche is in. Porsche is in as well. Oh, so Manti here may respond immediately. I think it's a great move by Manti, covering off what's going on. How's the attack of the pit lane for Campbell oh. getting that thing in? But does it cover off the triple nine car, or does it let Gunon off the lead? Clear air. Clear air. Chad. Guys, they're out of fuel with that Campbell car. They've run 35 laps, and the biggest stint of the day in green flag running was 35. So that's just as far as they could get. So that's let Gunon off the leash. It's all happening right now. 68 minutes left to go in this one. They're changing that motor on the Cooper lane. M car in the lane. I wonder whether they got dispensation yeah. or allowance to yeah, do that. Must have checked. From race, the race officials. So let's keep an eye on the splits for Gunon while these two cars are in the lead. They're putting tyres on the Cooper M car. What do they do for 9-12? See them laid out there in the in the shade. This is actually this the is really clever for Gripper M because Chad. they're putting tires on before the fueling, so they can tire and more them at the same time. Chad. Yeah, well they're going for tires on that Campbell's car, so not going to roll the dice and try and save themselves the precious 12 seconds. This is a massive advantage to Car 75 that they've taken the time to do this. Campbell's moving, so Campbell's moving. The Gripper M car is up towards mid exit. We'll see it here. Doors being shut. Firing it up, so they'll get out in front. Oh, wow. But that 30-second lead now has been reduced to what is the example, what is the equivalent of about five or six pit bays. So they've they've fueled the Grimba M car. They're all good. Then they put the tyres on. But were they working on the Mordem while they were fueling? Well, they must have had dispensation yeah. to do that. But they, this Bathurst 12 hour technical team spent so much time in that garage. It must have been. A question discussed. Here's Gunon running down into the chase. So this lap hasn't been particularly fast. First split and second split wasn't particularly great. Team Manti have been, he may have been great in the pits. Minute 21 again. Every time he's and they're going to be right now. He's going to cover them off. Yeah, he's going to cover them off. Don't to. give the Porsche any advantage on new tyres. Oh, what's going on here? What's going on in the Gripper M garage? It's, it's long faces down Is there. It's a resigned look. They've come in because they can go to the end from here. The Sun Energy One car I'm talking about, they don't want to get caught on the wrong side of a safety car here. So they've covered off the two cars behind them. The car that's out of kilter here, but it will be in a short moment, is Shelton von der Linde. He's 36 laps into the stint in that BMW. So he'll be in shortly for about an hour and five minutes. He's worth race. the school. Campbell at the BMW M elbow. Sun Energy One racing in. Do they put tyres on this car? That's what I was about to say. Do you just fuel only? Have they got tyres laid out? Or is that a fair view? Or the do game? you go for track position with 65 minutes to go and back your man in? If they put tyres on Campbell Leeds. Uh, Engel Leeds. Engel, sorry. Engel Leeds. And it does Gunon pop in between Engel and Matt Campbell? know that Gunon was right on the tailpipe of that Porsche when Porsche came to the lane. It's drinking, it's drinking, it's thirsty. He's going, no, no tires. tires. Oh. They're going to lead the race, Sun Energy One. The defending champions emerge in front. It's all cleansed to the end of the race, and Jules Gunon has clear racetrack, and for the second time in two years, he's going to have Maro Engel chasing him down. There is a difference this year, though, Rich. Jules Gunon has on a, on a set of tyres that he will need yep. a double stint to the end. Engel on a fresh set of tyres. He will have speed at the end of this one. And Matt Campbell is only 12 seconds away from the lead, also on a fresh set of tyres. Three cars, 12 seconds, a dirty dozen of seconds to get to the end of this race with an hour and five minutes. And the top three are in a battle. Meantime, Sheldon von der Linde came in from what was second place when he came in. He holds on to the lead lap. Mark Beretta. Guys, the information that Car 999 was dying to hear online with the only words that were shouted out here, the motor is working, they are in this. Oh, wow. Oh, that's deep sigh of relief. It's taken us 10 hours and 55 minutes, but it's come to life big style. I was just watching where Van der Linde came out with regards to Brock Feeney.
for fourth and fifth. Bok's going to have to stop soon anyway for triple eight, but there was a chance that Van Blinda might get caught in. Triple seven in, 47 in class leaders here in the Boisel Pro-Am entry. So Chris Meese will take what will be their final pit stop with 63 minutes to go in the race. It'll be timed fuel. Can you see it? Yeah, the door's yep. open, so Mises Ricardo out. Fellow should Ricardo jump into Fella that. Ricardo will climb aboard the 777 car to bring it home. Here comes Chaz Mostert into the lane. These cars are battling, so Mees and Mostert have been battling for the lead of Pro-Am. Chazzy leaving nothing on the table at pit entry, as he always does. That Porsche, the way Matt attacked that entry in the Porsche from on board was pretty spectacular. down at Audi Sport Customer Racing Australia. So briefly, the 65 will bump in front of Mies and then it'll swap when Mies goes. They're basically a full pit stop behind the sports bet car, but they'll battle it out. Ooh, drama. Drama at the right front for the 777 car. So, or will they? Not a slam dunk, but they will leave no. before the 65. Still drama going on. I think Moffat's good to go to the end on that. They're, they're, doing they're doing pads. They're doing brake pods. They're doing pads. Well, they must have spotted that when yeah. they were doing the wheel change, and that's why the guy in the right, right front stepped away and signaled to the to the garage. Feeney in. So for his final stop. I've what not seen a pad change on an Audi at the 12 hour before. Mm. Definitely never. I never did it in the team no. when I was doing the years. Let's hear from Chad. Just wandered down to Mantha and had a, a chat to both of Matty Campbell's co-drivers as, as to why they took tyres on. And the simple answer is, well, two reasons. One, they thought that the 75 would be able to cover them if it was fuel only. So they figured we might as well throw tyres on and hope for a safety car at some point. But it's just about pace. They just feel like they haven't got old tyre pace to be able to fight the Mercs if they're going to double stint. So the fingers crossed move here from Team Grello and the 912 is throw the new rubber on it and just pray for a safety car to punch him up. Put Matt Campbell back in the fight for a late race pass on fresher tyres. This brake pad change continues for the 777 car as Chaz Mostert leaves pit lane and will take over the lead in Pro-Am. And Maro Engel has got to the back of the 75 Sun Energy 1 Racing AMG. Here it is. This is the battle for the race lead. 61 wow. minutes and 30 seconds to go in the race. Everything's cleansed. They're good to go to the finish. And it's 0.8 of a second. And New tyres versus stint all tyres. Performance advantage on the Pirellis to the car in second, the bright yellow car. Whatever else is going on there, there is a performance advantage, and he's only going to make them last another 61 minutes. I, I, I'm saying that slightly sarcastically, <laughs> because, you know, who knows? Remember, Unon did not leave anything on the table on the previous stint that these tyres did, so it's not That's like he looked point. after them to think that we will definitely double stint them. I feel like that was a call that was made late to get this track position, and he will have to deal with a tyre that will not be at its best. I mean, Engel has good, good speed now because the tyre is in its peak. It's coming in and it's working well. The performance advantage will start to negate as this stint goes on, so... Engel will try and get this done as soon as he can yeah. while he has a tyre advantage because the longer that he spends behind Jules Gunon, the less of an advantage he will have. And he'll get to the point in the middle part of the tyre stint where he'll have no advantage. So he's going to do it. He'll want to do it now. And well, these two get into a scrap. All that does is bring the 912 into the equation as well and drags Matt Campbell closer. And let's be honest, we hope that the race will last for another one hour. But if there's an incident and the race gets stopped, at the moment, the Sun Energy 1 car is leaving. And, you know, I say that because that's happened before. It has happened. Bath has had everything happen, hasn't it? <laughs> Trees, kangaroos. Not, not happened yeah, there's hailstorms. And yet, every time we say something like that, the script writers invent something new and creative. Ah, great run go. down Conrad. Goon on defence. Is it oh. enough? Jules is slightly offline, but does enough to get it down. He's sort of half blocked and half fainted across to the middle of the road. I think visit New South Wales corner. Turn two. Yeah. If he gets off here, he'll get the drag up Mountain Straight. Got to be close. 
I just want to be too close at the first corner and get too much push. Yeah, he needs a big drive advantage. Here he goes. He turned, he went in on a slightly different line yeah. to the leader there. Just so he had the air on the front spoiler. Yeah, really what, smart driving from Engel. But what Gundogan was doing there was squaring off the exit to get good drive traction off the exit of the corner to negate any of that mid-corner flow that Engel yeah. would have. He would have two or three kilometres an hour of a tyre advantage, a grip advantage through the mid part of the corner. But if Gunon could square the exit off and get good drive up the hill to two, it negates that advantage that Engel has. I feel like if it's going to happen, it's going to happen at the chase. Get a good run out of Forest Elbow, use the slipstream and try and outbreak Jill Gunon. Well, that toe's been so effective, yes. even within similar brands across the course of the weekend. So we've seen that today, and that will be key for Maro to get that car out of the BMW elbow well enough that he can drag himself up behind the almost identical AMG in front. Well, Kenny said yesterday he wanted just to make sure that they got themselves into the mix, in contention at the end, and then he'd leave it to the pro drivers that he's hired to drive for him to do the job, and they've done that. They've ticked the box. They've got themselves in a position to defend their Bathurst 12-hour victory. And now it's just up to Gilles Gounon to do it. Good drive out of the elbow yeah. for Angle. He's really close. Yeah. Well, Gounon, he's squaring off the corner everywhere. He squared off the dipper and got a good run down to Forest Elbow. He squared off Forest Elbow to get a good run out down Conrad straight. He knows what he's got to do with his car, and he's putting the car in all the right spots. Engel's a bit further back this lap. It'll be a fair move to get it done from back there. That would be a low percentage lunge it from there. It would be, with 57 minutes left to go. You, wouldn't be, you don't need to play those games right now. Identical speeds oh. through the trap. That the defensive driving. Uh, under the Gunon's the been doing that. I've been noticing that braking oh, really? line. Oh, Gunon drops a wheel, though. He doesn't need to do that too many times. He comes on to pit straight. I've noticed that sort of break in the middle part of the circuit, then dive the car out. Gunon's been doing that all day. Head up Mountain Straight. Engel. Closer this time, much, is he? Much I closer, he definitely. That wheel, when he dropped the wheel, Gunon coming on to pit straight. Lot cost him some time. He's too far back again now, Maro Engel. So every lap that Gunon can keep Maro Engel behind is music to the ears for Gilles Gounon because there's more and more heat going into the front tyre aboard this 999 AMG Mercedes. Inside the last 60 minutes, that means if we see the AMG safety car, no more whereby's, any lap cars will have to go down pit lane to get out of the way. But at the moment, we've got a battle. We've got a battle for pace at the top of the mountain. We've got a battle for supremacy between two AMGs two highly experienced GT3 drivers. They know these cars, they know this circuit. Gunon, Engel and Campbell in the Porsche, still only that 12 seconds behind. If there's a fumble, if there's a side-by-side -side incident, Campbell is there lurking, if you can lurk in a bright green car, the Grello machine. Is it green, is it yellow? No, it's Grello. Another opportunity for Engel will be every time they come across lap traffic, should it just fall in the wrong part of the circuit for Gilles Gounon, whether he can take advantage of that Murrow Engel, get a run on the Sun Energy AMG Mercedes. Wasn't able to do it that time. They made their way past Jeff Taunton in the Mark car. Gounon, no need to defend this lap at the chase. Could take the racing line, keep the momentum up. Underneath the liquid Molly Bridge, to complete lap number 296. Slightly different lines again by the two drivers. That's Gunon squaring it off as Garth Tander was seeing. That means he gets the car straighter earlier and the front wheels then pointing in the right direction. You get on the throttle earlier, you start to build your speed earlier and that's what's keeping him ahead at the moment of Maro Engel in second. How do you like this, Krilzy? Oh, I'm quite enjoying it, thank you, John. Is thank that all right? Asking. Yeah. Is this what you've ordered? Because, you know, Garth and I like to make sure you get everything you want. Oh, I very much appreciate it. It means the world to me. <laughs> 54 minutes to go. Two of the best GT drivers in the world, three of them, uh, having an absolutely massive dip on a perfect afternoon at Mount Panorama. It should get much better, I don't think. 
And it's amazing, isn't it, how these two just find themselves on the same bit of road. Once again, last year, it was an intense battle fought uh, between eight to 10 seconds apart for the final two hours, essentially, as these two just went at it. This time, there's a tire advantage to the yellow car. Is there... Oh, he's close this time oh. off the dipper, Rick. Oh, that's nice. Will it be a send at the elbow? No, it's not, but it might be a good exit down Conrod Strait Great for Maro Engel. Both of them. Both of them got a good exit. Down. Every time that Engel has a half look at Forest Elbow, it enables Gunon just to apex a little bit later and square off the exit and leave him less vulnerable for the run down Conrod Strait. Just trying to shake Engel out of the draft as they make their way down to the kick. He's, he's half a car to a car, maybe too far back. Remember what Mara Engel said when he was sitting right here in the Liquid Molly comms booth? For anything from a second and a half behind, you're feeling the toe inside a second, and you're getting a lot of toe, but also the aero on the front of your car is not working. He's two tenths of a second behind. It's not even that now. And remember what Garth Tander said when this engagement commenced. The longer Maro Engel spends behind Jill on the harder it gets for him to find his way past. That tyre advantage becomes less and less and less when you're stuck in right under the rear wing of the car in front. The front tyre temperature does go through the roof. You get more and more understeer. You lose performance from the car. You lose lap time. I think they're pushing pretty hard, though. They're doing oh, two yeah. or four twos. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Matt Campbell, who's in relatively clear air and on new tyres, is last time around only did a two or three nine. So they're not giving an awful lot away to Matt. So it's not a question of Gunon cruising and just putting his car in the right place here, guys. The other thing to remember, what were these two doing seven days ago at the Rolex 24 at Daytona? They were winning it together. Yeah, together together. Now they're rivals fighting out for victory and only one of them's going to get it today. And Mara was wearing his watch. He said, I'm not going to keep it in a, in a box anywhere. I'm going to wear the Daytona Cosmograph. Oh, look at this again at the BMW well bought. This is tight again. Just don't know where the move comes. It, no. Because forcing Jill Coonan into a mistake is not the easiest thing in the world to do. Teammates at Daytona a week ago, they won the Daytona 24 hours sharing a car. Now they are duelling it out for Australia's international enduro. Jules Gunon leads Maro Engel by a Mercedes length with 51 minutes to go. And the question is, how long can they keep this up as they battle for victory? It's a repeat of the fight from the 2022 edition of this race. Same cars, same brand, slightly different teams. And there's so much on the end of this. Maro Engel, who's been coming here, this is his seventh visit to the 12 hour. He's got a Bathurst 1000 start to his credit. He would desperately love to win this race. He's passionate about this place and all of its history. He said this morning he got goosebumps driving into the sunrise. For Jules Gunon, looking to become the first triple winner of this race and the first to win it back to back to back. It looks like they're tied together with a very short bungee cord, doesn't it? As they're going up there. It's, you'll have done this before. It looks like somebody doing follow laps. When, when, when you've got someone out, they're very fast follow laps. But that's exactly what it looks like at the moment. This is not a script. This is not a movie. This is a race. There's nothing staged about this. These guys are pushing as hard as humanly possible in those two cars. And it closes up again, got down towards the elbow. Gunon, there's nothing left in that car. There's no more performance. There's definitely more performance in Maro Engel's car still with that fresh tyre set on it. But not enough to get it himself into a position where he can set Jill Gunon up. So it's going to require something else to happen. Does Gunon make a mistake? and enable Engel to get a run, or do they encounter some lap traffic? 
or does at one point Engel just send it and hope for the best? Here it is. Could this be the moment? Oh, he man. almost sent it. He certainly wow. hoped. And they both get out the other side. Just. Oh. That, I tell you what, that was really, really fair play by both drivers because Gudon didn't just chop to the apex there. He did leave a car's width. Lillo can't believe this. By the way, Krilzy, with the pace at the front of the field, do you want to check your calculations oh, for your 2,000 kilometres? Almost about 300 laps, so need another 22 after that one. It's going to be tight. It's tight. 48 minutes mm. to go, Rich. We've broken records on the fastest qualifying. 322 is 2,000.5 kilometres. There you go. 322 completed laps. That was a, a look at that move. The door was half open and <laughs> Raffaele Marcello, who's been in this position before, knows how this feels. Let's go back to the tyre life here, guys. Yes, it's balancing up. Eventually it will. Uh, but it's still going to be two hours and 20 minutes versus just over an hour and whatever it was. 65 minutes. Yeah, 65 minutes. Now, most people will say, all right, well, obviously that gives them a grip, a grip advantage getting out of the corners, but braking is also a part of this as well, yeah. isn't it, Garth? Yeah, it is, because these cars have ABS, but the limiting factor, we call it the coefficient of grip of the car for the retardation on the brake from the tyre to the ground. So the tyre, when it loses grip, you lose the braking performance as well. We saw that on the previous lap. Maro Engel, we said, is he going to send it? And he nearly did send it. So he does have braking advantage. He's much closer coming off the elbow. Traffic. Lap traffic again. Look at the right place on Conrod. What to yeah, they'll get it done before the kink easily. And the marked car, it's Donaldson behind the wheel there in 17th. Indicates nicely. And that's the right thing to get oh, over this lap, guys. Morrow's closer this lap. Maguna is coming this time. The moment he starts He's defending, it's down right. inside, no. and they're going to come together. Yes, they are, and they're both off. They're both off. Now the 999 goes through. That was absolutely on the cards from the moment that he pulled out. Now that'll be looked at from race control. New leader as they cross the line will be Maro Engel. <laughs> Teammates a week ago, remember? Teammates. They shared a car to victory at Daytona. Now they crash into each other at Bathurst. So Engel, we'll see it on a replay, no doubt. Yep. But Engel jumped in behind Gunon to make it look like he wasn't going to have a lunch and then stepped out and sent it. Here we go. So just, we need to pick it up earlier he's than there. that. He's not there. He's not oh, there. He's on the send curb. it up over the curb and that creates contact. I don't think, I don't think that stands. So he's a long way into the corner before contact made Gunon. So... There's been very little of, of that today. Oh, Let's be I honest. I feel like that's the first one. It's this one here. Engel jinx to make it look like he's not going to pass, then sends it diagonally to the apex. We know that he has a braking advantage, a grip advantage, but is it enough to get up the inside there on that particular time? Now, as we found out earlier in the week, race stewards, race officials will be looking at telemetry to see if that line into the corner by the leader, Gilles Goudon, is the same as he's been taking every other lap. It was much closer, but is it close enough or is that an overly optimistic lunge down the inside? Well, that's not for us to make no. a thoroughly predictable message has come up on timing here. Under investigation, incident between cars triple nine, and 75 at turn 21, which is the chase. So, even with that incident, by the way, Mark Campbell is still 12 seconds behind the leader, but now only five seconds behind second place. So it's split first and second to six and a half seconds, and then it's another five and a half back to third here on the mountain. The difference is, is that it's now only six seconds between Gunon and Campbell with the Porsche with a notable tyre advantage. So the longer the race goes, it will play out better for car number 912. Under investigation, accident, cars, triple nine, 75, turn 21. Over to you, Craig Baird and the Motorsport Australia stewards. Campbell, third place. Just an interested observer at the moment of what's going on at the front of the field. The 
leader, Maro Engel, makes his way through turn two up the mountain one more time. Just clocked over lap 301. So, covering some ground this afternoon. There's still plenty more of a story to be told in the remaining 44 minutes of this edition of the Bathurst 12 hour. Mauro Engel now, what you do is you put your head down and you drive. Yeah. You drive real fast. Yeah. Because it's out of your hands now. The past has, what's happened is in the past. You can't change that. It's up to the officials, as you said, Craig Bird, the driver standing, driving standards advisor and the motorsport control Australia to race all control. Teams. Here we go. Lane drive through penalty to car triple nine for a driving infringement. Pit lane penalty big. That's I was big. expecting a that time, goes second. A that time goes second. penalty, if anything. That's what I was getting to the point. If you're Mauro Engel, you put your head down and you hammer it because if time penalty is coming your way, you try and jump in front of the time penalty before the end of the race. But a drive-through penalty changes all that. No, they, that might even bring Sheldon van der Linde uh, back into they, it. He's going to be tight. still be third. It'll be 32 seconds from transit lane and Engel's 40.3 in front. Is that 32 seconds in the pit lane? That's the transit time. Transit so, right. But, but he, lose, he loses more time than that, Quilty, because he's not at full speed. Yeah, he, won't, he won't lose 40 seconds, I don't think. So we thought we might see Angry Maro towards the end of this race. We're going to but see Angry Maro. Entirely for a different yeah. reason now. I have a fair indication that the timing screens are going to light up after he serves that drive-through penalty wherever. I wonder if they've told him yet. Let's have another look at this. We, unfortunately, probably for the triple nine, we've got it from every angle conceivable to say so this was the move. Late decision yeah. to pull out. I think the fact the contact was, was behind the rear wheel, yeah, really, to start wheel. with. And he's on the kerb. Yeah. And it's late in the corner. And there's not much going for that at all, is there? It's, if it's that the, was DRS, it's the one he here be where it. he sort of jinx in to stay under the rear wing and then sends it hard at the apex. And he, he's not, he's not enough, not up there far enough in reality to get the job done. The contact front bumper to behind the rear wheel was. That, that was the incriminating, incriminating evidence. evidence. Yeah. 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 And so, Jules Gounon will inevitably find himself leading this race in the final hour for the third time in as many editions of this race. But only by four seconds to a charging Marty Campbell. So now, release the Campbell. Heard that line before. Uncork the Kangle. Yeah. So down in the pit lane. Both teams watching and listening. And down in the Sun Energy one pit, predictably, they feel as though they're on the right side of that. So, well done, yeah, a bit more of a poker face from Lucas Stoltz. Yes. <laughs> as opposed to Kenny Havel, who's <laughs> making his feelings well shown. Yeah, still 40 minutes to go. 41, just under 41 minutes to go. This is Bathurst. Anything can happen in that time. So, you make the point, John, that Matt Campbell now becomes the focus for Jules Gounon. Yeah. It's about make sure, making sure that green car does not get any bigger oh. in the rear vision mirror. Matt Campbell can see that car now. He's taken seven tenths out of him on this lap yeah. to this point. Three six plays a two, two seven. seven. Hello. <laughs> Campbell's uncanned. Someone's woken Matty Campbell up. And now he's in full chase mode in that Manti Porsche. Fastest lap for Maddie for that car, the Manti EMA Porsche was a 202.77. Maddie Campbell, 202.79. Chat. This plays out, Garth. I figured I'd get a word from the Group M team, uh, sorry, from the Man Filter team down here, actually, uh, from Mick Grenier. You've had a chance to see the incident and the penalty that's been handed out. Your thoughts? I mean, for me, Jules move at the end of the braking zone. Um, so I don't know where Maro could go because he was committed to overtaking him already. But the problem started earlier because we had to do a longer stop uh, as the series couldn't see telemetry. So we had to change the sensor in the car and they told us we had to do it. So we lost the lead because of that, which I think is not fair because they can still see telemetry here in the garage. To do that on the last pit stop makes no sense for me. But then Maro had to go for it, to be honest. Um, yeah. 
So it's fair to say it hasn't worked out towards the end here for you, but do you think it's still possible after even a drive-through to, to pull back with maybe even a safety car? Uh, if there's a safety car, maybe, yeah, but unless there's a safety car, I think it's done. Appreciate the chat, mate. Sorry to hear it. Pretty, pretty reasonably predictable response yes, from yes. that team. Obviously disappointed. I feel like the world turned against them with that modem issue for the car and then contact trying to fight back from that. Engel's got to come in next time around. Has to come in next time around. You only get three times by before you come in. He's got eight seconds, but he will have to come into the pits for that penalty. Campbell, three and a half seconds away. Black flag for the triple nine. Now, a once a black flag comes out, you've got to come in next time by. So... Black flag starts to become serious. Yeah. Starting to wave that around. Just do a time check for Gunon versus Campbell. A 3-5 for Gunon, a 2-8 for Campbell. So Matty Campbell's charge continues. That gap now down to three seconds, just over three seconds. The battle for right now, what is second and third on circuit. But when Maro Engel serves that drive-through penalty, it becomes the battle for the lead. With 38 minutes left to go. There is still a sting in the tail of this one. Six minutes since that penalty was announced by race control. So they're pushing their look here. One, the, the team will be saying, stay out, stay out. We're arguing, we're arguing. But there won't be any argument don't, with that. Don't argue it's those. Once been done, the decision comes down. We respect the umpire's decision. This team for M Racing have been in contention to win this race. I'm going to say four races Yeah, now. easy the, four. Yeah. Every time they come here, but they just have not been able to close the deal. And look, they're far from the only ones because Kraft Bamboo have been in exactly the same situation on more than one occasion. They came close last year. They probably would have won in 2018 had it gone green the whole way through. So they're not the only ones. And uh, Bathurst certainly is a cruel mistress sometimes, but wow, this is just another chapter to their challenges at this point. What do you reckon, if he stopped and redressed there, would he have got away with that? I must, I must have a driver. Driver. Really? 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 I must have a driver. driver. That's a really good point. I mean, he, that's he, very was clean. he had clean tyres. It's a if, very, very much a supercar yeah. rule, the redress. I don't know whether it really translates to GT racing. It's all irrelevant now because the crime has been taken now. You've got to pay the fine, effectively, come to the lane. So I don't think we want to hear the radio right now from Maro Engel because I don't think it'll be all that complimentary. Table of penalties, of course, we're running under the SRO regulations, so how the penalties are assessed, and that's why this is a drive-through and not a time penalty, yeah. because that is the SRO rule book. If that happened at the end of the 1,000, would it, it wouldn't have been a drive-through, or would it, have been a, would it have been a time penalty, do you think? So let's say you're chasing down SVG, as it might be this year, and you do that, would you... No, well, what you do is you redress you it. Redress, in supercar, yeah. you redress it. Yeah. So that, that takes everything out of the equation. So I just put you on the fine for the great race this year. Yeah, thanks, well, nice. 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 Love it. 2.6 seconds between first and second. Engel back out, having gone through the pit lane. He served his penalty. And he is... 14 seconds further back, he's got about 18 seconds on Van der Linde. Top four now, <laughs> 34 and a half seconds. And we've still got 35 minutes to go. 35 minutes still to go, 35 seconds between the top four. They dubbed Sydney's backyard, the Blue Mountains, one of the great dividing range. It's a stunning place to visit when you come to New South Wales. The best thing is you get to drive through them to get to this place. Stunning scenery, lovely little towns to stop and enjoy your coffee or a food and uh, enjoy your trip right through this great state of New South Wales. And when you pass through the Blue Mountains and come down Mount Victoria the other side, this is what you get. Uh, one of the most compelling places for motorsport anywhere on the planet. And once again, it, it gives us a remarkable show. And now with one Mercedes having two or three pit lane 
We've got 2.4 seconds between Jules Gounon and Matt Campbell in the battle for the win. Matty Campbell charging hard to try and catch that Mercedes. Matthew Jemenek, a shot at winning this race. Have you ever been this nervous? No. Uh, I guess I'm feeling like Matt was feeling last year in Daytona, you know? It's, uh, it's a crazy race. Uh, we didn't really think that we had a chance uh, looking at the pace of the Merck. And uh, yeah, somehow, uh, you know, they, they were fighting each other and uh, they had contact. 99 got a penalty and now, uh, yeah, we seem to to be closing in, you know, Gounon is on the double stint tyres and we are on the new. So, um, yeah, now we're just top briefing for the next 33 minutes and I just hope it's going to go our way. And guys, just the uh, little cherry on top of that, when it was reversed the other way, Mathieu was in the car getting them a watch. Yeah, and as I remember, Shea, that wasn't necessarily the cleanest of manoeuvres through what's now called the Le Mans chicane at Daytona. I, I seem to remember there might have been a bit of paint traded there. Was that not correct? <laughs> uh, so, let's see what happens. Down to 2.1 seconds. And there's no doubt that Matt Campbell has been... I mean, it's, it's almost like Manti have been waiting for this, isn't it, God? It's bizarre. How could they know? Have they got some kind of motorsport crystal ball? The crystal ball, because remember, go back to the last pit stop. They almost resigned themselves to the fact that they weren't going to be in the battle between the two AMG cars. So they thought, we'll put tyres on it, and if the race comes to us, we'll have a tyre advantage. Now, there's no way you could have predicted <laughs> that there was going to be the drama that we saw unfold at the chase. And yet, and yet, here we are, Matt Campbell on a fresher set of tyres, chasing down Jules Gounon. The gap now, just over two seconds, with 32 minutes left to go in this one. They're in the game. Drama at the exit of the chase. Craft Bamboo. That's Craft Bamboo Racing, the MSI AMG. It's mobile. Daniel Yonkadella behind the wheel. He was in sixth position. They will give this every opportunity yeah. to turn around under its own steam. If you're Group M, they're saying that needs to be safety card right now. So <laughs> there's lots think? of different interpretations of what needs to happen, but the car's moving. So 22.2. Car trying to resume. So yeah, that's that because the car is moving. Yes, yeah, exactly right. James Taylor saying, "Excellent officiate. Yeah, well done. Excellent officiate." And everybody knows James Taylor's modus operandi is let's keep it green until we absolutely have to for safety reasons put the race under safety car, and that's what's happened. Chad? Uh, just a thought, guys. Fans of Formula One will know what a free pit stop means towards the end of the race. If you get a late race safety car and you have a bit of a buffer to the car behind you, you might choose to come in and get some fresh tyres. I'm standing down at BMW and everybody just leapt into action down here because if anyone could get a free kick out of a safety car right now, it could be the car in fourth. They've got a huge gap behind them. They could potentially take a free stop and take the restart fourth in the queue with fresh rubber. I tell you what, Daniel's young could tell it did hit the wall on drivers right quite hard. He'd hooked the kerb and dropped the Pirellis, the left-hand side Pirellis, over the exit kerb from the chase. And he sweet, swooshed across to the other side of the road. And that was quite a heavy hit to the, to the right rear. The point that Chad made there about the free pit stop is an important one because what happens also in the last portion of this race is any lap cars get taken out of the queue. Mm. So you get a free pit yeah. stop, you get free tyres, or fresh tyres, and you don't have to deal with lap traffic getting back to the cars that you're racing against. So it is genuinely a free pit stop. And I, I feel OK saying this now that that car has recovered and we're not going to go yellow because at four hours and 13 minutes, this is the longest green flag run in the event's history. And this has unfolded. Safety car free. 30 minutes to go. 1.7 seconds, the margin. First to second. So now we're into the longest green flag period. We can say that officially in this event's history. Proving you do not need safety cars to close up the field here. You really don't. It's one and a half seconds between first and second. It's 14, call it 15 seconds, between the top three, and it's 35 seconds between the top four. Only the top four in pro are on the lead lap, and we've got half an hour to go. And three different manufacturers inside that top four, covered by 35 seconds. So you do not need safety cars to make it exciting. I'm not saying that the 75 cars 
gone over a cliff yet, but I wonder if it's starting to teeter near it. <laughs> Because 4 5 last time round for Goonon. Admittedly, Campbell a 203.8, but, and he's been in the twos in this stint. But I wonder if that advantage just gets more and more as this race goes on. And these tyres, the Pirellis on car 75, are hanging on grimly. Lee Holdsworth bringing the Hallmark Audi in for a splash of fuel to get them the last half an hour or so, sitting in fourth in the Pro Am 11 overall. Um, Hang on a second, I'm just going to dig into the motorsport cliches draw here. Here we go. Oh, ah, yes, hang on. Uh, catching is one thing, passing is another. I wasn't sure we had anything left in the cliche oh, draw. Well, we used a few of them today. Yeah, we have. But I was going to bring that same point up, John, that catching this car will be one thing for Matt Campbell. Finding a sneaky way past will be another challenge altogether. So an epic battle between Dunon and Eng Maro Engel it resulted in contact. I think it'll be a different battle yeah, as well. because be. Different manufacturer, different Correct. cars, different strengths and weaknesses. If anything, the, the toe might be more serious. Porsche catching the AMG. The Porsche's a physically smaller car. The Merc punches a pretty big hole in the air. Danny Junkadella brought the 77 Kraft Bamboo car back to the lane and the team go to work. What is in a very expensive race car with what is, all matter of fact, duct tape. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's big bits of it. <laughs> three eight for Kunon, so it shows what I know. This drops right down into the threes once again. <laughs> it's, uh, You've been pretty good with the commentator yeah. curse today, Rich. Not for the first year, Garth. You're not going to write off Jill Gunon at no, all. never. The gap never. down, though, down, hovering around the 1.2, 1.3 seconds, first to second. Here's the thing, though. Where does the Porsche have an advantage? It does everything well, Garth, as you've been making the point. Is there a point? Is it that? Is it going to come down to that that tyre advantage that will make make the opportunity for Matt Campbell when he gets there? Yeah. And he, he's going to get there. He is going to get there. Yeah, there will be a moment in the remaining 27 minutes where those two go head to head. But we haven't really seen the Porsche really go head-to-head -head with an advantage in speed over the Mercedes. We've no. seen it the other way around, the early part of the race when the Mercs had a speed advantage over the Porsche. But the shoe's on the other foot now. What can Matt Campbell do to elevate this car from second to first? Fascinating battle as this one comes to a climax. A Porsche is chasing down a big front-engine GT car at Mount Panorama. I feel like we've told this story before somewhere. History has been good to Matt Campbell at this place. Can it repeat? In 2019, with a series of remarkable passes, he charged the Porsche 911 GT3 for Elbamba Motorsport from fourth to first with a late race pass on Jake Dennison and Aston Martin to win Porsche's first major endurance race at Mount Panorama. This time, to wrestle the race lead away, he's got to pass the guy that's not only won it once, but it's won it twice and has claimed the last two editions of this race. Shooting for three in a row, mm -hmm. Jules yeah. on. Yeah, from the motivation stakes for Jules Gunon, it doesn't get much bigger. So, a little piece of Bathurst history on the edge for him. Just check the top speeds as they made their way down Conrod Strait on the previous lap. And the gap was out at 1.3 seconds at that point. So the slipstream just starting to yeah. work. And the Porsche was 3K an hour faster than the no. Mercedes on the previous lap. Top speed. So as Matt Campbell continues to close this gap down, the slipstream effect will become more and more powerful. And the speed differential will get greater and greater. Two great stories at the front of this field. In fact, all of them have got great stories, but particularly these two battling for the lead, and they are hanging it out as they head up to the top of the mountain. Obviously, it would be back-to-back -back victories for the Sun Energy one car, and as you guys said, in very different company to that that they won here last year, nine months ago. Matt Campbell back in a GT car for Porsche on this type of car's final run, we presume, at the moment. Expecting 992. And let's just remember that Matt Campbell knows how to do this 2019 front engined sports car at the elbow, and it was elbows out.
for Matt Campbell as he put it down the inside. There was just about a 9-11's width. There was probably a 9 10 and a half's width, actually, there. And he went through and eased his way through into the lead on driver's left. The model, the model designation for that car then was 9.11.1, yeah. wasn't it? That's exactly how much room there was <laughs> to get into that hole. Because I remember watching that live, and that was seriously cool. I think we've seen lots of passing manoeuvres at Forest Elbow. That's the best one we've seen down there. Yeah, that, that's the definition of full scene when you look it up on Google these days. Point seven, but we don't need to tell you margins anymore because Campbell's there. Interesting, starting to pick up a toe because last time round was seven k's an hour quicker down Conrod Strait, according to the speed track, just before the entry to the chase. The amount of Pirelli rubber that is laid down around the traction areas of this circuit are coming up to visit NewSouthWales.com corner. That's Griffin's Bend and other parts of the track. This track is properly, properly rubbered in. From Limited Running, who's on the Twitter, yes, but isn't Matt Campbell a professor at the Finding a Way Past <laughs> University? I think we saw his thesis just there, didn't we? His PhD from 2019 on the flashback. I want to give a little Maro Engel update for those of you. He was a second faster than these two cars on the previous lap and only 11 seconds behind right now with 22 minutes left to go. If these two engage and we start losing lap time, there'll be a third car to the party shortly. And Maro Engel will not need any extra motivation to get back to the front of this field should it play out that way. It's almost four hours and 20 minutes into this stint. And this is what this place has delivered. And we're always pretty confident that with the depth of this pro field that we would get a really good motor race. That The question mark was probably those safety car interventions and when they would fall given mm. the 24 starters that we had, which is probably six short of where, six to 10 short of where the optimum would be for a, a field at this place to balance between green flag running and to get those safety cars. But a pure classic old school strategy endurance race no compulsory pit stops just strategy smart race teams fast race car drivers great brands and great racing car teams going at it and it ends up with 21 minutes and 45 seconds to go four and a half hours of green flag running and this is anybody's race yeah and we're a lap and a half away from a distance record by the way can we just draw that in and we're 21 minutes to go we are going to be very, very close indeed to 2,000 kilometres. Richard Creel is pursing his lips with so they, sheer pleasure. There's not much left of the seat for Rich to be sitting on the edge of right now. Well, and I take up a lot of it. There's, uh, so they did the first 1,000 Ks in six hours and eight minutes. So that would make a second 1,000 Ks in... Math isn't really good, about five hours, 52 minutes, yeah. which is fair going. It needed to be 27 laps an hour, give or take. And they've easily been doing 28, 28.1 or two when they've been in green. And this long green session has allowed that to come back. Just been keeping an eye on that. But at the moment, that's all in the future. What's here and now is a gap that's just squeaked out to about eight, nine tenths of a second now. Is Campbell resting his tyres here? Is he just planning and scheming something else? What have Manti and Matt Campbell got up their sleeve? Because they've not given this up. They have not given this up at all. And neither has Shields Gunon. Every time he comes to traffic, he is flashing his lights like a madman to make sure no one slows him down by even half a kilometre an hour. The race to the chequered flag is on at the mountain. Just under 20 minutes to go in 2023's Liquid Molly, Bathurst 12 hours. The rush to the checkered flag is on and it's heating up and it's a three car battle. Two can see each other. The third car, Marlow Engel, the triple nine that took that late race drive through for the contact with Gilles Goudon is only 
8.9 seconds behind, and he is coming like a train at the moment. He's on the same part of Mountain Straight. This is not all over, and Maru Engel is fired up like a volcano. Took seven tenths of a second out of Gunon and Campbell on that previous lap. So the gap to the lead for this car right now is 9.8 seconds. It felt like just a lap ago, it was 11. Yeah. So continuing to mount this fight back is Maru Engel. He's some sort of fight back just to get to the tailpipe of Matt Campbell, let alone get involved in a battle for the win. I think Matt Campbell's just got to that eight-tenths of a second, one-second gap behind Mark Julgun on where he's in the dirty air. And he might not have what he needs just to get through up to, a, you know, half a second, three-tenths of a second to really take advantage of the slipstream coming off Forest Elbow for the run down Conrad straight. So I predict that we will have three cars battling for the last couple of three laps, which could mean Sheldon van der Linde gets through and wins if they all end up <laughs> on outside, 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 <laughs> outside you bridges. Cool. Let's head down to Chad. How good is this building to the crescendo we all want to see? The expected lap counter at this point, guys, with the run rate being so high now and them smashing sixes out of the park for the last four hours, doing such quick lap times, we're expecting now to get to 321, now 322 laps in the race. Now, when we started crunching all those fuel numbers about an hour ago, the predicted was about 316 to 17. So here's a question. Was anyone up and down pit lane predicting this race to go quite so fast and quite so many laps towards the end? Do you reckon they absolutely filled up those tanks when they were trying to beat each other off pit road? Because at the moment, they're going to have to do over 30 laps to get home. Yeah, that's a very good point. 23 laps on this stint for Gunon, 24 for Matt Campbell. Uh, Engel's lap count is from his drive through. Mm. I'd ask another question to you, Chad. Do you think they'll tell you if you ask? The answer's no. Sheer Adam up traffic. to it is already there. Some lap traffic. Oh, it does the right job. Yeah. Jumps out of the way. And our leaders negotiate their way up to the top of the mountain again. Three, three last time round for Junon. Plays a 3 5 for Campbell. 2 7. Tomorrow oh. Engel continues to be the fastest car on track by some margin. 8.8 seconds. He said, Beware, angry Maro. We're seeing exactly why right now. Remember the finish time is 17.43 plus the one lap. 17.43 local time, Australian Eastern Daylight Time. Counting down. And there's 1.3 seconds between these two. This has been a really good lap for the Sun Energy One Racing Mercedes AMG all of a sudden just edging away and negating any sort of toe that Matt Campbell's going to get from Gurnon. And meanwhile, Mara Engel already on this lap is about three and a half tenths quicker than the two leaders. I, I do think he's going to get that. I think he'd get somewhere close, but I can't believe that we would have even more drama and he would be challenging for second or even for the lead. It's not beyond the bounds of possibility, as Garth Tander said. If the two leaders do start getting together and slowing each other down. Well, there's 315 laps, so a new distance record already for this race. 1,956 kilometres complete today. So already another record set in a record-setting weekend. Remember, over 53,000 people here over the three days comfortably a record crowd for the Little Molly Bathurst 12 hour. Fastest qualifying time, record crowd and a distance record. Can we now absolutely say officially that Bathurst is back like it's never been a win. At least one year, ran last year and I do really think, and I watched it all last year with you guys calling it, I really do think that that was super important that that race 
ran last year because that laid the, the groundwork again for this work this year. And GT, by the way, your pace this year has been outstanding because you have got a voice left. At this <laughs> right. so I was wondering him. that was You've been ribbing ribbing him. Oh, for his, thank you. For his <laughs> taking 11 hours and 45 minutes for you to bring it up. But oh, it's, it's, you know, credit where it's due. Oh, I went home and I looked at the data and I worked on my strategy. Come back stronger for the second year. This one, it's not done. There's another twist in the tail with 14 minutes left to go. Two or two, three for the leader. Two or two, seven for second. Two or two, three for third. Two or two, eight for Shelton von der Linde. He's, keep, he's still about half a minute back. 40 seconds from the leader. He's keeping an eye on some other bits and pieces as well. Charles Monster is catching a wounded Daniel Junkadela in the 77 car, that would be a battle for overall position, but not class, as Mostert continues to lead in the Pro-Am, ahead of the 777, Ricky Feller behind the wheel of that, that car, and third, about a lap back, which is Stanaway, turning the final laps for the Boost Mobile AMG number 99. Identical lap times to the 10th, almost to the 100th for the two leaders that time. 20357 plays a 5830 for Engel. So another half a second comes out of that leading margin as these two duel for supremacy. 316 laps now. 1.3 the official margin. This gap continues to ebb and flow. Campbell quicker across the top of the mountain. Going on very strong in the final sector. So it's only going to take one lap car at the wrong part of the circuit for either of these competitors to determine what step of the podium they're going to stand on, I feel like. It's only going to be something small. If these Pirellis get the 75 home and Kenny doesn't mount them somewhere prominent outside his property on Conrod Strait, <laughs> something wrong with the world because these tyres, double stinting to the end, have been remarkable in the hands of Jules Gunon. The, the need to go into the temperature-controlled uh, artefact uh, uh, storage that uh, Bathurst Regional Council have just uh, put together recently for their museums because they've done a hard, they've had a hard life and they need a decent retirement. That would be absolutely incredible. Just put them in the wine cellar and just go and cuddle them every now and then. <laughs> 12 minutes. And this guy, 28 years of age from France, he's won all the majors in GT racing. Of course, with the Bentley team and then switched across to Mercedes AMG when Bentley unfortunately ended their GT3 program. Been here on four occasions previously, made his debut in 2018 and won this race, of course, in 2020 with Bentley with that masterful stint towards the end and the cool head when the rear tyres eliminated on the run down Conrod Strait and just managed to maintain that situation, get the car into the lane and back out in front. 7.4 seconds back to Mauro Engel. He's still in the twos. Another big lap from Mauro. second Mara. quicker. That means he's only 6.2 seconds away from Matt Campbell at the moment. He is really coming even quicker than I thought. We're going to... Uh, 10 minutes, 11 minutes to go. Is he going to get there? 6.2 seconds to the rear bumper of Matt Campbell. 7.2 four seconds to the lead of the race, Maro Engel. So that's what he has in front of him. That's the job at hand. Chad said earlier on, who was brave with the fueling and maybe short fuel for track position. Matt Campbell now on 27 laps. That Porsche has been frugal all day. But are we, are we seeing a bit of fuel serving here? Might be nice to... Have a look on board and hear what's going on. Well, Engel came on the same lap as well, remember? Correct. Murrow Engel and Matt Campbell came. Jules Gunon came a lap later. So whether they actually fully fueled Gunon's car, remember, they didn't take tyres. They went for track position. Whether they put enough fuel in it to get it to the end. Chad? I reckon the one guy in this fight who's definitely good on fuel will probably be Murrow because they're spending that time changing out uh, yeah. the computer componentry. So for them, the fuel question wasn't so much an issue. It was definitely fill it up. But the other two, I'm so intrigued to know how much is left of the tank. It's nervous, nervous faces down here at Sun Energy. He's, Mara's hauling a second a lap out of these two. Yeah. He's already 17th up. And the second time in intermediate. 
And after a couple of quiet laps, Campbell just creeping back a little yes. bit closer to the rear wing of car 75. Potentially just resting the tire a little, which you can do. Obviously had the big push to get to the rear wing of Gilles Gounon. And just rest the tire and have another push. Nine minutes, 35 seconds left to go in this one. And you want to get up to the rear wing of Gounon and have a crack before Engel potentially gets, gets there. Totally. Yeah, yeah, you totally want to, You want a, a full focus on the car in front and not have to worry about Maro Engel attacking you. And if that happens later in the race, deal with it then. They're all on mountain straight at the same time. I just wonder if Matt Campbell's had the call that his fuel numbers are OK and he's been well, uncanned and allowed to fire away. I can't speak for the teams, but honestly, with nine minutes to go, I, I think you're going to find out one way or another. There you go. Yeah, you're going to run the thing out of juice or you're going to win back as simple yeah. as that. Yeah. As the Americans say in baseball, you're not going to die looking, yes. are you? You're going to have a swing. Looking, no one was blinking at that thing. We've been looking there just previously. Uh, that was I actually the world the screen. That was actually the world staring competition <laughs> that was going on down there. Matt using all the curb there on the run through McPhillamy Park. Near both of these cars bottoming out now. It's been especially noticeable from the AMG products across the course of the weekend. Can run these cars quite low. The fuel load's burning off now. 8 minutes and 15, 318 laps completed. So they're on their 319th now. Utterly tension-filled battle. 28-year-old Jill Gunon, 27-year-old Matt Campbell from Warwick in Queensland. Australians have followed his journey to become a factory Porsche driver. It's been a remarkable tale, and this place played a significant role in crafting it. And Jill Gunon has become extremely well known to Australian audiences by his exploits here. And what about Kenny Habul? Could he go back to back? Back to lead, Maro Engel, 5.4 seconds. Time left in the race, 7 minutes and 20 seconds. I love the fact that we're seeing these cars race on their own terms not being interrupted by big packs of cars that they've got to get by. Proper, proper motor racing here. Endurance racing at its very finest. And I'll see it now before the end of the race. Whatever happens now, Bathurst, once again, has delivered Krills. Certainly has on Matt Campbell carrying <laughs> speed into the cutting. Yeah. We've had a couple of moments here on the previous lap. Matt was out to the wall. There you go again. Here on the previous lap, there was no room left to the wall. Matt Campbell will not die wondering in the remaining six minutes of this one. When you know you're going to get the absolute maximum from both of them, they'll leave nothing on the table for this. And I, the philosophy from both teams will be win the race. Yeah, full stop. Nothing else really matters. Tell me, okay, well, we know he finished second last year. It was Mauro Engel. Yeah. Other than that, can you tell me who finished second in previously in the 12 hour? Negative. I reckon that happened three times yeah. on the previous lap. Like, he is giving it to that Porsche. Maro Engel again to the end of the second sector has taken eight tenths out of Matt Campbell. Gap to lead for Maro Engel now. Four and a half seconds. Uh, dear race control, <laughs> Please, can we have another 20 minutes? <laughs> and Signed, everybody. We've talked about the way that Sun Energy One have interpreted the rule book and quite mm -hmm. correctly found the loophole. Yeah. The 31 laps that Kenny Hubbell did earlier today have been critical to that because it's given them just the flexibility on their driver time at the end to allow for this to occur for Jules Gounon to be in the car. Have a look at the leading three now. Maro Engel, 4.2 seconds. Punches out a 2.02.42 last time round. Took 1.1 out of Matt Campbell. Maro Engel said his personal best final sector on that lap. For the whole race, for that car. <laughs> Unbelievable. 320 laps complete now. Five minutes to go. The gap continues to close. Nine tenths of a second, first to second. 
I'll definitely get two laps, probably three. Two laps will do it. Two laps will do it, Krill. So you've had everything you've asked for this weekend. Do you want to ask for anything else? Not your numbers. Greedy. You know. Would you like to find the water number on Tuesday night? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. Oh, no, oh, the wall! He's it's been teasing us for the last two laps, and that was a reasonable contact. And the exit of the shelf coming on for the drop down to Reed Park. Will there be a price to pay for that? Is that a step too far, or in this place, too close for Matt Campbell? You don't have to worry about track limits here and the calls because there's no room for mistakes. It was a brush with a front wheel on the left-hand side of the Mantai car. It's the way the car bounced up the kerb, and then just bounced up and stepped to the left and into the wall for Matt Campbell. We'll do a quick check right now, making sure the steering wheel is straight, making sure there's no vibration coming back through the steering wheel. He lost half half the wheels. Half a tail. Well, he lost half a second, actually, yeah. in that sector when he'd been gaining, gaining, gaining. Interesting. So just over three minutes and 40 seconds left of this one as we come to complete yet another lap. There we are, the top three cars in the same, same shot with three minutes and 30 seconds left to run. Engel's gonna get to the rear bumper, but he might not have a chance. I thought he would, I said it a while ago. Can he get it through? Very quickly, let's run through the other classes. We'll keep our eyes on what's going on as the head of Mountain Straight. In Pro-Am, it's still the number 65 that leads. That's the Sport Bet Audi. Jazz Monster ahead. And he has actually gone past Daniel Junkadella and taken seventh position in the overall. Ricardo Fella, Ricky Fella in the, uh, the triple seven, sits in second. That's the Ben, the Shaheen car in the Pro Am Cup in second. And third, Richie Stanaway is anchoring the 99 boost mobile AMG. In silver, Josh Hunt is leading for the 101 car. They've had their trials and tribulations today as well, haven't they? In second place in the Silver Club, Glenn, Glenn Wood for the number 47 Audi and the Jonathan Webb driven 47 Audi. So Glenn Wood in the 50 Audi, which was, of course, the uh, number 50 KTM. What a story that is. They're going to be second. Jonathan Webb third in the 47 Audi. And the Mark 1 Meister in 17th position, still running. Darren Curry will be that home in the Invitational class. Just under two minutes left to go in the 2023 edition of the Bathurst 12 Hour. Brought to you by Liquid Molly. The top three cars in the same shot as they make their way down into the chase. There's a car off. In front, it's not one of the leaders. It's the Makita car, Jordan Love, in 11th position. He rejoins right in front of the lead. Bartle needs to stay out of the way. It's going to be worse for Campbell, I think, because he's got a compromised entry to the final That's corner. Right. So what have we got lap time-wise? A 3-8 for Gunon, a 4-dead for Campbell, a 3-2 for Maro Engel. The gaps continue to close. Jordan Love jumps out of the way. It is 43 minutes Engel. past the hour. It's 6.213 times 322 by my maths is 2,000.58 kilometres. Woohoo! 2,000 k's in a day. In half a day. 12 hours. And here's another list for you, gents. This is a list of names that have won three consecutive endurance races, major enduros at this place, in a row. Brock, Richards... Perkins, Lowndes, Win Cup. That's it. In the long history of this place, Jules Gounon is on the edge of doing that. Last lap. I thought we just clicked over. So it will be 3.23 laps and no further. His time is about to elapse, but it's a 43 plus one. This is unbelievable. And I'm not writing off Maro Engel yet. There's two seconds between the top three it's after right a, there. a record breaking distance and I, with the least intervention from safety cars this is real racing 
This is real pace. This is real drama. It's about Panorama Bathurst. Why do we expect anything different? Does Maro Engel send it at the yes, yeah, on the last yes, hundred percent. 100% he does. The gap is six tenths of a second as they make their way down. Conrod straight for the last time. He's a fair way back. Ah. He, we said he'd get to the rear bumper, but he might run out of time, and time has been his enemy. The fastest race in Bathurst history creates a little bit more. Kenny's engineered another triumph. Lucas Stolls goes back to back. Jill Gunon, three in a row at Mount Panorama. They've done it again. The top three cars are covered by 1.4 seconds. After 323 laps, 2,006 kilometres of racing, 1.4 seconds. That is how you go motor racing. And how long green at the end there, Creelsey? Oh, Unbelievable. I stopped counting. It was over four and a half hours. Oh, my goodness. Let's get some atmosphere from down in the lane. Shay Adam. Kenny Havul and Lucas Stoltz embracing on the wall and crying. Kenny, you've done it again. This time it was a lot harder than last year. Does that make it even sweeter? Uh, it's unbelievable. You know what? Luca and Jules just drove the balls off this car, and I'm just so proud of them. Um, I said something last year on TV. They told me not to say it, so... But you know what I'm thinking. And thanks to Mercedes AMG, and thanks to the town of Bathurst. Yeah! This is the greatest, yes. and I wanted to win outright. And yeah, I drove really well. I was proud of myself, and it was tough because I had old tyres from Luca when I get in. And I'm just really proud, proud of everyone, proud of the team. Thank you. What are you going to do with the tyres that come off that car? Because they deserve something special. Well, first I'm going to run around the track naked, uh, and then after that I'm going to drink a lot tonight. <laughs> Congrats, Kenny. <laughs> So Mercedes tie Audi with three 12-hour victories in the GT3 era. Absolutely extraordinary. And Porsche come up by short by just under a second to say goodbye to the 99 1.2 with a victory. Let's salute our other winners as well. That 65 car has come through. The Sport Bet Audi to take the Pro-Am category and in the silver category, the number 101. Well, that's a great run for them after problems earlier on. The Volante Rossi Motorsport Silver Cup winner comes through. Look at the emotion. Look at what it means to Jules Gounon. I mean, five years ago, he'd never been to this place, and now he's won it three times in a row. Chad? Oh my gosh, the emotion from this guy. He just got up on the roof and screamed something guttural and primal from Jules Gunon down here in Victory Lane. This is becoming our annual catch up. Congratulations, but you had to work for that one like never before. Yeah, I'm dead. Uh, first of all, I think I want to say sorry tomorrow for the contact. Last week we won an amazing race, and this week we had to fight, but four batters. Well, you can say it in person. Well done from Murray. How about sportsmanship? To be able to walk up to you in that scenario, he must be heartbroken too. And Maddie's here as well, mate. Well done, bro. That is respect between the top three right there. You guys are teammates one week and then warring the next, huh? Yeah, that's what I said. It's gonna be it's gonna be hard, but uh, to win Bathurst, uh, it's. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm really dead. Yeah. The last thing with all tires, having to defend and seeing uh, great drivers like Maro. Or, or <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and get a word off Luca in here as well because those just become a two-time winner. Luca, hop in here, mate. We haven't heard from you yet. We heard from the team boss. How are you feeling right now? How about this absolute superstar next to you? Uh, insane. Uh, the last hour was, yeah, really hard uh, in the pit with everybody. But yeah, it was just outstanding job by Jules. Team did so good. Uh, didn't change tyres. Full risk. Yeah, but we made it. Triple Vettel's victory and double for me. No wonder you're so tired because two drivers here that had to do the most lifting out of anybody because a bronze driver with Kenny doing so little laps. So technically, physically, he must be absolutely spent. Yeah, we are destroyed, but Kenny did a great job this morning. And for the little story, 
The daughter of my engineer, Carlo, drew me that uh, little unicorn on my suit. She did it in my city in Spa, and we won Spa, and today we, we won also. I'm out of word. It's amazing. Thanks to Akodis, Kenny, and, uh, and everyone at Mercedes MG, my teammate Luca, and fantastic. And the strategists as well, because nobody pitted more during this race as well. So that was something out of nowhere. You guys looked very nervous, thought that you needed a safety car at one point to even be in with a shot to win this one, Luca. Yeah, but we, we made it back. Um, at some stage, we were a, bit, a little bit close with uh, driving time, but yeah, then just an outstanding shot by the Akotis guys, and uh, yeah, it played well. <laughs> Two time, three time, and a hat trick. You guys did the impossible today. Enjoy it. Thank you. Yeah! <laughs> extraordinary, oh. extraordinary scenes, and <laughs> the 20th. 12-hour endurance race at Mount Panorama is one we will remember forever. That's the reaction, 29 years of age. Jules Gounon, one of the best GT drivers in the world, and Bathurst, globally renowned as one of the greatest racetracks. That's how special this race is. The world returned to the mountain this year, and it has delivered in spades. And it's paired the world back, uh, no doubt. Unofficial results then, subject to post-race checks, etc. But Sun Energy won't go back to back ahead of Manti in second and a fast recovering Mercedes AMG team group at M. I wonder if he took that penalty a couple of laps earlier. It might have been even closer. Their team WRT, the best of the BMWs, was the number 32. And in the classes, seventh overall for the 65 car that wins in the Pro-Am Cup for the Sport Bet team. And the Silver Club, Dylan O'Keefe, I have to apologise to the uh, Milan team. They've been leading so far, so far through the race. They got up into the GT3s, and I missed them out of our rundown. They finished 12th okay. overall podium, with the man. Mazda uh, winning the Invitational. 53,000 people attended this year's event. <laughs> There's the celebration. Kenny's finally made it down. The parties at his join on Conrad straight tonight. And for the second year in a row, Sun Energy One Racing claim the Liquamoli Bathurst 12 hour. Spares box highlights. What a day it's been. What a weekend it's been. A record breaking one in many respects. And at 5.45 a.m. we flagged the cars away 12 hours ago into a beautiful morning, crisp, cool conditions. And there was drama early. That was Christopher Haza in the Audi after just 13 laps, unlucky for him, into the fence. Chaz Mostert somehow was a lap down, then two laps down, kept that Audi in the mix throughout the day. That was an error for Tony Bates. This was a big crash for Stephen Grove at the top at Brock Skyline and ended the Grove Racing Team's day. The Lamborghini had looked strong throughout. They had their best ever finish here last year. Unfortunately, they were unable to replicate that and after just 70 laps, they were also one of the non-finishers. One of the biggest accidents of the day, the Superbike car involved, young Aaron Cameron, with a large rearward impact into the Spears box dipper. And they were in really good contention in the top 10 in the silver class. And then Charity Car, we just had Lounsey in the box talking up how well they were going. And unfortunately, Scotty Taylor found the fence similar to the accident before, and that ended their day. Then high drama with a modem in the car that sends telemetry back to base into race control failing and not communicating. They had to change it. It cost them time. And then this, an enormous moment as Maro Engel got up the inside of Jules Gunon. There was contact and there was a drive through penalty for car 999 that basically ended their chances. That handed the lead then to Jules Gunon. A late spin caused some Hesitation, would there be a safety car? Matt Campbell drove the wheels off the EMA Manti Porsche. He brushed the fence in his pursuit of Jules Gonon. He got within a second at the line. It'll be the closest racing finish in the race history as well, by the way. And at the end, 1.4 seconds covers three cars in the fastest, longest Bathurst 12 hour in the race's history. Fastest, longest, yeah, like that. Most people here, yeah. Fastest qualifying and the first winner who's won twice for two different nations. Yeah, I guess correct <laughs> as well. <laughs> and back to the list. And Jules Gounon in the annals of history at this place. 
Only five drivers ever won the Bathurst 1000 three times in a row. No one's done it in 12-hour history until Juggernon has now. But those names, Peter Brock, Jim Richards, Larry Perkins, Craig Lowndes, and Jamie Winkup. And really? It is extraordinary that a young Frenchman who a decade ago, five years ago, was unknown in these parts, has now won three straight races and is an extraordinary driver. You have to be more greedy more often because everything you asked for, you got this weekend. Birthdays, Christmases, New Year's, Easter eggs, all came together for one Mr. Richard. Mm -hmm. The rest Fair. of the year is going to be terrible. I've used up everything today. Oh, Mercedes yes. AMG win their third race, so they equal Audi the most wins of all time, equal at the top. And they're two great German in the GT3 GT racing era. brands yeah. in the GT3 era. Mazda uh, are only yep. one further ahead with four uh, in the event's history overall. So. Well, at Bathurst, it's only three because they won the 12 hour at Eastern Creek. This is going to be a great podium. Can't wait to celebrate this. Here's Mark Beretta. The 2023 Liqui Moly Bathurst 12 hour outright winners podium. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please congratulate? In third place for car triple nine, Grupa M Racing, Murrow Engel, Mikhail Grenier, and Rafael Marciello. <laughs> Presenting the third place trophy, Senator Ross Cadell. Also presenting the medals for the Intercontinental GT Challenge, powered by Pirelli, Series Manager, Abby Hay. In second place, car number 912, Matt the EMA, Matt Campbell, Matteo Gimene and Thomas Prini. Presenting the second place trophies, Bathurst Mayor Robert Taylor. Also presenting the medals for the Intercontinental GT Challenge, powered by Pirelli, series manager Abby Hay. Time now to present our winning team who have done a sensational job in a great finish to the 2023 Liqui Moly Bathurst 12 hour race. Would you please congratulate car number 75, Sun Energy One, Kenny Harbour, Jules Goonan and Lucas Stoltz. <laughs> Presenting the Motorsport Australia Tourist Trophy, Pirelli Circuit Racing Manager, Matteo Braga. <laughs> Presenting the first place trophies, Liqui Moly General Global Marketing Director, Peter Bowman. and presenting the medals for the Intercontinental GT Challenge, powered by Pirelli Series Manager, Abby Hay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your 2023 Liqui Moly Bathurst 12, our outright winners. Time to celebrate. Oh my goodness, what a day it has been here. At Mount Panorama, Garth Tander, the fun continues because it's only the start of the Aussie motor racing calendar. What a great way to open the Australian motor racing calendar, Chad. The Bathurst 12 hours, the top three cars covered by 1.4 seconds after 12 hours of racing. Can't wait to go to Newcastle shortly. But that's how we started in Australian motorsport. It's <laughs> going to be an awesome year. Yeah, you do not want to miss that. March is only around the corner. Brand new race cars. But here in Bathurst, the champagne is spraying. An incredible race. It was flat out from start to finish. One of the fastest races we've ever seen here at Mount Panorama.
and they've earned those celebrations right now. Congratulations to Sun Energy One and Mercedes. What a way to finish the day at Bathurst. The world is back. The Liquid Molly Bathurst 12 hour fires into life on a stunning Sunday morning at Mount Panorama. That is border racing as art.